else. The Prime finished. Sabine had gone white as death. Father. The Prime leveled a cold look at his daughter. For too long, I've left you unchecked. I've kept our people, this city, safe. You are hereby stripped of your title, your rank, and your authority. Sabine just stared. At her side, Sigrid's blazing green eyes darted between the two wolves. The astronomer was now glancing at the distant eastern gates, as if starting to wonder if he'd backed the wrong horse. Take it, the prime said to Ethan. He extended the sword again. Ethan shook his head. I didn't come here to... I offered to make you Alpha once, Ethan Holstrom. I now offer to make you Prime. Don't walk away from it. Ethan didn't reach for the sword. I... He didn't get the chance to finish his refusal. One moment, he was staring at the sword. The next, Sabine had snatched it from her father's hands. She plunged it through the Prime's ancient face. The crowd exploded into screams and shouts. From the corner of his eye, Ethan saw Amelie dragging a struggling Perry away, out of range. The Prime crumpled to the ground before Ethan, eyes unseeing, coated with blood. If a medwitch got here soon enough, maybe... Sigrid moved. Ethan couldn't contain his cry of dismay as she leapt onto her grandfather's body and pressed her mouth to his withered lips. She inhaled deeply. Light flared up through the Prime's mouth, illuminating his hollowed cheeks, and then Sigrid was breathing it in, drinking it. His soul, his first light. She cocked her head back and swallowed that light, his essence. Her skin gleamed as the light passed down the column of her throat, inch by inch. There was no coming back for the Prime. Sabine cut off his head anyway. The astronomer, slack-jawed and sprayed with blood, had stumbled back a step, gaping at Sigrid as she leveled her green stare on him, ravenous. Ethan had only a heartbeat to pivot, to leap off the stairs before Sabine swung the bloodied sword at him. He couldn't take his eyes off the Prime, though. Off Sigrid, the reaper he'd created who had eaten the old wolf's soul, as hungry as a vampire. Ethan! Perry shouted, and he snapped to attention as Sabine launched for him again, sword arcing. He leapt back, narrowly missing being gutted. This sword, Sabine panted, brandishing it, is mine. The title is mine. Ethan shifted, so fast even Sabine blinked. Make your brother proud. Sabine swung the sword as Ethan charged, a powerful blow that would cleave even his wolf skull in two. Ethan leapt straight at the blade, his jaws closed around it. Sabine's eyes flared with shock as Ethan bit down, tasting metal, and shattered the Fendir sword between his teeth. Chapter 74 Most of the crowd had fled as soon as Sigrid had started feeding on the Prime's soul. But Perry and Amelie, Gideon with them, remained near the trees, watching Sabine and Ethan. Sabine stared down at the seven shards the Fendir sword had broken into, then lifted her furious gaze to Ethan. Ethan shifted back into his humanoid body with a near-instant flash. It's just a piece of steel, he said, panting, the metallic tang of the blade lingering in his mouth. All those years you obsessed over it, resented Danica for having it. It's just a piece of metal. Sabine's claws glinted, her lips curled back from her fangs as she snarled. But behind her, Sigrid was closing in on the astronomer, who had fallen to the ground and was now crawling backward, hands up. The male pleaded, Did I not treat you well? Deliver you from the Underking's grasp? The astronomer didn't get the chance to plead his case. Sigrid, either from spite or lost to her hunger, left the old man no time to scream as she leapt upon him and fitted her mouth against his. 
Even Sabine paused to watch, as Sigrid plunged her clawed hand into his chest, ripping out his still-beating heart in the same moment that she inhaled deeply, and that glimmering light, the second light, of his soul rose up through his body into their fused mouths. Not Ethan's problem, not right now. He whipped his head back to Sabine and let out a long, deep snarl of his own. Sabine's nose crinkled. You are no alpha pup, she growled and lunged. Ethan charged, a straight sprint into death's awaiting claws. Sabine leapt for him, and Ethan ducked low, sliding, grabbing the longest of the sword's shards and lifting it high. Blood rained down, and Sabine screamed as she hit the grass with a thud. Ethan sprang to his feet and whirled. Sabine crouched on the ground, a hand pressed to her gut, as if it'd keep the organs now spilling on the grass from tumbling out. He had a dim awareness of Sigrid behind him, swallowing down the astronomer's dying soul and dropping his limp corpse to the stones of the stairs. But Ethan slowly approached Sabine, and there was no one else in the world, no task but this. Sabine lifted raging, pain-filled eyes to him. Everything I have done, Sabine panted up at him, has been for the wolves. It's been for yourself, Ethan spat, stopping before her. She sneered, revealing blood-coated teeth. You will lead them to ruin. We'll see was all Ethan said, before shifting once more into his wolf's body with that preternatural speed. Sabine looked his wolf in the eyes and beheld her death there. She opened her mouth to speak, but Ethan didn't give her the chance. Enough of her vitriol had poisoned the world. A leap, a crunch of his impossibly strong jaws, and it was done. With that extra strength he'd gained, he'd broken through the steel of the sword— Breaking through flesh and bone was nothing by comparison. But once her blood hit his tongue, red washed over his vision, blazing, burning. He was rage and snarls and fangs. He was blood and entrails and primal fury. Ethan. Perry's quavering voice shook him from the daze, from what he'd done to Sabine's body. Her blood coated his mouth. Her flesh was stuck between his teeth. They're watching, Perry breathed, stepping up to him. Still in his wolf form, Ethan started to turn toward the witnesses of his savagery. But Perry said, don't look, and dropped to her knees before him, tilted back her head and exposed her neck. I yield, she added a heartbeat later. I yield to the prime. The words struck a chord in him, one of despair and suffocation, but he couldn't stop it, the instinct to reach forward and lightly clamp his teeth around Perry's slender throat, to take that cinnamon and strawberry taste into his mouth, to accept her submission to him, her recognition. Footsteps thudded nearby, then Amelie stood there, shock paling her face, but she too dropped to her knees, exposed her neck. It was either submit to him or die, as a potential rival, he'd have had no choice but to kill her. A glance behind him revealed the corpse of the astronomer sprawled across the stairs, leaking blood that trickled down the steps. But Sigrid had vanished, as if she knew he would be coming for her. Something relaxed in him as he gently closed his jaws around Amelie's throat, too, accepting her surrender. A bitterer, staler taste than Perry's sweetness— but he accepted it all the same. Hail, Ethan, Amelie said, loud enough for all to hear. Prime of the Valbaran wolves. In answer, a chorus of howls went up from around the den, then the city, then the wilderness beyond the city walls, as if all of Midgard hailed him. When it ceased, Ethan tipped his wolf's head to the sky and loosed a howl of his own, triumph and pain and mourning. Make your brother proud. And as his howl finished echoing, he could have sworn he heard a male wolf's cry float up from the bone quarter itself.
Chapter 75 Rune didn't recognize his city. Imperial battleships filled the Istros, dreadwolves prowled the streets, the 33rd had been joined by the Asterian Guard, and the meadows still smoldered in the north, lines of smoke rising to the jarringly blue sky. But it was the quiet that unnerved him the most, as he and Lydia crept through the sewers, making their way toward the Comidium. Flynn and Deck had peeled off a few blocks back to go scope out the Ox headquarters for any whisper of where Isaiah and Naomi might be. If they could intercept Isaiah and Naomi at the Comidium, they'd save themselves hours of searching. Then came the hard part, finding a secure place to meet with them, long enough to explain everything. But for right now, his focus was on finding the two members of Celestina's triari, and trying not to get caught in the process. This should open up into a tunnel that will lead right under the Comidium, Rune told Lydia, keeping his voice low. The sewers appeared empty, but in Crescent City there was always someone watching, listening. Once we're in the building, she said, I can get us to their barracks. You're sure you know where the cameras? She gave him a look. It was my job when Ephraim visited to know where they were, both as the Hind and as Agent Daybright. I could navigate this place blindfolded. Rune blew out a breath. All right, but when we get to the barracks... Then those shadows of yours come into play, and we hide until Isaiah and Naomi appear, unless they're already there and we can get them alone. Right. Got it. He rolled his neck. She eyed him. You seem... nervous. He snorted. It's my first mission with my girlfriend. I want to impress her. Her lips quirked up, and Rune led the way down another tunnel. Am I your girlfriend, then? She asked. Is that... okay with you? She gave him a true smile. It made her seem younger, lighter, the person she might have been if Erd hadn't taken her down her particular fucked-up life path. It knocked the breath from him. Yeah, Rune, it's okay with me. He smiled back, remembering how she'd chastised him when they'd first met for saying yeah, for being so casual. Ahead, Rune saw that they were approaching a dented metal door marked Do Not Enter. Now, that's practically an invitation he said, earning a laugh from Lydia as he kicked in the door. The sight of the Imperial battleships in the Istros robbed Therian of any joy at the river's familiar beckoning scent. So did the presence of the Omega boats docked with them. And right by the Black Dock, the SPQM Faustus, the very Omega boat they'd barely outrun that day on Idra. He hadn't dared venture into the northernmost part of the city to see the damage to Asphodel Meadows. They weren't here for that, and he knew he'd see nothing that would make him feel any better. The city was eerily quiet, as if in mourning. Face and hair hidden under a sunball cap, Therian glowered at the armada for long enough as he stood on the key that Sathia warned, You'll draw attention to us with all that glaring. I should slip into the water and blast holes in all their hulls, Therian snarled. Focus, she said. You do that, and we won't accomplish what we came here to do. She frowned at the ships, which is clearly still necessary. They're holding the city hostage. All the more reason to plead with the River Queen to take people in. Therian found only cool determination on Sathia's heart-shaped face. You're right, he said. He let out a low whistle and waited. An otter in a bright yellow vest leapt onto the quay, dripping everywhere. It rose onto its hind legs in front of Therian, whiskers twitching, spraying droplets of water. Sathia grinned. Stop it, Therian muttered. It only encourages them to be cuter. She bit her lip, and though it was thoroughly distracting, Therian got his act together enough to say to the otter, Tell the River Queen that Therian Kedos wants a meeting. The whiskers twitched again. 
Sathia added. Please. Therian avoided the urge to roll his eyes, but also added, Please. He fished out a gold coin. And make it speedy, friend. The otter took the coin in his little black fingers and turned it over, eyes brightening at the outrageous sum. With a flick of his long tail, he leapt back into the clear turquoise water with barely a ripple and was gone. Therian watched him gracefully swim out into the depths, then vanish over the drop into the dark, to the blue court beneath. Only tiny, glimmering lights showed any signs of life there. What now? Sathia asked, again eyeing the warships docked in the river. If just one of the soldiers on them recognized Therian? He tugged his sunball hat over his hair. Now, we lurk in the shadows and wait. This doesn't seem safe, Ember said for the fifth time, as Bryce stood before the northern rift's archway. Hunt waited ten paces behind her, freezing his feathers off. This seems like the opposite of safe. You're opening the northern rift to hell, and we're supposed to believe these demons, the princes, for Erd's sake, are good? I'm not sure they're good, Bryce said, but they're on our side. Just trust me, Mom. Trust her, Ember, Randall said, but from the tightness in his voice, Hunt knew the man wasn't too happy either. When you're ready, Athalar, Bryce called to him. I thought you didn't need me to fuel you up anymore, Hunt said, especially with all that extra power you've got now. I don't want to try it on my own for this, Bryce said. Seems like a high-stakes situation to test out my new abilities. I bet you could do it. Hunt called over the wind, but all right, on three. Bryce stilled, squaring her shoulders. Hunt rallied his lightning, prayed to every god, even if they'd mostly fucked him over until this point. The power of his lightning was familiar, yet suddenly foreign. Hellfire, Apollyon had called it. Answers. At long last, answers about why he was what he was, about why he and no one else had the lightning. Even the Thunderbirds, made by hell, had been hunted to extinction by the Asteri. With Sophie's death, they were truly gone. Though the Harpy's resurrection, another thing that was his fucking fault, suggested that the Asteri now had other methods of raising the dead. Only if they could get their hands on more of his lightning— He'd sooner die. One, Hunt breathed, and lifted a hand wreathed in lightning. Lord of Lightning, the Oracle had called him. Two, had the Oracle seen what he was, where his power came from that day? You remind me of that which was lost long ago. The Thunderbirds, hunted to extinction, was that the wind ruffling her parka, or was Bryce shaking as she waited for the blow? Hunt didn't give himself a moment to reconsider, to halt. Three. He launched a spear of lightning at his mate. Chapter 76 As it had that day at the Asteri's palace, when she had leapt from her own world to another— Hunt's lightning lanced through Bryce's back, through the horn, into the star on her chest, and out into the gate. Ember shouted in fear, and even Randall stumbled back a step, but Hunt let his lightning flow into Bryce, kept a steady stream of it surging between them. Open, Bryce said, her voice carrying on the wind. A sliver of darkness began to spread in the middle of the gate, Hunt funneled more lightning into her, and the sliver widened, inch by inch. The northern rift had been fixed on hell, until now, until his power had passed through not only the horn on Bryce, but the star on her chest, too, that link to a different world, reorienting the gate, as it had that day in the Eternal Palace, to open elsewhere. That was their theory, at least— no one had ever tried to manipulate the Northern Rift to open somewhere other than hell, but... That's enough, Hunt, Ember warned. Hunt ignored her and sent another spike of power into his mate. 
Bryce's hair floated up, snow and ice drifting with it, but she maintained an eerie calm until the void filled the entirety of the massive gate. Hunt cut off his lightning, running to where Bryce stood before the wall of darkness. Darkness, flecked by starlight. A female with golden brown hair sat in an armchair before a fireplace on the other side of it. All that darkness was the starry night beyond her windows. And her face was a portrait of pure shock, as Bryce lifted a hand in greeting and said, Hello, Nesta. The River Queen sat in a chair before a computer panel in the control room connected to the West Airlock, a makeshift throne in the sterile utilitarian space. The tech who operated the computer had vacated the chamber in a near sprint at the Queen's snapped command. Therian was well aware that the airlock could be easily hosed down to remove any and all traces of blood. A body flushed out through it would go straight to the Sobex circling outside like reapers. If Sathia noted those details, if she understood that she and Therian had been brought here purely for the convenience of getting rid of his corpse, she didn't let on. His wife simply curtsied, a graceful swoop downward, at odds with her casual leggings and white sweater, the cashmere now streaked with dirt and torn along the bottom hem. Your Majesty, Sathia said, her voice cultured yet unthreatening. It is an honor to meet you. The River Queen's dark eyes swept over Sathia. Am I supposed to open my arms to the female who usurped my daughter? Sathia didn't so much as flinch. If my union with Therian has brought you grief or offense, then I offer my wholehearted apologies. A beat, too long to be comforting. Therian lifted his gaze to the River Queen and found her watching him. Her gaze was cold, cruel, unimpressed. I take it the River Queen said. You want something very badly from me, if you have come back to risk my wrath. Therian bowed his head. Yes, Your Majesty. And yet you have brought your wife. For what? To soften me? Or as a shield to hide behind? Considering she's barely up to my chest, Therian said dryly, I don't think she'd make much of a shield. Sathia glared at him, but the River Queen frowned. Always making jokes. Always playing the fool. She waved a hand adorned in rings of shell and coral toward Sathia. I suppose I should wish you congratulations on your nuptials. But I instead wish you luck. With a male like that for a husband, you'll need it in droves. I thank you. Sathia said with such sincerity that Therian nearly bought it, too. May your good wishes fly straight to Erd's ears. Okay, maybe he'd underestimated his wife. She seemed more comfortable in this setting than he was. Indeed, the River Queen seemed intrigued enough by Sathia's grace under fire that she said, Well, Therian, let's hear what was so important that you dared enter my realm again. He clasped his hands behind his back, exposing his chest like he knew the River Queen preferred. He didn't see her jagged sea-glass knife anywhere, but she always had it on her. I am here on behalf of Bryce Quinlan, Queen of the Fae of Valbara and of Valen, to request asylum in the Blue Court for the people of Crescent City. Another long pause. Queen, is it? the River Queen said, of Valbaran and of Valen Fay. Her eyes slid to Sathia, the Fay representative, he supposed. Sathia's chin dipped. Bryce Quinlan now rules both territories. I serve her, as does Therian. Eyes as black and depthless as a shark's slid to Therian. The same eyes as her sister, the Ocean Queen, he realized. Am I supposed to be pleased to hear you have yet again defected? I did what my morals demanded, Therian said. Morals, 
the River Queen mused. What morals do you have, other than ensuring your own survival at any cost? Was it your morals that guided you when you took my daughter's maidenhead, swearing to love her until you died, and then toyed with her affections for the next decade? Fuck. But Sathia answered for him with that unflinching calm. These are the mistakes of youth, ones Therian has reflected upon and learned from. The River Queen fixed her attention on Sathia again. Has he? Or was that the poisoned honey he poured into your ear to woo you? He brought me before you, Sathia countered, proof that he is willing to own up to his actions. It took a special sort of person to talk like that to the River Queen, to not back down one inch, not tremble at her power, her ageless face. The River Queen's eyes narrowed, clearly thinking along the same lines. And this Queen Bryce thought Therian the best emissary to beg me for such an enormous favor. Sathia's chin didn't lower. She remembered how Therian and your people so bravely and selflessly carried innocence down here to safety during the attack this spring. Damn, she was good. The River Queen waved a hand toward the window, overlooking the depths and the monsters prowling beyond. And does she have a good reason why I shouldn't kill Therian where he stands and send his body out to the River Beasts? Sathia didn't even glance toward the circling Sobax. Because he is now in Queen Bryce's employ, you strike him down, and you shall have the Fey to deal with. A flash of little pointed teeth. They'll have to get beneath first. Sathia didn't miss a beat. I believe it would not be in your best interest to become a city under siege. Holy gods, his wife had balls. Therian wisely wiped any sort of reaction from his face. But oh, Janice, damn him. If they survived this meeting, he wanted Sathia to teach him everything she knew. The River Queen scoffed, but angled her head before changing the subject. How does the girl suddenly wield such power? That is her own story to tell, Sathia said, folding her hands behind her back. But she has powerful allies, in this world and in others. Others? Therian dared say, turning his voice into a mirror of his wife's poised calm. Bryce counts the princes of hell as allies. Then she is an enemy to Midgard, and an imbecile as well, if she is seeking to hide the people of this city from the demons she'd ally with. She doesn't seek to hide people from hell, Therian said, but from the Asteri's wrath. The River Queen blinked slowly. You ask me to take a stand against the Republic itself. What happened in Asphodel Meadows was a disgrace, Therian said, voice dangerously low. If you don't stand against the Republic for something of this nature, then you're complicit in their slaughter. Sathia cut him a warning glance, but the River Queen studied him, like she hadn't really seen him until this point. She opened her mouth, and hope surged in Therian's chest— but then the interior door to the room hissed open, and the River Queen's daughter was charging in, rage and sorrow crumpling her beautiful face as she screamed, How could you? Is that a prince of hell? Ember whispered from a few steps behind Bryce, her teeth clacking with cold. Does she look like a prince? Randall hissed back, snow crunching as he hopped from one foot to another to keep warm. Bryce said Adis appeared to her as a cat, so who's to say? Guys, Bryce murmured, as Nesta slowly, slowly rose from her chair by the fireplace. A dagger had somehow appeared in the female's hand, as if it had been concealed under the cushion. It had worked. They'd managed to make the northern rift open to a place other than hell. What are you doing? Nesta said, and it occurred to Bryce in that moment that none of the others could understand her, which left Bryce as translator. 
So Bryce muttered to Hunt, wide-eyed but poised to leap into action. Give me a minute, and faced Nesta. I'm not going to harm you or your world, Bryce said in Nesta's own language. Then why is there a giant portal in my living room? Nesta's blue-gray eyes were gleaming with predatory violence. Some of that silver flame was starting to build at her fingertips. Would it withstand Bryce's starfire? Especially with the force of that leveled-up power in her body behind it. But she hadn't come here for that. I needed to talk to you. How did you know I'd be alone? I didn't. Erd threw me a bone. The dagger and the silver flame didn't vanish. Shut that portal. Not until I say what I need to say. The silver flame now flickered in Nesta's eyes. Then say it and be gone. Her gaze lowered to Bryce's side. And leave the dagger you stole. Bryce ignored that and swallowed hard. Ember hissed to Randall. I don't think it's going well. Randall hushed her. But Nesta's eyes slid to hunt, to the feathered wings, the lightning dancing at his hand, the halo on his brow. Is that your mate? Bryce nodded and motioned Hunt to step forward. Hunt Athalar. She'd never fucking use Dannon again for either of them. Hunt approached and inclined his head. Bryce could have sworn lightning lashed across his eyes, as if the power he'd summoned, enough to open the northern rift, was riding him hard. But Nesta only observed him imperiously, then turned to Bryce. What do you want? Bryce squared her shoulders. I need you to give me the mask. Chapter 77 is that a request or a threat? Nesta asked quietly, and even with a portal between them, the ground seemed to shudder at the female's power. It's a plea, a desperate fucking plea, Bryce said, and exposed her palms to the female in supplication. I need it to give me an edge against the Asteri, to destroy them. No. Nesta's eyes held no mercy. Now shut the portal and be gone. She glanced over a shoulder, where the stars seemed to be winking out in the far distance. Before the High Lord gets here and rips you to shreds. What is that? Hunt murmured, marking the darkness sweeping in. Resand, Bryce murmured back, then said to Nesta, Please, I don't need the mask forever, just until it's done. Then I'll return it. Nesta laughed, pure ice. You expect me to trust a female who tried to deceive and outsmart us at every turn. I did outsmart you, Bryce said coolly, and Nesta's eyes sparked at the challenge. But that's neither here nor there. Look, I get it. The mask is insanely powerful and dangerous. I wouldn't trust someone who asked me to use the horn either. But my world needs this. Nesta said nothing. The darkness crept closer. Fury leaked from it, along with a primal rage. Bryce took a step forward, and Nesta's dagger angled upward. Please, Bryce said again. I promise I'll return the mask, and Truth Teller. After I've done what I need to do here. You must think me a fool. If you believe I'd hand over one of the deadliest weapons in my world— especially when the monsters in your world have wanted to get their hands on it and the rest of the dread trove for millennia. Not to mention that few people can use the mask and live. You put it on, and you might very well die. That's a risk I'm willing to take, Bryce said calmly. And I'm supposed to trust that you, after all you did here, are going to return the mask out of the goodness of your heart. Bryce nodded. Yes. Nesta laughed joylessly, glancing at the approaching darkness. All I have to do is wait until he gets here, you know. Then you'll wish you'd shut that portal. I know, Bryce said, and her throat tightened. But I'm begging you. The Asteri just exterminated an entire human community in my city. Families. 
Her eyes burned with tears, and the frigid wind threatened to freeze them. They killed children. To punish me. To punish my mate. Bryce gestured to Hunt, for escaping their clutches. This has to end. It has to stop somewhere. The cold anger in Nesta's eyes flickered. Bryce couldn't stop the tears that slid down her cheeks, turning instantly to ice. I know you don't trust me. You have no reason to. But I promise I'll return the mask. I brought collateral to prove that my intentions are good, that I will give it back. And with that, Bryce ushered her parents forward. Ember and Randall gave her wary glances, but edged closer to the portal. It tore Bryce's heart out to do it, but she said firmly to Nesta, These are my parents, Ember Quinlan and Randall Salago. I'm giving them to you, to stay in your world until I destroy the Asteri and return the mask to you. Nesta's eyes flared with shock, but she mastered it instantly, squaring her shoulders. And if you die in the process, then my parents will be safer stuck in your world than in mine. But the mask will be in yours, in the hands of the Asteri. I don't have anything greater to offer you than this, Bryce said, voice cracking. It's not about offering me anything. Bryce bit back her sob, and her parents turned to her, confused and trusting, angry on her behalf without knowing why. Bryce, Hunt said, eyeing that approaching storm. We should shut the connection. Only Hunt knew the horrible thing she was doing, how it had killed her to leave Cooper behind, because it would have been too suspicious to insist he come on so dangerous a mission— but Baxi and Fury and June would look after him, and Syrinx. Bryce, her mom asked, what's going on? Bryce couldn't stop her tears as she looked at her mom, at her dad, possibly for the last time. Nothing, she said, and faced Nesta again. If you won't give me the mask, she said to the female, then take them anyway. Nesta blinked. Take my parents, Bryce said, voice breaking. They have no idea why they're here or who you are or what your world is. They think I'm talking to someone in hell. But take them and keep them safe. I ask only that. Nesta studied Bryce, then Bryce's mother and father. She set her dagger down on the side table near her chair. You'd leave them in my world and possibly never see them again. Yes, Bryce said. I need Hunt to help me against the Asteri. But my parents are human. They'll be easy targets for the Asteri. They're already being hunted by them. They're good people, she fought back another sob. They're the best people. Bryce, Randall said, enough warning in his voice that she knew he'd spied the encroaching darkness and could tell that something was not right with this plan. But Bryce couldn't look at her parents, only at Nesta. The silver fire in the female's gray-blue eyes banked, then vanished. Nesta extended her hand toward Bryce. Something golden glittered in it. The mask. For whatever good it can do you. Nesta said quietly, it's yours to borrow. A glance at her parents told Bryce enough. She'd take the collateral. Bryce's throat bobbed. Hunt murmured, what the fuck is that thing? As if he could sense the ancient, depthless power leaking from the mask in Nesta's hand. But Bryce said, thank you, and reached toward Nesta, she could have sworn the very world, all worlds, shuddered as Nesta's hand crossed into Midgard and passed the mask to Bryce. Then it was in Bryce's gloved fingers, and it was unholy and empty and cruel, but the star in her chest seemed to purr in its presence. Bryce tucked it into her jacket, zipping it up inside. It thrummed against her body, its ancient beat echoing in her bones. Her starlight seemed to flicker in answer, like whatever piece of Thea remained in it knew the mask and was glad to see it once more. Thank you, Bryce said again. 
The darkness was now blotting out the city below Nesta's window. Good luck, Nesta whispered. Bryce inclined her head in thanks, and with a subtle nod to Hunt, his power struck her parents, not lightning, but a storm wind at their backs, shoving them through the portal, through the northern rift, and into Nesta's world. Bryce! her mother shouted, stumbling. But Bryce didn't wait, didn't say anything as she willed the horn to sever the connection, to collapse the bridge between their worlds. The last image she had was of the darkness, of Rhysand's power, slamming into the windows of Nesta's room, her mother's outraged face, Randall reaching for his rifle. Snow and mist returned. The rift was shut, and her parents were on the other side of it. Bryce's knees wobbled. Hunt put a hand to her elbow. We have to get out of here. She had the mask, and the horn, and Thea's star, and the blades. It would have to be enough to take on living gods. Bryce, we have to go, Hunt said, stronger now. Can you teleport us back to the wall? It should have been a relief to know her parents were in that other world, with people who she had learned were decent and kind. But her mom would never forgive her. Randall would never forgive her. Not just for throwing them into that world, but for leaving Cooper behind. What the fuck? Hunt hissed, and Bryce whirled as he hauled her behind him. Right as the harpy, clad in white to camouflage her against the snow, dove from the mists. Even her black wings had been painted white to blend in. Amid the swirling mists, she was as awful as Bryce remembered. Yet her face, there was nothing alive there, nothing remotely aware. She was a husk, a host, with one mission, kill. Chapter 78 any hope of succeeding died in Therian, as the River Queen's daughter threw herself into her mother's lap and sobbed. You married her? They were the only words he could discern among the weeping. Sathia just stared at the girl, like she was completely out of politesse to spin to their advantage. The River Queen stroked her daughter's dark hair, murmuring gentle reassurances, but her eyes blazed with pure hate for Therian. Therian began... I... he couldn't find the right words. The River Queen's daughter lifted her head at his voice, her face streaked with tears. The river outside trembled, shaking the blue court. You sold yourself to some fey harlot? She sniffed at Sathia. With dirt in her veins? Not even a drop of water to call to you? Sathia took the insults, stone-faced, granting him a window into the way she'd been treated in her life. It didn't sit well. It was enough to goad him into responding. Her magic is that of growing things, of life and beauty, not of drowning and stifling. The River Queen's daughter stood slowly. You dare speak to me in such a way? And at her petulant fury, at her mother's rage, he'd had it. He'd fucking had it. Therian pointed to the window, not at the Sobex, but at the surface too far above to see. There are Imperial battleships in this river. Asphodel Meadows is a smoldering ruin, with the bodies of children strewn in the streets. He'd never yelled like this, at anyone, least of all his former queen and princess. But he couldn't stop it, the pure rage and desperation that ruptured from him. And all you care about is who one stupid fucking male is married to? There are babies in that rubble, and you cry only for yourself. Sathia was gaping, warning etched on her face, but Therian spoke directly to the River Queen. Bryce sent me to beg you to help, but I'm asking you personally, too. Not as mayor, not as someone in the Blue Court, but as a living being who loves this city. There is nowhere else on Valbara that might weather the storm. This place, beneath, it can withstand at least the initial brunt. Give the children of Crescent City a safe harbor, a chance. If you won't let all the people come, then at least take the children. No, 
the River Queen's daughter sniveled. You used and discarded me. You don't have the right to ask such favors of us, of the Blue Court. I'm sorry, Therian burst out. I am sorry that I misled you and slept with you and realized too late that I had gone too far. I'm sorry I strung you along for years. I didn't know how to talk to you or be an adult, and I'm sorry. It wasn't right of me, and it was immature, and I hate that I did that to you, to anyone. She glowered at him, sniffling. Therian said, and I married Sathia to bail her out of a shitty situation. King Morvan of Avalon was forcing her into marriage with a fey brute, and the only options were face the Asteri's wrath and die, or wed. I offered her a way out. Marriage to me. I owed it to my sister to help a female in trouble. Our marriage isn't a comment on how I feel about you or her. And the fact that she is a fey beauty held no sway over you? Sneered the River Queen's daughter. No, Therian said honestly. I... He looked toward his wife, who was indeed pretty. Beautiful but that hadn't entered into his decision to offer his aid. She was a person in trouble who needed help. The River Queen's daughter seethed. Therian said, voice breaking, But if you take in the people of this city, if you shelter them against whatever storm the Asteri might bring, when this is over, if I am alive, he held her stare, I will divorce my wife and marry you. Sathia whirled to him, but he couldn't face her, couldn't bear to see her reaction to how he'd abandon her, too. The River Queen's daughter sniffed, a child calming from a tantrum. I accept. I shall marry you once you're rid of her. You shall not. The River Queen's voice shook the room, the river. My daughter does not accept this offer, nor do I. Therian's chest crumpled. Please, he begged, if you could just... I am not done speaking, she said, and held up a hand. Therian obeyed. I no longer wish my daughter to be tied to the likes of you, in truth or in promise. As far as marriage between you is concerned, it shall never happen. Mother! You are your wife's problem now, the River Queen said to Therian. Therian shut his eyes against the stinging in them, hating this, hating that he'd lost this opportunity, this safe haven for the people of Crescent City, due to his own bullshit. But your willingness to sacrifice your freedom to live above is no small thing, the River Queen went on. She tilted her head to the side, and one of the shells in her hair sprouted legs and skittered under the tresses, a hermit crab. You never asked me why I sent you to look for Sophie Renast's body, and to find her brother. Therian opened his eyes, and found her staring curiously at him, not with kindness, but with something like respect. It... it wasn't my place to question he said. You are frightened of me, as all wise beings are, she said a shade smugly. But I have fears, too, of this world at the mercy of the Asteri. Therian tried not to gape. Our people are ancient, the River Queen said. My sisters and I remember a world before the Asteri arrived— and caused the land's magic to wither. Entire islands vanished into the sea, our civilizations with them, and though we were limited in our power to stop them, we have tried, each in our own way. Her daughter was staring at her like she didn't know her, but the River Queen went on. We remember the power the Thunderbirds wielded, how the Asteri hunted them down, because they feared them. And when I learned one had been killed, her Thunderbird brother on the loose, I knew those were assets the Asteri would seek to recover at any cost. 
I might not have known why, but I had no intention of letting them attain either Sophie or her brother. Therian blinked. You... you wanted them in order to stop the Asteri? A shallow nod. It might not have made a difference in the greater sense, but keeping them safe was my attempt, however small, at thwarting the Asteri's plan. Therian had no idea what to do other than bow his head and admit, Emil wasn't a Thunderbird, only a human. He's in hiding now. And yet you kept this from me. The river shuddered at her displeasure. I thought it would be best for the boy to disappear from the world completely. The ruler scanned his face again for a long, long moment. I see the male that you are the River Queen said, and it was more gentle than he'd ever heard her. I see the male that you shall become, she nodded to Sathia, who sees a female in trouble and does not think of the consequences to his own life before helping. A nod, grave and contemplative. I wish I had seen more of that male here. I wish you had been that male for my daughter. But if you are that male now, and you are that male for the sake of this city... She waved a hand, and the Sobex swam away on a silent command. Then the Blue Court shall help. Any who we can bring down here before the warships catch wind of it, any person, from any house, I shall harbor them. The Harpy was a horror, Hunt could feel her lack of presence, the emptiness leaking from her. The Asteri had raised her from the dead, but left her soul by the wayside. They'd bypassed the necromancers, who used one soul for resurrection, and instead created a perfect soldier to station here, one who did not feel cold, who did not need to eat, and who had no scruples whatsoever. And it had all come from his lightning— his hellfire. He knew deep down that it wasn't his fault, but he'd given Rigelus that lightning, and it had created this nightmare. Rigelus had to have guessed they'd come to the northern rift and planted the harpy to lie in wait. Hunt rallied his lightning, making the mists glow eerily around him, but Bryce said, What did they do to you? The harpy didn't answer. She didn't show any sign that she'd heard or cared as if she'd lost her voice, her very identity. Fry the bitch, Bryce muttered to Hunt, and he didn't wait before sending a plume of lightning for the harpy. She dodged it, those white-painted wings, as fast as they had ever been. No, they hadn't been painted white. They'd turned white, as if whatever the Asteri had done to her with Hunt's lightning had bleached the color out of them. Hunt threw another bolt of lightning, then another, and he might have lit up the whole fucking sky if not for that god's damned halo. Athalar! A familiar male voice rang from the mists above them. Hunt didn't dare take his focus off the harpy, as the voice clicked. Isaiah! What the hell? An equally familiar female voice said. Naomi. But it was the third voice, coming from behind him as its owner landed in the snow, that made Hunt's blood go cold. What new evil is this? The governor of Valbara had arrived. Bryce didn't know which was worse, Celestina or the harpy. The female who'd stabbed them in the back, or the one who'd literally tried to slit Rune's throat. She and Hunt couldn't take on two enemies at once not in sub-freezing temperatures, totally drained from opening the rift, with the mists obscuring almost everything. The harpy swooped, and Hunt launched his lightning, so fast only the swiftest of angels could evade the strike. The harpy did, and plunged earthward, mist streaming off her white wings, straight for Bryce. Bryce rolled out of the way, and the harpy hit the ground, snow exploding around her, but she was instantly up, lunging for Bryce again. Isaiah blasted the harpy with a wall of wind, knocking her back. 
but Celestina stood three yards away, and Hunt was already whirling to face her. Bryce unzipped her thick jacket, the cold wind instantly biting into her skin. She grabbed the mask and gave no warning at all as she fitted the icy gold to her face. Wearing the mask was like being underwater or at a very high altitude. Her head was full of its power, her blood thrumming, pulsing in time with the presence in her head, her bones. The world seemed to dilute into its basics, alive or dead. She was alive, but with the mask, she might escape even death itself and live forever. The star in her chest hummed, welcoming that power like an old friend. Bryce shoved aside her revulsion. Hunt was readying his lightning for Celestina, the mists glowing with each crackle, and the harpy had broken through Isaiah's power and was diving for Bryce again. Stop, Bryce said to the harpy. It was her voice, but not. The harpy halted. Everyone halted. Bryce, Hunt breathed, but he was far away. He was alive, and her business was with the dead. Neil. The harpy fell to her knees in the snow. Celestina started. What evil weapon have you? I shall deal with you later, Bryce said, in that voice that resonated through her and created ripples in the mist. Even the archangel fell silent as Bryce approached the harpy, peered down into her narrow, hateful face, truly soulless, a body with no pilot. Cold horror lurched through Bryce, despite the mask's unholy embrace. Maybe it was a mercy, she thought, as she stared into the vacant, raging face of the harpy. Maybe it was a mercy to do this. There was no soul to grab onto, to command, only the body, but the mask seemed to understand what was needed. Your work is done. Bryce said, her voice reverberating through the frozen landscape. Be at rest. It was sickening, and yet it was a relief as the harpy's eyes closed and she collapsed to the ground. As her skin began to wither, her body reclaiming the form it had known in death. The cheekbones sank, decaying over the harpy's face. Bryce knew that beneath the angel's white gear... Her body would be doing the same. When the harpy lay desiccated in the snow, Bryce finally peeled the mask off, only to find Naomi, Isaiah, and Celestina staring at her, awash in shock and dread. Chapter 79 Nah, Rune said into the phone, as he and Lydia once again wended through the sewers. They weren't at the Triari's private barracks. We waited for hours, but they're deserted. No one came or went. From the look of Isaiah's and Naomi's rooms, no one's been there for days. Lydia trudged ahead, neck bent forward as she checked a burner phone she'd brought with her from the depth charger. Years ago, it seemed. So what do we do? Flynn asked. Keep waiting? Deck was able to hack into the Ox's computers while I scouted around the area, but he found nothing about their movements either. It doesn't seem like the Ox even knows they're gone. With the Asteri out to punish anyone caught associating with them, it had been safest to observe the Ox from a distance rather than directly talk to anyone, not to mention the risk of being sold out to the Asteri by any enterprising sorts. Rune considered... If Isaiah and Naomi are missing, Celestina probably wants to keep their absence unnoticed. In the background, Declan said, You think she killed them? It's possible, Rune said, as Flynn switched him to speakerphone. We're going to circle back there tomorrow, see if we can pick up anything else. You two be on the lookout for any sign of them. Check the squares where they do the crucifixions. Fuck, Flynn said. I'll try to access the security footage from the Comidium, Deck volunteered. Maybe there's something there that can point us in the right direction. Rune sighed. Be careful. Let's rendezvous at sunset. 
the northeastern corner of the intersection just past the shooting range. Copy, Flynn and Dex said, and hung up. Rune and Lydia walked another block or so in the reeking quiet before he said, You lulled me to sleep with a story once, about a witch who turned into a monster. What of it? She glanced sidelong at him. Is it a real story, or did you make it up? It was a story my mother told me, she said softly. The only story I remember her telling me as a child before she let me go. He'd been about to ask if the similarities between the evil prince and Pollux, the kind knight and himself, had been meant prophetically, but at the sadness in her voice. I'm really sorry you went through that, Lydia. I can't imagine doing that to a child. The thought of letting my own kid go into the arms of a stranger. I did it, though, she said, staring ahead at nothing. What my mother did to me, I did exactly the same thing to my sons. His heart ached at the pain and guilt in her voice. You entrusted your sons to a loving family. I didn't know that. I had no idea who they were going to be living with. But the alternative was taking them with you. Maybe I should have. Maybe I should have run into the wilds and hidden forever with them. What kind of life would that have been? You gave them a real life, and a happy one, on the depth charger. A true mother would have. You are a true mother, he said, and grabbed her hand, turning her to face him. Lydia. You made an impossible choice. You decided to protect your children, even if it meant you wouldn't see them grow up. Fuck, if that doesn't make you a true mother, then I don't know what does. Pain rippled across her face, and he wrapped his arms around her as she leaned against his chest. They were the one thing that kept me going, she said. Through every horror, it was just knowing that they were there, and safe, and that my choices were keeping them that way. He slid a hand down her back, luxuriating in the feel of her, offering up whatever comfort he could. They stood there for long minutes, just holding each other. I told you before, she said against his chest, that you remind me that I'm alive. He kissed the top of her head in answer, her golden hair silky against his mouth, for a long time, I wasn't, she said. I did my work as the hind, as daybright, all to keep my sons safe and do what I thought was right. But I felt nothing. I was essentially a wraith most days, occupying a shell of a body. But then I met you, and it was like I was back in my body again, like I was... awake. She pulled back, scanning his face, I don't think I'd ever been truly awake, she said, until I met you. He smiled down at her, his heart too full for words, so he kissed her, gently, lovingly. She slid her hand into his as they continued onward, but Rune paused her again, long enough to tip her head back and kiss her once more. I know we have some shit to sort out still, he said against her mouth, but girlfriend, lover, whatever you want to be, I'm all in. Her lips curved against his in a smile. I thank Erd every single day that Cormac asked you to be my contact. He pulled away, grinning. I still owe you a beer. If we get through this, Rune, she said, I'll buy you a beer. Rune grinned again and slid an arm around her waist as they walked on into the gloom, they strode in warm, companionable quiet for several blocks, before Lydia's phone buzzed, and she pulled it from her pocket to glance at the screen. It's from the depth charger, she said, and paused to open the message. He watched her eyes dart over the screen, then halt. Her hands shook. Pollux, Lydia breathed, and Rune stilled. Her eyes lifted to his, and pure panic filled them as she whispered, He's taken my sons. Hunt didn't let himself dwell on it, the unholy majesty that was Bryce wearing the mask, on what she'd been able to do to the harpy. 
He faced Celestina, Isaiah, and Naomi behind her, all clad in heavy winter gear. Isaiah's and the governor's white wings were nearly invisible against the snow. All their faces, however, were taut with shock. What are you doing here? Hunt said. What is that? Naomi breathed, ignoring his question, eyes on the golden object in Bryce's hands. Death, Isaiah answered, face ashen. That mask, it's death. Hunt demanded again, what are you doing here? Isaiah's eyes shot to Hunt's. We've been tracking that thing. He gestured to the pile of clothes that had been the resurrected harpy moments before. Celestina's old contacts up here reported that the guard station at the wall had been attacked by some new terror. So we all raced up here, fearing it was something from hell. Why not send a legion? Hunt asked, eyeing the two angels who'd once been his closest companions. Why come yourselves? Because the Asteri ordered us to stand down, Naomi said. But someone still had to stop this carnage. Hunt met Celestina's eyes, the archangel's flawless face a mask of stone. Going off leash, huh? Temper sparked in her gaze. I regret what I did to you and yours, Hunt Athalar, but it was necessary to... Spare me, Hunt snapped. You fucking betrayed us to the Asteri. Hunt, Isaiah said, holding up a hand. Look, there's a lot of bad blood here. Bad blood? Hunt exploded. I fucking went to the dungeons because of her. He pointed at the governor. Bryce moved closer to him, a comforting presence at his side. He gestured to his forehead, barely visible with his gear. I have this halo on my fucking head again because of her. Celestina just stood there, shivering. As I said, I regret what I did. It has cost me more than you know. She seemed to blink back tears. Hypaxia has ended things between us. What? Your girlfriend didn't like that you're a two-faced snake? Hunt said. Hunt, Bryce murmured, but he didn't fucking care. You were supposed to be good, Hunt said, voice breaking. You were supposed to be the good archangel, and you're even worse than Micah. He spat, and it turned to ice before it could hit the snow. At least he made it clear when he was fucking someone over. His lightning thrashed in his veins, looking for a way out. Hunt, Naomi said. What the governor did was fucked up, but... She went against Asteri orders to be here, Isaiah finished. Let's get out of the cold and talk. I'm done fucking talking, Hunt said, and his power stirred. I am done with archangels and your fucking bullshit. His lightning hissed along the snow, and as his vision flashed, he knew lightning forked across his eyes. Celestina held up her gloved hands. I want no quarrel with you, Athalar. Too bad, Hunt said, and lightning skittered over his tongue. I want one with you. He didn't give any further warning before he hurled his power at the archangel. He gave everything, yet it wasn't enough. His power choked at its limits, restrained by the halo, a leash to hold demons in check. It hadn't worked on the princes. He'd be damned if he allowed it to keep working on him. Hunt let his power build and build and build. The snow around him melted away. Apollyon had given his essence, his hellfire, to Hunt. And if that made him a son of hell, so be it. Hunt closed his eyes and saw it there, the black band of the halo imprinted across his very soul, its scrolling vine of thorns, the spell to contain him. Everyone knew the enslavement spell couldn't be undone. Hunt had never even tried. But he was done playing by the Asteri's rules, by anyone's rules. Hunt reached a mental hand toward the black thorns of the halo, wreathed his fingers in lightning, in hellfire, in the power that was his and only his, and sliced through it. The thorns of the halo shivered and bled. Black ink dripped down, dissolving into nothing, gobbled up by the power that was now surging in him, rising up. Hunt opened his eyes to see Isaiah gaping at him in fear and awe. 
The halo still marred his friend's brow. No more. Knowing where it was, how to destroy it, made it easier. Hunt reached out a tendril of his power for Isaiah, and before his friend could recoil, he sliced a line through the halo on his brow. Isaiah hissed, staggering back. A roaring, raging wind rose from his feet as his halo, too, crumbled away from his brow. Celestina was looking between them, terror stark on her face. That's not... that's not... I suggest you run, Hunt said his voice as frozen as the wind that bit at their faces. But Celestina straightened, held her ground, and with bravery he didn't expect, she said, Why are you here? As if he'd be distracted by the question, as if it'd keep her fate at bay. Bryce answered for him, To open the northern rift to hell. Naomi whirled on Bryce and said, What? Isaiah, too stunned at his halo's removal to pay much attention to the conversation, was staring at his hands, as if he could see the unleashed power they now commanded. Celestina shook her head. You've lost your minds. She planted her feet, and white shining power glowed around her. You want to fight me, Athalar? Go ahead. But you're not opening the rift. Oh, I think we are. Hunt said, and launched his lightning at her. The world ruptured as it collided with a wall of her power, and Hunt poured more lightning in, snow melting away, the very stone beneath them buckling and warping as his lightning struck and struck and struck. Athalar, Naomi shouted. What the fuck? Celestina blasted out her power, a wall of glowing wind. Hunt snapped his lightning through it, he was done with the archangels, with their hierarchies, done with. Isaiah stepped into the fray, hands up. Stop, he said, and power glowed in his friend's eyes. Athalar, stop. She deserves to die. Every fucking archangel deserves to die for what they do to us, Hunt said through his teeth. But it registered suddenly that Bryce was no longer by his side. She was running back toward the rift, her star blazing, so bright, with the two other pieces of Thea's star now united with what Bryce had been born with, her star blazed as bright as the sun. The sun was a star, for fuck's sake. No! Celestina shouted, and her power flared. Hunt slammed his lightning into the archangel so hard it shattered her power, sending her flying back into the snow with a satisfying thud. Celestina's wings splayed wide, flinging snow in all directions, blood leaking from her nose and mouth. Don't, she cried to Bryce. I've dedicated years of my life to preventing the rift from opening, she panted. Find another way. Don't do this. Bryce halted, snow spraying with the swiftness of her stop. That magnificent star blazed from her chest, casting a brilliant glimmer over the snow. Breathing hard, Bryce said to the archangel, The princes of hell have offered their help, and Midgard needs it, whether you know it or not. Hunt and I have already killed two archangels. Don't make us kill you too. Hunt glanced to Bryce in question, as if there was an alternative to killing Celestina. You, Celestina said, you killed Micah and Sandriel? She whispered. They were stronger than you. Hunt said, so I don't think much of your chances. Hunt's lightning flared around him, poised to strike, to flay her from the inside out, as he had done with Sandriel. But Celestina's brown eyes widened at his lightning, released from its bonds and spreading through the world. She'd never seen the full extent of what he could do. She'd never had the chance during those weeks they'd worked together. How is it? How is it that you have the power of archangels, but are not one yourself? She asked. Because I'm the Umbra Mortis, Hunt said, voice unyielding as the ice around them. And he'd never felt more like it as he stared at Celestina, and knew that with one strike to her heart, she'd be smoldering bloody ruins. Celestina's gaze lowered, and she dropped to her knees, like she knew it too.
A plume of pure, uncut lightning rose above Hunt's shoulder, an asp ready to strike true. He looked to Bryce, waiting for the nod to incinerate her. But Bryce was staring at him sadly. Softly, lovingly, she said, You're not, Hunt. He didn't understand the words. He blinked at her. Bryce stepped forward, snow crunching under her feet. You're not the Umbra Mortis, she said. You never were, deep down, and you never will be. Hunt pointed a lightning-wreathed finger at Celestina. She and all her kind should be blasted off the face of Midgard. Maybe, Bryce said gently, taking another step. Her starlight faded into nothing, but not by you. Disgust roiled through him. He'd never once hated Bryce, but in that moment, as she doubted him, he did. She doesn't deserve to die, Hunt. Yes, she fucking does, Hunt spat. I remember each and every one of them. All the angels who marched against us on Mount Hermon. All the Senate, the Asteri, and the Archangels at my sentencing. I remember all of them, and she's no better than they were. She's no better than Sandriel, than Micah. Maybe, Bryce said again, her voice still gentle, soothing. He hated that, too. No one is forgiving her, but she doesn't deserve to die. And I don't want her blood on your hands. Where was this mercy when it came to the Autumn King? You didn't stop Rune, then. The Autumn King had done nothing in his long, miserable life except inflict pain. He didn't merit my notice, let alone my mercy. She does. Why? He looked to his mate, his rage slipping a notch. Why? Because she made a mistake, Naomi said, stepping forward, expression pained, and has been trying to make it right ever since. Isaiah and I didn't come up here with her because she ordered us to. We wanted to help her. Hunt pointed to the rift mere feet from Bryce. She's going to stop you from opening it. I will not, Celestina promised, keeping her head bowed. I yield. Let her go, Hunt, Bryce said. Morvan yielded and you killed him, Hunt snapped at her. I know, Bryce said, and I'll live with that. I wouldn't wish the same burden on you. Hunt, we have enough enemies. Let her go. I swear upon Solas himself, Celestina said, the highest oath an angel could invoke, that I will help you if it is within my power. I'm not going to take the word of an archangel. Well, we're going to need this archangel, Bryce said, and Hunt's rage slipped further as he looked to her again. What? Bryce glanced at the harpy's body, half-melted from Hunt's lightning clashing with Celestina's power. The rock around it had been warped. His lightning had altered the stone itself. Bryce closed the distance between her and Hunt, reaching out to take his hand. His lightning crawled over her skin, but he didn't let it hurt. He could never hurt her. You said you're with me, all of you. Bryce murmured, staring at him and only him. Put the past behind you. Focus on what's ahead. We have a world to save, and I need my mate at my side to do it. No one else. Not a son of hell, not the Umbra Mortis, not even Hunt fucking Athalar. I need my mate. Just Hunt. He saw it all in her eyes, that no matter what had happened, who he'd been and what he'd done, it really didn't matter to her. Being made in hell didn't matter to her. But she captured who he was, deep down, in those photos last spring. The person she'd brought into the world. The person she loved. Just Hunt. So he let go. Let go of the lightning, of the death singing in his veins. Let go of Apollyon's and Thanatos's smirking faces. Let go of his rage at the archangel before him, and the archangels who'd existed before her. Just Hunt. He liked that. His lightning faded, fizzling away entirely. 
and he said to Bryce, as if she were the only person on Midgard in any galaxy, I love you, just Bryce. She snickered and kissed him lightly on the cheek. Now, if you don't plan on killing Celestina anymore, Bryce pulled the mask from her jacket again, we're going to raise an army. What army? Isaiah whispered. We're going to raise the fallen, Bryce said, tossing the mask in the air and catching it like it was a fucking sunball. Hunt's knees buckled. You said we were going to use the mask to fight the Asteri. And we are, Bryce said, pitching the mask up and catching it once more. It's your fault you didn't ask for specifics on how we'd use it against them. No, he'd assumed she'd put it on and it would give her some edge to kill them. Hunt shook his head. You're out of your mind. Bryce halted her tossing at that, voice gentling. We need a distraction for the Asteri. Hell won't be enough. But an army of the dead, an army of the fallen, will work nicely. An army that won't have to die again. And Isaiah and Naomi are going to lead them. That's why you sent Rune and Lydia to get them, Hunt said quietly, fighting through his shock. Isaiah gave him a questioning look, but Bryce replied, Yes, I thought if we could get them and get the mask from Nesta, it might work. But how can you raise them? Hunt demanded. Nesta had used the bones of a beast, Bryce had told him. Their bodies are gone. The Asteri kept their wings. Bryce said, disgust lacing every word. They kept your wings, like trophies. But because they didn't have sailings, I think part of their souls might still be attached. Hunt rubbed at his frozen face. And what? You're just going to have a bunch of wings flying around? She cut him a sharp look. No. Well, yes, but only to get them to where we need their souls. You said the mask can reanimate dead bodies, not give souls new ones. That's what I saw Nesta do, Bryce said. But Thea Star? Cupping her hands before her chest, she drew out the blazing, beautiful star. It illuminated the mists, set the snow at their feet sparkling. Wow, Naomi breathed. What Bryce had taken from her chest that day during the attack last spring was a fraction of the star she now held between her palms. This, Bryce said, face glowing in the starlight, seems to recognize the mask somehow. When I put the mask on, I could feel the pull between the two powers. Maybe it's something about Thea's star. I think it can command the mask to do different things. This isn't the time to experiment, Hunt warned. I know, Bryce conceded, but I think all it would take is a bit of the deceased, and I could make them anew. Not give them true life, but their souls would be returned, given new forms. Unlike... unlike what the Asteri did to the Harpy. That mask can truly raise the dead, then, Naomi said hoarsely. Bryce nodded. The fallen wouldn't be given new breathing bodies, but yes, they'd be able to help us. What sort of bodies, then? Isaiah asked, glancing nervously at Hunt. Ones the Asteri already made for us, Bryce said a shade quietly. Perfect blends of magic and tech. The new mech suits, Hunt realized. The ones the Asteri stationed on Mount Hermon. Bryce nodded gravely. I think Rigel has stationed those suits up there to taunt you guys, but it's about to blow up in his stupid fucking face. Lydia said the suits don't need pilots to operate, so we don't have to worry about any physical interference. Deck can hack into their computer system and block Imperial access, while the souls of the fallen fuse with the mech suits and pilot them under Naomi and Isaiah's command but to do what she was suggesting. We can't, Hunt rasped, wings slumping. I can't ask them to die for us again, even if they're already dead. The fallen have given too much. Bryce walked over to him, took his hand. 
We need those suits piloted by the Fallen, or they'll be used against us by the Asteri. We need the Asteri and their forces entirely occupied. But Hunt's heart twisted. Bryce, it will be their choice whether to return, to pilot those suits. I'll give them that choice when I raise them, and I'll be with you for every moment of it. She nodded to Isaiah and Naomi. They'll command the Fallen. You don't need to shoulder that burden anymore. I'll need you with me, in the Asteri's palace. He closed his eyes, breathing in her scent. Celestina could have struck, he supposed, but she remained kneeling. And just as he had that day when Hunt had given Sandriel her due, Isaiah suddenly knelt before him. Naomi joined him on her knees. I'm not an archangel, Hunt blurted, and I haven't agreed to lead you to, so get up. It was Celestina who said, Perhaps the age of archangels is over. You sound happy about it. I would be, if it were to come to pass, Celestina said and got to her feet. I told you once, Shahar was my friend. I might not have had the courage to fight alongside her then, her chin lifted, but I do now. He was having none of it. And what are you going to do during all this? Bryce answered before Celestina could reply. She's going to Ephraim's fortress. At Hunt's surprised look, echoed by Celestina, Bryce explained, He's the closest archangel to the Eternal City. We need him occupied. If Ephraim joins the fight, it will complicate everything. Celestina nodded gravely. I will make sure he does not come within a hundred miles of the capital. How? Hunt demanded. Tie him up? I will do whatever is necessary to end this, Celestina said, chin high. Hunt pointed to the rift. We're going to open the rift to hell. You didn't seem too keen on that a moment ago. Celestina glanced between Hunt and Bryce. It goes against everything I've worked for, but it does seem that all you two have done has been in the best interest of the innocence of Midgard. I don't believe that you would open the rift if it would jeopardize the most vulnerable. Yeah, Hunt snapped. And where the fuck were you when Asphodel Meadows was blasted into nothing? That brought a measure of ice to Bryce's stare. True grief filled Celestina's eyes. It was the final straw, Hunt, Isaiah said. Why we... She disobeyed the Asteri. They gave no warning. The ships pulled into the Istros, and they said it was for our protection. I didn't even know the ships could send aerial missiles that far. Naomi's lashes were pearled with tears that quickly turned to ice as she added, It was the most cowardly, unforgivable. We don't stand for that. None of us, not Celestina, and certainly not the 33rd. Hunt looked back to Bryce and found only pain and cold resolve staring back at him. She was right. They had enough enemies, ones who had to pay. And he might not have trusted one word out of an archangel's mouth, but if Isaiah and Naomi believed Celestina, that meant something. Isaiah who had suffered under archangels as much as Hunt had, was here, helping Celestina, knowing she had betrayed his friend. Isaiah wasn't some spineless asshole. He was good and smart and brave. And Isaiah was here. So Hunt said, All right, let's ring Hell's doorbell. Hunt had enough lightning left to blast Bryce again, it passed through her and into the gate, into the heart of the northern rift. Her will, blazing with that undiluted starlight, changed its location once more. Celestina, Isaiah, and Naomi held back a step, all glowing with power, readying for the worst. Impenetrable darkness spread within the archway, broken only by two glowing blue eyes. Prince Adis stood there impeccably dressed in his jet-black clothes, not one golden hair on his head out of place. He surveyed the icy terrain, the sun now setting after a brief window of daylight. 
Bryce swung her arm out in a grand, sweeping gesture as the Prince of the Chasm stepped through the northern rift. Welcome back to Midgard, she said. Hope you have a pleasant stay. Chapter 80 So, Jessiba said, drumming her fingers on her desk, the pup goes to pitch a deworming medicine to a bunch of wolves and comes home prime. Ethan ignored the jab. I need you to get me in with the Underking, he said. He'd showered in the barracks at the den and changed into nondescript ox clothes, then swiftly checked on Perry and the others before running back to the House of Flame and Shadow. He was prime, yes, and all that entailed, but... Why? I need to see my brother, and considering that it was a fucking disaster the last two times I tangled with the dead, I'm not going to make mistakes this time. I need the Underking's help. Ethan paced her office. Again. Why? He looked straight at her. Because Connor is trying to reach me. He'd heard that howl from the bone quarter and known whose it was. Who was calling to him? While Ethan had changed, Hypaxia had handed out the antidote at the den to those who'd take it. Perry had been first in line, apparently. And it hadn't been an Omega standing before Ethan when he'd checked on her as he left the den. Ethan hadn't stayed long enough to find out what Perry was, what powers she and the others had gained, long buried in the wolves' bloodline. He'd given the order that this new knowledge was to be contained to the den, and the wolves had agreed. Obeyed him. You were right, Ethan said to Jessiba, about needing a plan. I have no idea what I'm doing. You could take some lessons from Quinlan about thinking two steps ahead. Ethan glared at her. Any updates from Avalon? She called two hours ago, wanting a favor, as always, and an update on your progress, the sorceress smirked. And when I told her what Hypaxia had accomplished, of course, she requested that you bring that antidote to her. When? Where? Jessica smirked again. The Eternal City. Tomorrow. I think Quinlan's had enough of being pushed around. She said to bring some wolves, if you have any to back you up. Ethan stared, to not only be Prime, but to act as Prime? Is there going to be a battle? I don't know. Jessica fixed him with a grave look. But if I were you, I'd get the pups and vulnerable wolves to safe hiding places. Not the den. Not in Lunathian. Get them evacuated deep into the wild go to ground, and then take the best fighters you have to the Eternal City. There aren't many at the den. Most are away. Then take whoever's around. It will be better than nothing. Ethan paced a step, then another. Maybe I should have left Sigrid in that tank. It'd be better than being a reaper. There was no one to blame for her predicament but himself. Ethan rubbed his forehead. Look. I need to see my brother. One last time. That's impossible. Ethan's teeth flashed. I know you can ask the Underking. He didn't wait for her reply before he asked, Do you know, about the second light, that our souls are food for the Underking and the Asteri? Yes. Ethan shook his head. And it doesn't bother you? Of course it bothers me. It's bothered me for 15,000 years. But it is just one branch of the many-headed beast of the Asteri rule. Ethan scrubbed at his face. Can you help me or not? He'd need all the help he could get. He wasn't a leader. Judging by the mess he'd brought upon Sigrid, he wasn't fit to make decisions for anyone. He'd tried to save her and failed. Utterly and completely failed. That had been only one life, with all the Valbaran wolves now his responsibility. He pushed back against the crushing panic and dread. Jessiba was silent for a moment. Then she said quietly, Let me see what I can do, pup. Her mouth twisted to the side. Bring Hypaxia with you.
Bryce had just entered the guard booth when her phone rang. She'd needed one second, one fucking moment by herself, to process the enormity of what she'd done. She'd thrown her parents into the fey world. Bryce had always found a sense of comfort in knowing that no matter what she did, or where she was, Ember Quinlan and Randall Salago were in Nidaros, that Ember and Randall existed and would always be there to fight for her, fight with her if she was being honest about her mom. Knowing that was a comfort, too. And now they were. Gone. Alive, yes, but on the other side of the universe. They could have stayed on a Valen, safe with everyone else, with Cooper. But she'd needed them. Needed them to bargain with Nesta. But she also needed to know that her parents were forever beyond the Asteri's reach. It was selfish, she knew. Cowardly but she didn't regret it. Though she really wanted one second to process it all, hence the guard booth, until the phone rang. She'd been out of range beyond the wall, so she had no idea if it was Erd's timing or if her brother had been trying to reach her nonstop. She answered on the first ring. Rune? I need you back here. What's wrong? Panic edged his every word. Pollux intercepted the depth charger as it dropped people off at the edge of Avalon's mists. He slaughtered a bunch of mare, and I don't know how, but he knew about Lydia's sons. He took them. He's holding them at the palace. Bryce nearly dropped her phone. Outside, Hunt was a shadow against the darkness and snow, their companions more shadows around him. I guess the Asteri figured out how to lure us to them, Bryce said quietly. The depth charger sent us a transport pod. We're about to get on it with Flynn and Deck and head to the Eternal City, Rune said hoarsely. But if those kids are in the dungeons... Her stomach flipped. Okay, she breathed. Yes, of course. Okay, we'll get on the helicopter immediately. Rune let out a shaking breath. Did you... Do what you needed to, up there? Yes, Bryce said, and stepped out into the howling wind and brutal cold. Hunt and Adis were huddled together, planning. Isaiah and Naomi stood a few feet away, chiming in, but keeping their distance, as if not quite comfortable with the idea that they were in the presence of a prince of hell. Celestina had flown off to Ephraim's fortress in Revillus moments ago, her white wings blindingly bright with the light off the snow. She'd keep him occupied, she'd promised again before leaving, with a final nod to Hunt that he hadn't returned. Beyond Hunt and the others, stretching into the distance, marched the armies of hell. They covered all twenty-four and a half miles from the wall to the still-open rift. Unholy terrors, especially those pets that had been unleashed in Crescent City this spring. Bryce had never been more glad to have the Arkesian amulet around her neck, though she wondered if it could hold off this many demons, should they choose to have a little snack. From Hunt's tense shoulders, she knew the horde was as unnerving for him as it was for her. Leathery-winged, horned humanoids that seemed to be grunt soldiers— Bone-white reptilian beasts that crawled on all fours, hounds of war. Skeletal beings with two large jaws, stacked with needle-like teeth that gleamed with greenish slime. There were more, so many more. Things that slithered, things that flew, things that surveyed Midgard with milky, sightless eyes and bayed at the anticipated bloodlust. Hunt offered no commentary on the endless lines of nightmares— He'd spent a lifetime hunting down the very creatures now fighting for them. How many of Hell's marching forces knew that, too? How many of them had crossed into Crescent City just a few months ago and gleefully unleashed pain and death? But this time, true to the prince's word, the beasts stayed in line. As for the soldiers, Bryce didn't look too closely at the faces beneath their armor— at the spiky wings poking above the lines, the taloned hands gripping spears. But they did not speak, did not snarl. Their breath curled from beneath the visors of their helmets with each step through the frigid air, each step deeper into Midgard. 
all of hell, ready to strike. She had to trust that it would prove to be the right choice. Tell Lydia we're coming, Bryce said to Rune, still on the line. The thundering of their feet and hooves and claws shook the snowy earth. And tell her we're not coming alone. Chapter 81 This seems familiar, Ethan muttered to Hypaxia as they stood on the black dock, each clutching a death mark in their hands. You, me, the Underking. Our best friend, Hypaxia said wryly, the mists from the bone quarter an impenetrable wall across the river. She gestured to the water. Shall we? Ethan nodded, and they flicked their death marks into the river. They landed with a soft plunk, and ripples spread outward in only one direction, south, toward the bone quarter. They vanished into the mist. In the ensuing silence, Ethan dared say, Jessica said you and the governor were, uh, together. How long? She threw him a pained wince. A while, but not any more. Even while she was with Ephraim? Her arrangement with Ephraim is a political contract. What she and I have... had. She shook her head, the moonlight silvering her dark curls. I'm sure Jessica said I was naive. Maybe, he hedged. Hypaxia looked at where her death mark had disappeared under the surface. Everyone told me, you know, that archangels aren't to be trusted, that they've got those secret training camps that indoctrinate them, that they're puppets for the Asteri. But she spent all that time in Nenya, and I thought it had removed her from their influence. She chewed on her lip, then added, Apparently, it gave her incentive to do whatever it took to get her off that frozen bit of land. We... We all make bad decisions, he blew out a breath. Gods, that sounded dumb. Hypaxia laughed quietly. It's appreciated nonetheless. She sobered. But when I learned what she'd done, well, I miss my mother most days, but especially lately, especially after everything with Celestina. She indicated the mists across the way. So I understand why you seek out your brother. I'm sorry about your mother, he offered. Most people tell me I should be over her passing, but her shoulders bowed. I don't know if there will ever come a day when I don't feel like there's a hole in my heart where she used to be. Yeah, he said quietly, his own chest aching. I know the feeling. He cleared his throat. So you couldn't, uh, raise your mom with your necromancy? No. Hypaxia said gravely. She took steps to ensure that her soul did not fall into the clutches of the Underking. And even if I could, she would resent me for using it for something so... selfish. She's your mom, though. She was also my queen. Hypaxia's chin lifted. And she would be ashamed to learn that I have defected from the witches and yielded my crown. So, no, I don't want to see her. I couldn't face her, even if I had the chance. Aren't you still a witch, though? I mean, yeah, you're now in flame and shadow, but you didn't stop being a witch. Jessica may have rejected the title, but that had been her choice. I'm still a witch, Hypaxia said, hands curling at her sides. That can never be taken away from me. Ethan surveyed the black planks beneath his feet, he had to arrange the sailing for the prime. For Sabine, too, he supposed. Did he, though? The prime's soul was gone. There was nothing to offer up to the bone quarter beyond an empty body. And if the people of Lunathian saw the prime's boat tip, not understanding why, he couldn't allow it. He'd gladly give Sabine the indignity of letting everyone see her boat tip. He'd also be glad to let her soul live on in the bone quarter, until it was time to be turned into mystery meat for the Asteri. But he'd have to decide whether she deserved a sailing in the first place. Gods, he wished Bryce was with him. She'd have an idea. 
just cut her up real small and shove her down the garbage disposal. Ethan snorted and offered up a prayer to Luna's bright face above him, that his friend was indeed safe and on the move. A black boat glided out of the mists ahead, aiming straight for Ethan and Hypaxia, waiting on the dock, exactly as Jessica had promised it would. Ethan swallowed hard. Cab's here. Ethan knew he was prime of the Valbaran wolves, but he certainly didn't feel like it. The whole thing was a joke. He was just... a dude. Granted, one with more power than he'd realized. But now there were people depending on him. He had to make decisions. At least a sunball captain, he'd had coaches telling him what to do. Now he was coach and captain rolled into one. And, given how much he'd fucked up lately, how every choice to help Sigrid had only led her toward an absolutely disastrous fate... Gods, he really didn't feel like Prime at all. But he tried to at least look like it, back straight, shoulders squared, as he and Hypaxia stood before the Underking in a gray-stoned temple to Erd. The Underking lounged on a throne beneath a behemoth statue of a figure holding a black metal bowl between her upraised hands. Symbols were carved all over the bowl, continuing down her fingers, her arms, her body. Ethan could only assume it was meant to represent Erd. No other temples ever depicted the goddess. No one even dared. Most people claimed that fate was impossible to portray in any one form. But it seemed that the dead, unlike the living, had a vision of her, and those symbols running from the bowl onto her skin, they were like tattoos. They looked oddly familiar. Ethan didn't have time to ponder it, as he and Hypaxia inclined their heads to the Underking. Thank you for the audience, Ethan said, trying to keep his breathing normal, praying that none of those hounds the Underking had sent after them on the autumnal equinox were lurking around in the misty shadows. At least there weren't any reapers, no sign of Sigrid wherever she'd gone. One more clusterfuck for him to deal with, but another day. If he managed to live another day, of course. The Underking's bony, withered fingers clicked on the stone arms of his throne. Prime, he said to Ethan. I'm honored to be your first political visit. Though I believe protocol dictates that a meeting with the governor should have been your priority. A knowing glance at Hypaxia. Unless present company makes such things uncomfortable. Hypaxia's eyes flickered, but she said nothing. They'd come here for a reason, so Ethan ignored the Underking's mocking and said, Look, uh, your majesty. The Underking gave him a smile that was all browned, aged teeth, Ethan tried not to shudder. Jessica Roga said you agreed that we could make a request. I'd like to speak to my brother, Connor Holstrom. The Underking turned to Hypaxia. Did I not give you duties to attend to? Handing out blood bags to vampires isn't a good use of my time, Hypaxia said with impressive authority. Shall I reassign you to waiting on the Reapers? A cruel smile. They'd enjoy a taste or two of you, girl. I only want five minutes with my brother, Ethan interrupted. To do what? The Underking leaned forward. I need to tell him a few things. The goodbye you never got to say, the Underking taunted. Yes, Ethan said sharply. The Underking angled his head. And you promise not to warn him of what awaits. Does it matter if I do? He's trapped here already, Ethan said, gesturing to the temple, the barren land beyond. I have no interest in civil unrest, even amongst the dead, the Underking said. And too much unrest would bring unwanted attention and questions.
from the Asteri, no doubt. Ethan crossed his arms. That didn't seem to be your position when you sold my friends out to Pippa Spetsos. Pippa Spetsos stood to assist in expanding my kingdom significantly, the creature said. It was an investment for my reapers, to keep them contented and fed. Ethan blocked out the flash of the Prime's broken body, the way Sigrid had sucked out his soul. Hypaxia said calmly, Why did the Reapers first defect from Apollyon and join you? The Underking flinched. Do not speak his name here. My apologies, Hypaxia murmured. She didn't sound at all sorry. But the Underking settled himself. In hell. The Reapers fed on and ruled the vampires. And when the vampires defected to this world, the Reapers followed their food source and found the other beings on Midgard to be a veritable feast. So they have left the vampires to themselves, feeding as they please on the rest of the populace. Ethan couldn't stop his shudder this time. He couldn't imagine what hell was like if reapers and vampires had just been walking about. But you are not from hell, Hypaxia said. No. The Underking's milky eyes settled on Ethan. I was birthed by the void. But my people, he smiled cruelly at Ethan, they were not unknown to your own ancestors, wolf. I crept through when they charged so blindly into Midgard. This place is much better suited to my needs than the caves and barrows I was confined to. Ethan reeled. You came from the Shifter's world? You were not known as Shifters then, boy. Then what? And she... The Underking went on, gesturing to that unusual depiction of Erd towering above him. Was not a goddess, but a force that governed worlds. A cauldron of life, brimming with the language of creation. Erd, they call her here. A bastardized version of her true name. Word, we called her in that old world. That is all well and good, Hypaxia said, but my friend's request. Go speak to your brother, boy, the Underking drawled, almost melancholy, as if all the talk of his old world had exhausted him. You have seven minutes. Ethan's mouth dried out. But where? The Underking pointed to the exit behind them. There. Ethan turned, and there was Connor, as vibrant as he'd ever been in life, standing in the temple doorway. Chapter 82 Ethan didn't know whether to laugh or cry as he sat beside his brother on the front steps of the temple. Hypaxia remained inside, speaking quietly with the Underking. Connor appeared exactly as he had the day Ethan had last seen him, cheering in the stands at his sunball game. Except for the bluish light around his body, the mark of a ghost. Ethan had found out the hard way what that meant. He tried to hug his brother, but his arms went right through him. Seven minutes, less than that now. There's so much I wanted to say to you, Ethan began. Connor opened his mouth, but no sound came out. Ethan blinked. You can't... you can't talk? Connor shook his head. Ever or just now? Connor mouthed, ever. But Danica talked to Bryce. Connor tapped his chest, as if to say, in here. Ethan rubbed at his face. The Underking fucking knew you couldn't talk, and... Blue glowed in his vision as Connor laid a hand on his shoulder. It didn't have any weight, but the look his brother gave him, pitying and worried. 
I'm sorry I wasn't there, Ethan said, voice breaking. Connor slowly shook his head. I should have been there. Connor laid a finger on his lips. Don't say another word. Ethan swallowed down the tightness in his throat. I miss you every single day. I wish you were with me. I... Fuck, I'm knee-deep in shit, and I could really use my brother right now. Connor angled his head. Tell me. Ethan did, as succinctly as he could, aware of each second counting down, about Sigrid and Sabine and the Prime, about what he was now, about the parasite and its antidote. Ethan glanced at his phone when he finished. Only two minutes left. Connor was smiling faintly. What? Ethan said. His brother laid a hand on his heart and bowed his head, a mark of respect to the prime. Ethan glowered. It's not funny. Connor lifted his head, shaking it. There was nothing but pride in his eyes. Ethan's throat closed up. I don't know what to do now. How to be prime? How to fix this shit with Sigrid? If it can even be fixed. We're all out of Athalar's lightning now anyway. Maybe I'm an asshole for not making Sigrid a priority. But I need to help Bryce and the others first. I'm so fucking far out of my league. And there's more I can't tell you. I wish I could, but... Connor glanced behind them, to the temple and the underking inside it. When he was assured that they were truly alone, he extended a hand toward Ethan... A sparkling seed of light filled it. Connor lifted it to his mouth and mimicked eating it. You know, Ethan whispered, about the second light? Connor nodded once. Ethan snorted. Trust the pack of devils to figure it out. But Connor reached into a pocket and laid something on the ground between them. A bullet. It was crafted of the same reeking metal as a death mark, as if it had been created from all those coins tossed into the river. Whatever properties its metal held must have allowed it to be touched and moved by the dead. I don't understand, Ethan said. What is it? Connor began gesturing, too fast for Ethan to follow. But robes rustled on stone, and Ethan grabbed the black bullet before the underking appeared from between the temple pillars and declared... Your time has come to an end. Connor looked to Ethan's hand, then up at him, eyes pleading with him to catch his meaning. Just one more minute, Ethan begged. Please. You have already been granted more than most mortals ever receive. Be grateful. Be grateful, Ethan breathed, as Hypaxia stepped beside the Underking. For what? For my brother being here? His shout echoed off the gray pillars, the gravel, the empty mists. Connor signaled to shut up. Ethan ignored him. I refuse to accept this, Ethan seethed, claws glinting at his fingertips. That this is the best it gets. Remember your vow, pup. The Underking warned. Ethan bristled. What are you but some freak alien from another world who capitalized on this one? Connor was staring at him now, eyes wide, urging him to be quiet, to stand down. But that thing that had awoken in Ethan the moment the parasite had vanished wouldn't go away. It stared down this creature, this thing from his people's home world, and it knew the Underking for what he truly was. Enemy, his blood sang, and it spoke of caves beneath hills, of plundered graves and musty darkness. Enemy. Ethan's snarl cleaved the mists, bounced off the temple. Frost curled at his fingertips. Even Connor backed away in surprise. What is that? The Underking said, backing away a step as well, toward the temple interior. Ethan peered down at his hands, the ice crusting them. Enemy. The silent dead, the suffering. Ethan would stand for it no more. Get out of my realm, the Underking said, 
and Ethan scented his fear, his surprise and dread, like he knew Ethan for that ancient enemy as well. The Underking backed away another step, nearly inside the temple now, and slipped on pure ice. Writing himself, robes fluttering, he lifted a bony hand, and Ethan knew in his gut it would be to summon the hunting hounds. Ethan didn't give him the chance. Ice crusted the Underking's withered hand, then his arm, then his shoulder. Stop this, now, the Underking bellowed, but the ice kept crawling over him. Ethan let it. Let this male see what a ruthless fucking murderer he was. Let him see that he wouldn't tolerate this shit for his brother, for his parents, for anyone he loved. No more sailings. He'd never go to another. He'd single-handedly destroyed the Fendir line. Why not destroy death, too? The Underking opened his mouth to shout, but Ethan's ice covered his face, his body, an encasing cold so complete Ethan could feel it in his heart, hear its frigid wind, capable of killing in seconds. Ethan yielded to it, poured it into the being now trapped on the stairs before him like a statue. He knew Connor was watching in horror, and he didn't dare take his focus off the Underking long enough to read Hypaxia's face. Ethan became so cold he forgot what warmth was, forgot fire and sun and... Connor got in front of him, snarling. Ethan's focus slipped, but instead of the disgust and dismay he thought would be on Connor's face, there was only sorrow and worry. Well, that's one way to shut the old windbag up, Jessica Roga said, stalking from the shadows of the temple interior. Ethan whirled. But Jessiba said to Hypaxia, who was tense and thrumming with power by the nearest pillar, Do it. The former witch queen didn't strike with her shimmering power. She merely lifted an unlit brazier from beside the temple entrance. With a face like stone, Hypaxia swung the dark metal, and the underking exploded into sparkling shards of ice. Chapter 83 There was a ringing silence as Ethan took in the pile of ice that had once been the Underking, and felt nothing. The Underking was dead, gone. Ethan had killed him. Looks like we'll need a new head of house, Jessiba said calmly to Hypaxia, who was staring down at the Underking, clearly appalled at what she'd done, what they'd done. When I swung at him, Hypaxia said quietly to Ethan, ignoring Jessiba, I put a bit of my power behind the blow. Hypaxia held out a bloodied hand to Ethan, and he realized that he too was bleeding all over, from the explosion of razor-like ice shrapnel. Rivers of red ran down his hands, his face. Hypaxia didn't look much better. He slid his bloodied hand into hers, her hand glowed, and they were both healed. The cuts on her face vanished, along with his, judging by the tingle that washed over his skin, faster than he'd ever seen any other medwitch work. Play later, Jessiba said. We have work to do. What work? Ethan asked. You kill it. You become it, Jessiba said to Hypaxia. You are now, for all intents and purposes, head of the House of Flame and Shadow, and this place. Her face paled. That's not possible. I don't want that burden. Too bad. You killed him. Hypaxia advanced on Jessiba, her face twisted in anguish and fury. You knew this would happen, she accused. You made me escort Ethan, not to help him, but... I suspected things might shake out in your favor, Jessiba said mildly. But even though you've inherited this place by right, you must make some decisions quickly, before Rigelis becomes aware. Like what? Ethan demanded, looking to Connor, who still stood nearby at the top of the stairs, watching them all with awe on his ghostly face. Like what to do with the souls here, Jessiba said, nodding to Connor. 
We let them go, Ethan said. We don't even need the quiet realms at all, do we? No, Jessica said. Death worked just fine without them before the Asteri came. But Connor was shaking his head. No? Ethan asked. His brother nodded to Ethan's clenched fist, clutching the black bullet. Connor opened his mouth, but still, no sound emerged. Oh, please, Jessica said and turned to Hypaxia. Order him to speak already. Hypaxia's brows rose. Speak. Connor blew out a breath, distinctly audible. Hypaxia was truly the mistress of this place. Ethan marveled at it. And it was his brother's voice, the voice he'd known his whole life, that insisted, Don't send us off into the ether. Connor, Ethan started. Connor held Hypaxia's stare. Don't miss this opportunity. He began walking down the stairs, nearly running, and it was all they could do to follow him. With that strong, sure grace, his brother stalked down the empty avenue flanked with strangely carved obelisks, all the way to the dead gate, its crystal muted in the dimness. Only when they stood before it did Connor speak again. That bullet, Connor said, nodding to where Ethan held it, was made by us, the dead, for Bryce. A soft, pained smile crossed his face at her name. To use with the Godslayer rifle. What's so special about it? Jessica demanded. Nothing yet, but it was crafted to hold us, our second light. As if in answer, the gate began to glow. We had planned to make contact with Jessica, to ask her, through her role in Flame and Shadow, to get in touch with one of you. Connor shrugged with one shoulder. But when you appeared earlier, Ethan, with the Underking distracted, well, it was a little earlier than we'd planned. But everyone was ready. I think Erd made it so. After all Ethan had heard and experienced, he didn't doubt his brother's claim. So they began the exodus through this gate. They were finishing when I was summoned to you. A conduit, like the one Bryce had drawn from in the spring. All of our second light, from every soul here, Connor said quietly. It's yours to put in that bullet. Use it well. Ethan's throat constricted. But if you, if you turn into second light, I'm already gone, Ethan, Connor said gently. And I can think of no better way to end my existence than by striking a blow for all our ancestors who've been trapped and consumed by the Asteri. He nodded to the bullet, the glowing gate illuminating his face. Look at the engraving. Memento mori. The letters gleamed in the gate's pale light. Jessica let out a quiet laugh. Got the idea from me, did you? Connor's mouth quirked up at a corner. Ethan nearly broke down at that half-smile. Gods, he'd missed it. Missed his big brother. But the dead gate glowed brighter. As if the time had come, as if it couldn't hold all those souls, the second light they'd become, much longer. Connor said to Ethan, You do make me proud, you know. Every day before now, and every day after. Nothing you do will ever change that. Something ruptured in Ethan's chest. Connor, tell Bryce. Connor said, eyes shining as he stepped toward the glowing gate, a wall of light now shimmering in the empty arch, to make the shot count. Connor stepped into the archway and faded into that wall of light. He was gone, and this time it was just as unbearable, as unfathomable to have had his brother here, to see him and speak to him and lose him again. The light began shrinking and contracting, pulsating, and Ethan could have sworn he heard the hissing of reapers rushing toward them in the distance. The light shivered and imploded, condensing into a tiny seed of pure light. 
It floated in the gate's archway, thrumming with such power that the hair on Ethan's arms rose. Put it in the bullet, Jessica ordered Ethan, who unscrewed its cap and gingerly approached the seed. All the souls of the people here, the dreams of the dead, their love for the living. Ethan gently slid the bullet around the seed of light and replaced the cap. He lifted the bullet between his thumb and forefinger, its point digging into his skin. As the light floated up through the bullet, Memento Mori was briefly illuminated, letter by letter. Then it faded, the dark metal stark in the gray light. What now? Ethan rasped, barely able to speak. Connor had been here, and now he was gone, forever. I have reapers to sort out, Hypaxia murmured, staring off into the distant mists, to where the hissing was growing louder. Ethan mastered the hole in his heart enough to ask, What about Sigrid? Hypaxia said carefully, What would you like me to do with her? Just... Uh, fuck, he had no idea. Tell her I want to talk to her, he clarified. I need to talk to her, but only once I'm back from the Eternal City. If he ever came back. Hypaxia nodded solemnly. If I encounter her, I will convey the message. The Reapers won't take the power shift well, Jessica warned Hypaxia. Then I appoint you my second in command and order you to help me, Hypaxia said flatly. Happy to oblige, Jessica said, examining her red painted nails. You can't kill them, Hypaxia warned the sorceress. Jessica gave the witch a wry smile and nodded to Ethan, who pulled himself from his grief long enough to meet her steely gaze. Get your ass to Pangera Prime and get that bullet to Bryce Quinlan. Therian didn't speak, barely breathed, until he and Sathia were back in the open air. It had taken a few hours to coordinate with his former colleagues about how they'd conduct the exodus from the city, how they'd get the message around without alerting anyone to the plan. Word was bound to leak at some point about the Blue Court harboring refugees, but hopefully... By then, they'd have a good number of people beneath, and then the Blue Court would go into lockdown, praying that the River Queen's power could hold out against the brimstone torpedoes of the Omega boat stocked in the river. It was risky, but it was a plan. Only when they ducked for cover in a shadowy alley did Therian say to Sathia, We did it. We fucking did it. She smiled, and it was beautiful. She was beautiful but a voice crooned from the shadows of the alley. Isn't this an interesting turn of events? It was all Therian could do to draw the knife at his side and step in front of Sathia as the Viper Queen emerged into the light, her drugged-out hulking fey assassins flanking her. I don't have any quarrel with you. Therian said to the Viper Queen, who was clad in one of her usual jumpsuits, ocean blue this time, with high-top sneakers and an amethyst suede with maroon laces. You burned my house down, the Viper Queen said, her snake's eyes glowing green, like a reaper's eyes. The fey assassins behind her shifted, as if they were an extension of her wrath. Colin? Sathia blurted, and Therian found her gaping at one of the fey males. Colin! I thought you... The Viper Queen glanced between the towering fey male and Sathia, and said to the latter, Who the fuck are you? Sathia Flynn, daughter of Padraig, Lord Hawthorne. Sathia's chin rose, pure disdain in every word. I know who you are, so don't bother to introduce yourself but I want to know why my friend is in your employ. It was a different face from the one of courtly grace she'd poured on for the River Queen. This one was imperious and icy and a little bit terrifying. The Viper Queen snorted. Sathia bared her teeth. Colin, get away from this trash and come home. The towering fey male stared blankly ahead, 
as he had this whole time, like he didn't hear her. Colin, Sathia said, voice sharpening with something like panic. McCarthy won't respond, unless I give him the order. The Viper Queen drawled, walking to the mail and running her manicured hands over his broad chest. Her metallic gold nails glinted against the black leather of his jacket. But let me guess. Childhood friend, handsome poor fay guard, spoiled little rich girl. Her purple painted lips curved in a smile, and she patted the male's cheek, purring to him. Is that why you came crawling to me? Would her daddy not let you court her? Therian's heart stalled at the pain that washed over Sathia's face as she breathed, more to herself than to anyone. Father said you had found a new position in Corinth. Padraig Flynn has always been an excellent liar, the Viper Queen said, and a better client. He introduced me to McCarthy, of course. She gestured to the blank-faced assassin, Sathia paled. Come home, Colin, her voice broke. Please. Therian had no idea how anyone, the drugged-out male included, could resist the pleading in that voice, her face. It's too late for that, the Viper Queen said and nodded to Therian. But you and I have unfinished business, Mayor. Leave him alone, Sathia snapped, teeth flashing as she stepped closer to Therian. Don't you dare touch him. Therian's fingers slid toward hers, squeezing once in warning to be quiet. And what authority do you have, girl, to order me away from him? I'm his wife, Sathia spat. The Viper Queen burst out laughing, and Therian could have sworn that something like pain showed in McCarthy's bright blue eyes. Just a glimmer. You leave him alone, Sathia said again, and vines curled at her fingers. Him and Colin. That's not an option I'm interested in, girl, the Viper Queen said, and inclined her head to one side. The assassins, Colin included, aimed their guns. Did he imagine it, or was McCarthy's weapon trembling slightly? Therian sheathed his knife and held up his hands, again stepping in front of Sathia. Your business is with me. He'd accomplished what he needed to with the River Queen, and if Sathia became a widow, she could remarry by fey law. Maybe even find some way to save that poor bastard McCarthy and marry him. So Therian said, let her walk out of here before you put a bullet in my head. Oh, I'm not going to kill you that quickly, the Viper Queen said. Not a chance, Kedos. She advanced a step, her assassins flowing with her. You take one more step toward my friend, said a familiar female voice, and you die. Therian's knees wobbled as he glanced over a shoulder and found Hypaxia Enidor striding in from the quay, Ethan Holstrom bristling with menace at her side. Chapter 84 I don't take orders from former witch queens, the Viper Queen said. Her guards didn't back down an inch, but Colin McCarthy's gun was definitely trembling, like he was fighting the order with everything he had. What about from the head of the House of Flame and Shadow? Hypaxia countered. Therian's knees gave out abruptly at the greenish light that flared in her eyes. Sathia caught him around the waist, grunting as she held him up. Therian whispered, Pax. But his friend... This female who had been his friend from the moment they'd met each other at the summit, who always seemed to see the real male beneath his veneer of charm, only glowered at the Viper Queen. You touch him, or his friend, and you bring down the wrath of flame and shadow upon you. 
Holstrom stepped up to her side, brimming with power, with magic, cold and foreign, and added, And the wrath of all Valbarin wolves. There was only one person who could claim that. The male before him was prime. There was no doubt about it. But that strange power rippling from him? What the hell was that? The Viper Queen stared long and hard at Ethan, then at Hypaxia. Power shift, she murmured, pulling a cigarette from her jumpsuit pocket and putting it in her mouth. Interesting. The cigarette bobbed with the word, and she lit it, taking a long drag. She fixed her snake's eyes on Therian. Your bounty still stands. Drop the bounty, Ethan ordered, pure alpha echoing in his voice. I won't forgive or forget what Kedos did to me and mine. But he'll walk out of here today. I'll allow that much. Hypaxia gave her a look dripping with disdain. You will walk out of here today. We will allow that much. The Viper Queen took another long drag of her cigarette and blew the air toward Hypaxia. Give a witch a scrap of true power, and it goes right to her pretty little head. Fuck you, Ethan snarled. But the Viper Queen stepped back into the alley, whistling sharply to her assassins before striding away. They turned as one and marched after her. Colin McCarthy didn't so much as look back. What the fuck? Therian exploded at Ethan, at Hypaxia, the prime of the Valbaran wolves and the head of the House of Flame and Shadow. What happened? What happened to you? Ethan countered. Where are the others? Is Bryce here? Bryce? No, she's in Nenya. She... Now wasn't the time for a catch-up. But Ethan said, Nenya? He dragged his hands through his hair. Fuck. Why? Therian asked. Hypaxia said gravely, We need to get to Bryce. Immediately. Okay, Therian said. I'll see if I can reach her or Athalar. Hypaxia and Ethan began walking, and Therian followed, Sathia a few feet behind. When the door to the House of Flame and Shadow loomed before them, Hypaxia lifted a hand and it swung open silently, hers to command. Ethan walked right in, but Therian at last mastered his shock enough to ask Hypaxia, How did you wind up? It's a long story, she said, tucking a dark curl behind her ear. But get inside first. It's the only safe place in this city. Therian glanced back at Sathia, who was pale-faced at the open door before them. Give me a minute, he said, and Hypaxia nodded and walked into the gloom. Hypaxia is a friend, Therian explained softly to Sathia. No harm will come to you in there. Sathia lifted her gaze, bleak and despairing, to his face, like she'd seen a ghost. And maybe she had. It was my ordeal. Her lips were so, so white. I only realized it afterward, she murmured. After Colin left. Losing him was my ordeal. Therian laid a gentle hand on her back, surprised by the strange tightness in his gut, and eased her toward the doorway. I'm sorry, he said and led his wife into the gloom. It was all he could offer her. The reception in Nenya is shit. There's some weird interference happening right now, Therian announced. They stood in Jessica Roga's office, of all places. But from the few words I managed to make out, they're heading for the Eternal City immediately. Good, Holstrom said, pacing in front of Roga's desk. That's what Jessica told me earlier. But where do we rendezvous? That's the tough part, Therian admitted, sliding into one of the chairs. Sathia sat quietly in the other one, lost in thought. The reception cut off before we could get to that. I tried calling him back, and Quinlan, and her parents, but nothing. Maybe they got the rift open, Hypaxia mused. 
Magic pouring into Midgard from hell could be disrupting the connection. Demons cause power outages sometimes with their presence. Imagine what a lot of them all at once might do. It's possible, but doesn't change the issue at hand, Holstrom said. The wolf had changed. Somehow, in the span of a day, he'd gone from lost to focused, from lone wolf to prime. Therian had gotten a vague story out of him about facing Sabine, and Hypaxia taking on the Underking to become head of the House of Flame and Shadow. But even beyond that, they seemed like they'd leveled up, majorly. Especially Ethan. Even the most powerful of wolves only had shifting abilities and super strength, not actual magic. And yet Holstrom suddenly had the ability to wield ice— like the power had been locked in his bloodline all this time. But Therian put aside the thought, as Holstrom added, we need to figure out how to link up with them. I'm sure if the rift is open, we'll see them coming a mile off, Therian said. We need to find Hunt and Bryce before they enter into any kind of confrontation with the Asteri, Ethan insisted. He picked up a vial of clear liquid from the desk, Hypaxia found a cure for the Asteri's parasite. We need to distribute it to everyone we can. Therian blinked in shock. Sathia stopped her brooding to listen. Then Ethan pulled out a long, dark bullet from his pocket. And we need to get this to Bryce as soon as possible. What is that? Therian asked, as a strange, ancient sort of power thrummed from the black bullet. Ethan's face was grim. A gift from the dead. Chapter 85 Well, friends, Bryce said to Hunt, to Declan and Flynn, to Rune and Lydia. They had all gathered in a nondescript white van, one of a fleet Ophian had kept stashed throughout Pangera should an agent on the run ever need an escape vehicle, on the edge of the Eternal City, and though Lydia was frantic with urgency to rescue her sons, this step was necessary. Ready to change the world? Jessica had just sent over the footage of Micah's demise. Let's burn this fucker down, Flynn said, and Deck nodded, typing away on his laptop. We're recording in thirty seconds, Deck warned Bryce, and she looked to where Hunt sat next to her, so quiet, so thoughtful. Terrified, she realized. He glanced up, bleak fear in his eyes as he said hoarsely, The last time I took a stand like this, with the fallen, it cost me everything. He swallowed hard, but he kept his gaze on her. She could have sworn lightning sparked along his wings. But this time, I have Bryce Adelaide Quinlan at my side. She took his hand in hers, squeezing tightly, I've got you, sweetheart, she whispered to him, and his eyes flickered in recognition. He'd said the same thing to her once, that day she'd had the Cristalos venom removed from her leg. He squeezed her hand back. Let's light it up. Declan signaled, and the red light on his laptop camera turned on. Bryce stared into the camera's lens and said, I am Bryce Quinlan, heir to the Starborn Fae. Queen of the Fae in Avalon and Valbara, but most importantly, the half-human daughter of Ember Quinlan and Randall Salago. Hunt barely seemed to be breathing, as Bryce said. This is my mate and husband, Hunt Athalar, and we're here to show you. It hit her right then, a wave of nerves. Hunt sensed it and picked up her thread without missing a beat. We're here to show you that the Republic is not as all-powerful as you've been led to believe. He lifted his chin. Centuries ago, I led a legion, the Fallen, against the Archangels, against the Asteri. You know how it ended. That day on Mount Hermon, only one other group of Vanir came to our aid, the Sprites. We all suffered for it, and those of us who survived are still punished to this day. His throat worked, and Bryce had never loved him more as he continued. But today, we're here to tell you that it's worth it, fighting back. 
that it's possible to defy them and live, that their hierarchies, their rules, it's all bullshit, and it's time to put a stop to it. Bryce might have smiled had she not finally found the right words. What happened in Asphodel Meadows was an atrocity. What happened to those innocent families? She bared her teeth. It must never be allowed to happen again. We, the people of Midgard, can never allow it to happen again. She looked the camera dead in its dark eye, looked at the world beyond. The Asteri lie to you, all of you, every second of every single day. For the past 15,000 years, they've lied to us, enslaved us, and we haven't even known the half of it. They use a parasite in the water to control and harvest our magic under the guise of the drop. Because they need that magic. They need us, our power. Without the power from the people of Midgard, the Asteri are nothing. She squared her shoulders. Hunt's pride was a warmth that practically seeped into her side. But he let her keep talking, let her take the lead as she said, the Asteri don't want you to know this. They have schemed and murdered to keep their secrets. Danica's face, the faces of the pack of devils, flashed before her eyes. It was for them that she spoke, for Lahaba, for all those in the meadows. We've been told we're too weak, and they're too powerful for us to fight back. But that's just another lie. Bryce continued, so we're here to show you that it can be done. I fought back, and I killed an archangel, who the Asteri used like a puppet to murder Danica Fendir and the pack of devils. I fought back, and I won. I have the footage to prove it. And with a flick of a switch from Declan, the video played. Bryce peered around the small, bare-bones room in the safe house, near the northernmost section of wall around the Eternal City. Lydia certain this is secure? Hunt, wings tucked in tight in the cramped space, nodded to the sliver of a bed. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure all the five-star hotels would report our asses to the Asteria anyway. That's not what I meant, Bryce grumbled, plopping onto the creaky, lumpy bed, more of a cot, really. I mean, all of Ophian's dead. She choked on the word. Who's to say this place hasn't been compromised? Lydia's not exactly in a calm state of mind. She might not be thinking clearly. Deck and Flynn are on guard, Hunt said, sitting down beside her with a groan. I think we're good to rest tonight. Bryce scrubbed at her face. I'm not sure I can sleep, knowing that video's going out soon. And soon after that, Hell would begin its journey to the Eternal City. She could only pray the army's presence would remain unnoticed until the right moment. She'd taken steps to ensure that. Hunt waggled his eyebrows at her. Want to do something other than sleeping? Despite all that weighed on her, despite what awaited them the next day, Bryce smirked. Oh? She half reclined, leaning back on her elbows. The bed let out a wailing creak. Oof, Bryce said, wincing. If anyone has any doubt that we're about to fuck each other's brains out, this bed will clue them right in. Hunt's mouth kicked up at a corner, but his eyes had darkened, going right to her mouth. I'm down for some noisy sex. He braced a hand on one side of her, bringing his lips within grazing distance of her own. Might be our last night on. She put a hand over his mouth. Don't. Her throat closed up. Don't say that. He pulled back, his own gaze unbearably tender. We're going to survive, Quinlan. All of us. I promise. She leaned forward, brushing her mouth against his. I don't want to think about tomorrow right now. It was his turn to say, Oh. She traced her tongue over the seam of his lips, and he opened for her. She swept her tongue in, tasting the essence that was Hunt, her mate and husband. I want to think about you, she said, pulling back, 
grazing a hand over his pecs, his rock-hard stomach. About you on top of me. He shuddered, head bowing. She kissed the place where his halo had been, where he'd freed himself from its grasp. Her hand trailed lower, to his black jeans and the hardness already pushing against them. I want to think about this, she said, palming him. Inside of me. Fuck, he breathed, and pivoted them, laying her out flat beneath him. I love you. She lifted her hand to cup his face, drawing his gaze to her own. I love you more than anything in this world, or any other. He closed his eyes, pressing a kiss to her temple. I thought you said no goodbyes. It's not a goodbye. She ran her hands down the groove of his spine, his wings like velvet against her fingertips. It's the truth. His mouth found her neck, and his teeth grazed over her pulse. You're my best friend, you know that? He pulled away, staring down at her, and she couldn't stop her star from flaring with light. I mean, you're my mate and wife. Fuck, that still sounds weird. But you're my best friend, too. I never thought I'd have one of those. She ran her fingers over his strong jaw, his cheeks. After Danica, I didn't think. Her eyes prickled, and she reached up to kiss him again. You're my best friend too, Hunt. You saved me, literally, I guess. But also, she tapped her heart, the glowing star, another reference to this past spring, to all that had grown between them, the words spoken during what she'd thought had been her final phone call. In here. He scanned her eyes, and there was so much love in her that she couldn't stand it, so much love that it washed over any fear and dread of what tonight and tomorrow would bring. For the moment, it was just them, Bryce and Hunt, for the moment, it was only their souls, their bodies, and nothing else mattered. Just Hunt, and just Bryce. So she kissed him again, and there was no more talking after that. Hunt met her tongue stroke for stroke, and the weight of his body on hers was joy and comfort and home. Home. He was home. Her ability to teleport to him had only proved that— Home wasn't a place or a thing, but him. Wherever Hunt was, that was where home was. She'd find him across galaxies if need be. He tugged off her long-sleeved shirt, gently, lovingly. Bryce practically ripped his black shirt off his shoulders. Hunt chuckled, rising up to unbuckle his belt, then unzipping his pants. So impatient. She rubbed her thighs together desperate for any friction, especially as his impressive length sprang free, and... Commando? Bryce said, choking. Hunt smirked. All the underwear they gave me on the depth charger was too small for this. He palmed himself, pumping, and she groaned at the sight of the small bead of moisture at the tip of his cock. Now let's see what underwear you're wearing, Quinlan, he said eyes dark with lust, and tugged down her leggings. She lifted her hips off the bed, coils screeching, and Hunt laughed at the sound. But his laugh died in his throat as he beheld the cherry red thong. This is what they gave you on the depth charger? Not the depth charger, she grinned as he peeled off her leggings, exposing the tiny red lace thong. I grabbed these from Morvan's castle. The guest rooms had whole unopened packs of them. Hunt's booming laugh set her star glowing, and the breath whooshed out of her as he gripped her knees in either hand and spread her legs wide. If that asshole wasn't dead, I'd send him a thank you note. Hunt pressed his mouth to the front of her underwear and huffed a hot breath. Damn, Quinlan, he said against her, and she buried a hand in his silken hair. He slipped a finger around the front of her underwear, toying with her entrance. God's damn. She clawed at her underwear, beyond words. Hunt obliged her by removing the thong with cruel, brutal slowness. 
She growled, but he dangled the underwear on one finger before setting it aside. I wouldn't want to damage this precious thing. I'm going to damage you if you don't get in me right now, she managed to say, opening her legs wider. She nearly climaxed at the raw need, the ravenous hunger on Hunt's face, especially as he slowly, slowly lifted his gaze to hers, filled with pure lightning. Hunt, she begged, and he lunged for her. He gripped her hips, lifting her off the mattress, angling her precisely how he wanted as he slid into her in a long, smooth glide. Bryce moaned at the size of him, filling every part of her, and she dug her fingers into the hard muscles of his ass, pinning him there for a moment, luxuriating in the stretch of herself around him, the weight of his body against hers. How? He panted against her hair. How the fuck can it feel this good every time? Her fingers clenched harder, urging him to move. He withdrew almost to the tip and plunged back in, hard enough that another moan slipped out of her. You like that? He angled her hips again, his to play with. You like my cock this deep in you? She couldn't manage anything more than a nod. He rewarded her with another long stroke that had her seeing stars. Those were... Those were actual stars dancing around them, filling the room. Quinlan, he breathed, eyes wide at the stars floating by. But she needed more friction, more pleasure. She palmed her breast, squeezing, rolling her hard nipple between her fingers. Fuck, he exploded, and thrust into her again, so deep and strong that it pushed them up the bed. Another stroke, and then his lightning was sparking over his shoulders, across his wings, a band of it over his brow like a crown. She lifted a glowing hand, and his lightning twined over her fingers, zapping her delicately. He withdrew, and her moan of protest turned into one of pure pleasure, as he flipped her onto her front and plunged into her again, the fit of his cock so tight in her that she could barely stand it. Starlight poured out of her, and his lightning skittered over her spine, ecstasy in its wake. Hunt, she cried, release hovering just over the horizon. His fingers dug into her hips. Come for me, Bryce. Release crashed into her, out of her, her starlight flaring, and the room was blindingly bright. Hunt pounded into her in sure, steady strokes, and his lightning was between her thighs. His lightning was in her very blood, and all that she was and he was blended into such light, such power. His hoarse shout was the only warning before he spilled into her, and it sent her climaxing again knowing how deeply he was seated in her, marking her. His fingers slid to her clit, stroking her through the throes, amplifying it. She reared up against him, pressing back into his chest as his fingers circled and swirled, and nothing had ever felt so perfect as wave after wave of pleasure washed over and out of her. And then the world stilled, the light fading, and they were kneeling on the bed, Bryce leaning fully back against Hunt, one of his hands resting between her legs, the other looped around her middle. He pressed kiss after kiss to the space between her neck and shoulder. Bryce, he murmured against her skin, his chest heaving into her spine. Bryce. She slid a hand over his, holding him between her legs, as if she could freeze this moment, stop the next sunrise from coming. He shuddered, kissing her again. I can... fuck. I can feel you. Like, in me. She twisted enough to peer up at his stunned, devastated face. It's like that part of you that's... made, or whatever you called it. He breathed. It's in me. Like this piece of you is nestled there. Good, she said, kissing his jaw. Inside her, his lightning lingered, fueling her up like a small sun. No matter what happens tomorrow, she said, breathing hard, I'll have this piece of you with me, 
strengthening me. She could almost summon it, that lightning. It flowed under her skin, so full of possibility that she had no idea how she'd sleep. Hunt tugged her back against him, holding her tight as he brought them both down onto the creaky bed. Sleep, Quinlan, he whispered into her hair. I'm with you no matter what. Chapter 86 Ethan left Therian recovering from the dose of the antidote the mare had taken. His reaction had been strong enough that the pipes in the House of Flame and Shadow had burst from the surge in his water magic. Hypaxia had her hands full, keeping her house in order. So Ethan had come to the den, which was now his. Well, it would never be his, since it belonged to all the wolves who called it home. But it was his responsibility. He found Perry in the guard booth again, doodling in a notebook. He rapped on the glass, drawing her attention, and at her wide eyes he gave her a half-smile. Hard at work, or hardly working, he teased. But she jumped to her feet, flinging open the door. Sorry, I was just... Pear, it's me, he said, alarmed. She straightened, standing at attention, as Sabine had liked. For fuck's sake, he'd deal with that later. For now... He sniffed, trying to read the subtle change in her scent. It remained that strawberries and cinnamon blend he'd known his whole life, but with the antidote, he couldn't put a finger on it. It had been so strong right in those moments after she'd taken the antidote, yet now it had dimmed. There wasn't time to ponder it, to wonder why an Omega once again stood before him. Ethan peered through the open gates of the den, where is everyone? Perry shifted on her feet. They, uh, they left. Ethan slowly blinked. What do you mean they left? Had the River Queen started her evacuation already? He'd come here to inform everyone that it might be best to lie low in the Blue Court for a few weeks. But maybe she had already gotten a message to them. What happened shook them, Perry said. They're loyal to you, Ethan. But they're worried. They all headed out of town. Said they wanted to wait until after the New Year to see how things, um, turned out. In a few months. Ethan weighed the fear in her eyes. Not for him, but... And where's your sister? He asked quietly. The wolf in him began bristling, snarling for the opponent he knew was coming. Amelie led them out, Perry said throat bobbing. I think she wanted to make sure everyone got to where they're going. But her eyes dropped to the pavement. Sure, Ethan said. Perry shifted on her feet. Why didn't you go? Someone had to stay to tell you, she mumbled, a blush creeping over her cheeks. I have a hard time believing your sister made you stay. She wanted me to go, but I couldn't abandon the den. They moved the Prime into the lobby. I think some wanted to stay for the sailing, but the spooked ones wanted to leave. It didn't feel right to abandon his body there. Alone. Tears gleamed in her emerald eyes, genuine grief for the old wolf. Any aggression rising in Ethan stalled out at the pain, the loyalty in her face. He squeezed her shoulder. Thanks for staying, Pear. She followed him into the den, hitting an interior button to shut the gates behind them. Ethan paused in the grassy meadow, watching the trees of the park bend in the cool breeze. The blood had been cleaned away from the building's entrance. The bodies of Sabine and the astronomer. I dumped them in the sewer, Perry said with quiet rage, reading Ethan's glance toward where the corpses had been. They don't deserve a sailing especially Sabine. Surprise sparked in him at the normally peaceful wolf's act of defiance, but he nodded. Rotting in the shit of the city seems like a good place for Sabine to wind up, he said, and Perry huffed a laugh. It wasn't real amusement. They were both far beyond that. Where did you go? Perry asked, tentatively enough that he knew she was still feeling him out, 
as a friend, and as her alpha and prime, learning how much she could push. It's a long story, he said, but I came back here to get everyone to safety, he explained about the River Queen and the Blue Court. But now, he finished, I have to head to the Eternal City. Perry studied him, clearly understanding more than he'd said. So, we're going up against the Asteri. We aren't doing anything, he said. I'm going up against them. But you're prime, she insisted. You speak for all Valbaran wolves. Your choices are our choices. If you stand against the Asteri, we stand against the Asteri. Then disavow me, he said. But I'm going. That's not what I'm saying, she said. I don't disagree with you. Things have to change, and change for the better. But the wolves are scattered at the moment, at vacation homes, on trips, too far to reach the Blue Court before you go off to the Eternal City. So? So get the word out to them before you go. Give them a few hours to find shelter, either by getting to the Blue Court or by finding somewhere in the wilds to lie low. The second the Asteri see you, the Prime, standing against them in any capacity, they'll go after the wolves to punish you. And after what happened at the meadows? Her eyes flooded with pain. I don't think there's any atrocity they wouldn't commit. Ethan opened his mouth to object. He had to get that bullet and antidote to Bryce now. It might even be too late already. But he couldn't live with one more wolf death on his conscience. And if a single pup were harmed because he hadn't given them time to hide? Three hours, Ethan agreed. You know how to send encrypted messages? Perry nodded. Then start getting the word out. He looked to the building lobby beyond the pillars and the stairs up to it. And I'll start digging a grave. A grave? Perry protested. But the sailing... There are no more sailings, Ethan said quietly. The Underking is dead. He was met with stunned silence. Then Perry said, But the Bone Quarter... Is a lie. All of it. Ethan gestured to the phone already in her hand. Get the word out, then we'll talk. I'll tell you everything I know. Perry held his stare her own full of worry and shock and determination. Then she began typing into her phone. I'm glad, Ethan, she said quietly, that you're prime. That makes one of us, he almost said, but just nodded his thanks. Therian shoved the last gun into a rucksack and turned to where Hypaxia was nesting vials of the antidote into a satchel. How many do you have? he asked. Water whispered in his ears, his heart, his veins, a steady flow of magic, as if a raging river coursed through him, half a thought, and it'd be unleashed. Two dozen, give or take a few, she said quietly. Not enough. You're going to need entire factories dedicated to getting it out there, Therian said. She handed him the bag. Here, don't jostle it too much on the trip. Athanar's lightning holds them together. A little agitation can destabilize the doses to the point where they won't work. He angled his head. You're not coming? He planned to make his way to the Asteri's palace itself, the most likely place for a confrontation between Bryce and the Asteri. Gods, the very notion of it was insane, suicidal. But for his friends, for Midgard, he'd go, antidote in tow. Hypaxia's eyes gleamed with that greenish light. No, I'm staying here. Therian weighed the heaviness in that one word and took a seat on the edge of Roga's desk. The sorceress was off handling some squabble between vampires and city medwitches over the vampire's raid of a blood bank, apparently. Why? Someone has to deal with all the broken pipes in this house, Hypaxia teased. Therian blushed slightly. His eruption after ingesting the antidote would take a long while to live down. But there had been so much power. All of a sudden, he'd been overflowing with water, and it was music and rage and destruction and life. 
But he said, Come on, Pax, tell me why. Her gaze lowered to her hands. Because if all goes poorly over there, someone needs to remain here, to help Lunathian. If it goes poorly over there, everyone is fucked anyway, he said. You being here, I'm sorry to say, won't make much of a difference. I want to keep making the antidote, she added. We need a better way to stabilize it. I want to start on it now. He looked at his friend, really looked at her. You okay? Her eyes, so changed since taking Flame and Shadow's throne for herself, dipped to the floor. No. Pax. But I have no choice, she said, and squared her shoulders. She nodded to the doors. You should get your wife and go. Is that a note of disapproval I detect? Hypaxia smiled gently. No. Well, I disapprove of much of what led you to marry her, but not the marriage itself. Yeah, yeah, get in line to lecture me. I think Sathia might be good for you, Therian. Oh? Her smile turned secretive. Yes. Therian gave her a smile of his own. Knock him dead, Pax. Hopefully not literally, Hypaxia said with a wink. Grinning despite himself, Therian exited Roga's office. He'd left Sathia in a small guest room to wash up and rest, though they both knew that no amount of rest would prepare her for the insanity they were about to face. He'd offered to send her down to the Blue Court, but she'd refused, and dropping her off in a valin would have taken them too far out of their way, so she'd be coming with him. Therian knocked on the door to the guest room and didn't wait for her to reply before he opened it. The room was empty. There was only a note on the bed, laced with her lingering scent. Therian read it once, then a second time before it really set in. I can't leave Colin in her hands. I hope you understand. Good luck, and thank you for all you've done for me. Sathia had left him. That's what the thank you at the end was. It was fitting. He'd done worse to the River Queen's daughter. And yet... Therian carefully laid the note back on the bed. He didn't blame her. It was her choice to go save her ex-boyfriend from being a drugged-out assassin, and a noble choice at that. No, he didn't blame her at all. It was better she didn't come with him to the Eternal City, in any case. She'd be safer that way. Still, Therian looked at the note on the bed for a long, long moment. And though he knew he was heading off to challenge the Asteri, likely to die in the attempt, as Therian left the House of Flame and Shadow, then Lunathian itself, he couldn't stop thinking about her. The video Hunt and Bryce had recorded was due to go out at any moment. Rune was so fucking proud of his sister, she knew how to make the most of a bad hand. That moment came soon after midnight, with a stroke of a key from Declan. And now, sitting on the floor of the windowless bedroom in the safe house Lydia had procured for them, Rune peered over at where she sat beside him and said, Just a few hours until dawn, then we'll make our move. Lydia stared at nothing, knee bobbing nervously. She'd spoken little since they'd gotten the news of her son's abduction. And though Rune had been aching to touch her in the quiet moments, he'd kept his hands to himself. She had other things on her mind. I never should have gone back onto the depth charger, Lydia said at last. If Pollux was able to learn about your kids, Rune objected, he would have found out whether you were on the ship or off it. You should have let me die in the Haldron Sea, she said. Then he'd have had no reason to go after them. Hey, Rune grabbed her hand, squeezing tight. She dragged her gaze over to him. None of this is your fault. She shook her head, and Rune gently touched her face. You are allowed to feel whatever you need to right now. But come dawn, when we walk out of here, you'll have to bury it and become the Hind again, one last time. Without the Hind, we're not going to get into that palace. 
She scanned his gaze and leaned forward, her brow pressing against his. Rune breathed in her scent, taking it deep into his body, but he found it already marking him. It had been there, hidden in him, since that first time. Can I? She swallowed hard. Can we? Tell me what you want, he said, kissing her cheek. She pulled back and slid a hand against his jaw. You. I want you. You sure? She had so much burdening her, with her sons in the Asteri's hands. He didn't blame her if... I need to not think for a while, she said, then added, and... I need to touch you. She traced her fingers over his lips. Your real body. He closed his eyes against her touch. Tell me what you want, Lydia. Her lips grazed his, and he shuddered. I want you, all of you, in me. A grin spread across Rune's face. Happy to oblige. He followed her lead, letting her set the pace. Each kiss he answered with his own. Let her show him where she wanted him to touch, to lick, to savor. Thankfully, the parts where she wanted him to really focus were the ones Rune had been especially interested in. The taste of her sweetness on his tongue had him nearly coming in his pants, and that was before her breathy moans filled his ears like the most beautiful music he'd ever heard. Rune, she said, but didn't give him the order to halt, so he kept working her in long strokes of his tongue, wishing to the gods he still had his lip piercing— knowing he could have driven her to distraction with it. But there would be time later. She arched off the bed, and her orgasm sent him writhing, desperate for any sensation against his cock. She put him out of his misery a moment later, her eyes nearly pure flame as she unzipped him, and her slender hand wrapped around him. He bucked against her first stroke, and was about to start begging when she pushed him back onto the bed when she climbed over him, straddling him, and that hand around his cock guided him to her entrance. Rune slid his hands into Lydia's golden hair, the silken strands spilling through his fingers, and held her gaze as she sank down onto him. He gritted his teeth at the warmth and tightness of her, panting through the rush of pleasure, the sense of perfection, the flawless fit. She settled against him, seated fully, and her chest rose and fell so rapidly that Rune grabbed her hands, pressing kisses to her fingertips. Her eyes fluttered shut, and then her hips moved, and there was nothing more to say, to do, as she rode him. He lifted his hips, and her moans heightened. He wished he could devour the sound. He made do by rising up, kissing her thoroughly, her legs wrapping around his middle, it plunged him impossibly deeper, and he lost it, went positively feral at being so far inside her, at the smell and taste of her. Lydia met him stroke for stroke, met his savagery with her own, teeth grazing his neck, his chest. Every thrust had him rubbing an inner wall, and fuck, he was going to die from this pleasure. Then her head tipped back, and her delicate muscles tightened around him as she came, sending him spiraling after her. He pounded into her through it, that feral part of him relishing spilling into her. And she was his, and he was hers, and there was a word for it, but it eluded him. She stilled, and Rune took her weight as she leaned against him, their bodies now a tangle of arms and legs, his cock still buried to the hilt. Her every breath pushed against him, and he stroked his fingers down the column of her spine, over and over. She was here. He was here. For as long as Erd would allow them to be. Lydia lay in Rune's arms as the hours passed, sleep eluding her. It had been everything she'd wanted, needed, this joining with him. She'd never felt so safe, so cherished, and yet her sons remained in the Asteri's hands, in Pollux's hands. The hours dripped by. Lydia shut down the part of her that catalogued every possible torment that might be inflicted on Bran and Acteon, 
the torments that she herself had inflicted on so many others. Maybe this was her punishment for that, her punishment for so many things. Rune stirred, and Lydia nestled closer to him, breathing in his scent, savoring the strength of his body around hers, and tried not to think about tomorrow. Chapter 87 Hiding out in the unmarked van parked in a dusty alley of the Eternal City the next morning, Rune peered over at where Lydia sat stone-faced against the metal siding and slid closer. She'd barely slept, and Rune didn't blame her. A glimpse at her haggard face this morning, as they'd crept out of the safe house and back into the van, had kept him close to her, offering what comfort he could. Now he laid a hand on her knee and said, Another hour or so, then we'll head into the palace. Another hour until Declan could confirm that the Asteri were well and truly distracted by the video they'd unleashed into the world. From Deck's initial reports this morning, it was a giant clusterfuck. The footage had been blasted on every news channel and social media site. Deck had also confirmed that he'd hacked into the Imperial Network and learned that this morning, the Asteri and their advisors would all be meeting to discuss the fallout. The news about the parasite had really resonated. All media outlets were abuzz with chatter about it. And the footage of Bryce killing Micah? Her claims about how Danica and the pack had died? It didn't matter that the Imperial Network had pulled the footage almost immediately— it was already out there, circulating on private servers, being downloaded onto phones, being watched and analyzed over and over again. Imperial trolls tried to insist it was fake, planting comments that it was a manipulated video. But Deck made sure that footage of Bryce running through the streets of Lunathian this spring, saving the whole city, made it out too. And there were people out there who remembered that, who had seen her running to save them. They vouched for her, confirming not only that she had saved the city from hell, but also from the brimstone missiles the Asteri had launched. The Asteri had a lot on their hands that morning, exactly as planned. And once their emergency meeting had begun, it would be time to make a move. A single misstep, and my sons, Lydia began, swallowing hard. Set the fear aside, Rune said, offering her the honesty she'd so often given him. Focus on the task, not the what-ifs. He's right, Bryce added, from where she and Athalar sat nearby, leaning against each other. Flynn and Deck sat in the front, the former monitoring the streets, the latter with a laptop on his knees, hacking his way into the Imperial military controls for the mech suits. Another few hours, and they'd be in. Leave the baggage behind today. Lydia straightened. My sons are not baggage. No, Bryce amended, they're not. But you know that palace better than anyone. Any distractions are going to cost us. I know Pollux better than anyone, Lydia said, staring ahead at nothing. And that's why it's unbearable to sit here. Rest up while you can, Lydia, Athalar advised. All hell is going to break loose pretty damn soon. Literally, Bryce said with unnerving cheer. Ethan buried the prime in the heart of the meadow, so his soul might feel the romping joy of pups for generations to come, if any of them survived this. Therian had called him, asking where the fuck he was, and Ethan told the mayor to head to the Eternal City without him, to try to find Bryce and Athalar and get the antidote to them or any of their friends before they went full tilt at the Asteri. If the antidote had leveled him up, then he couldn't even imagine what it would do to Bryce and Athalar. Ethan shouldered his backpack and the Godslayer rifle that Roga had loaned and left the main building of the den, Perry was again standing guard at the booth outside the gates. Did you get any rest? Ethan asked, poking his head in. From the bruises under her eyes, he knew the answer before she nodded. I told you to get some sleep. I wanted to be here, she said, in case anyone came looking for help or had questions. His chest tightened at her thoughtfulness, 
her kindness. And did anyone? No, she said, rubbing her eyes. You should get down to the blue court. Her gaze found his. You're leaving? Yeah, he said. He hadn't slept much either, but he'd forced his body to rest. He knew he had to be at full strength for what was to come. Perry's phone buzzed, and she glanced at the screen. Her brows knitted. What is it? She opened up her phone and read aloud. Bryce Quinlan and Hunt Athalar killed the Archangels Micah and Sandriel this spring. There's... there's video footage of Bryce. Ethan's heart began racing. He was too late. Bryce was already making her move. I need to go, he said. I have to help her however I can. Perry rose from her seat in the booth. Good luck, Ethan. I... I really hope I see you again. He wrapped his arms around her in a tight hug, her cinnamon and strawberry scent washing over him, just as it always had, like she hadn't taken the antidote. He set aside his curiosity about it again. I hope I see you again, too, he said against her hair, and pulled back. Her eyes shone with tears. Please be careful. He adjusted the straps on his backpack. Get to the blue court, Perry. I'm in the Imperial Network, Declan announced a couple hours later. Hunt finished arming himself with the few weapons he'd taken from what Fury Axtar had managed to bring in that helicopter. Two handguns and a long knife. It wasn't much, but Axtar had chosen the weapons well. They were all solid, reliable pieces. Those mech suits are no fucking joke, Deck shuddered. But I'm ready to go when you guys are. Hunt checked the gun holstered at his thigh. The clip was loaded. Reloads sat in his back pocket. He could have used the comfort of his umbra mortis suit, with its twin swords nestled in the sheaths down its back. But two handguns, a knife in his boot, and his lightning would have to do. He would have to do. Just Hunt. He could live with that. He ran an eye over Bryce. The hilt of the star sword rose above her ponytail, and Truth Teller had been strapped on one thigh. She had a handgun on the other, only one clip for a reload. Hell had brought its armies, but they fought with power and fangs and teeth and brute strength. Right, Bryce said. We all clear on the plan? Which one? Rune muttered. You have, like, seven. Better to over-prepare, Bryce trilled. Plan simple. Keep the Asteri distracted by unleashing Hell and the Fallen, while Athalar and I sneak into the palace and destroy that First Light core. Don't forget, Hunt cut in Riley. Rescue Lydia's sons, destroy Pollux, get close enough to the Asteri to eliminate them from the planet. He ticked off the items on his fingers. Yeah, yeah, Bryce said, waving a hand. She winked at Lydia, flashing a grin that Hunt knew was designed to put the hind at ease. You ready to beat the shit out of these assholes? Lydia's chin lifted. She had a knife at her side and a handgun. That was it. It was laughable that they were heading into the fucking Asteri's palace armed so lightly, but it didn't bear dwelling upon. They didn't have a choice. The moment we leave this truck... We have two minutes until the street cameras alert the Asteri's techs that we're in the city, if they identify us, Lydia said. Which is why it's my job, Declan said from his station in the back of the van, to keep those cameras away from you guys. And my job, Flynn said from the driver's seat, to keep us moving around the city to avoid detection. As soon as I message you, Rune said, be ready for a pickup. We did this once before, remember? Flynn said to Rune. Meeting up with Lydia once she'd sprung you and Athalar was a trial run for the big show. I don't care what you have to do, Lydia said to Flynn, to Deck, or who you have to leave behind. But you get my sons out of this city and to the coast. She met their stare and added, Please. Deck nodded. We've got you covered, Lydia. The name seemed to trip Deck up, but he got over it and said, We'll protect your kids. Just do what you have to do, and we'll be where you need us. She nodded back, 
eyes glittering. Thank you. Hunt glanced to Bryce, who was watching all this silently. Not a good sign. Lydia noted Bryce's look and said, You remember the way to their throne room? Yes, Bryce said, and faced Hunt. The wings were all still there a couple weeks ago. Let's hope Rigelus hasn't redecorated. He won't have touched them, Lydia answered. He abhors change. The words hung in the air. Hunt swallowed against the dryness in his throat. They were doing this. He was doing this. Hadn't he learned his fucking lesson twice now? With the fallen, then with recent events? To go back for a third helping? I remember, Bryce said quietly, just to him, even with the others listening. Every movement of Micah's sword when he cut off your wings. How there was nothing we could do to stop him. Stop them. I remember how they sold you back to Sandriel, and that time, too, there was nothing we could do to stop them. I remember every fucking moment of it, Hunt. Her eyes glimmered with pure rage and focus. But today, we finally fucking stop them. Hunt held his mate's stare and let her courage be his courage, let her strength be his guiding light. I promised myself that day Micah cut off your wings, Bryce said, still just for him, that they'd pay for it, for what they've done. Starlight flickered around her head in a shadow of that crown of stars. No one spoke. Bryce got to her feet, heading for the back doors of the van. The world, the Asteri, the end waited beyond. She looked back at all of them. Her eyes met Hunt's. And Bryce said, before she stepped into the light, Through love, all is possible. Chapter 88 It was too easy to get into the Asteri's palace. Lydia knew every entrance, but even with her unrivaled knowledge, it was too easy for them to get in through the service doors that led to the extensive garbage processing dock. Too easy to slip down one of the reeking chutes and land in a trash room a level below. But only when the four of them were in the tiny, malodorous closet on the sublevel did they pause, look at each other. Good luck, Rune said to his sister, perhaps for the last time. But Bryce smiled gently, softly, and though she had been all fierce determination in the van a few minutes ago, it was love in her face now, as she said to him, You brought so much joy into my life too, Rune. He remembered then, saying those words to her before she'd vanished through the gate. You brought so much joy into my life, Bryce. It felt like a lifetime ago. She said nothing more, and Rune had no words in him, as Bryce, Athalar in tow, cracked open the door and slipped out. Rune waited a moment in silence with Lydia, the reek of the trash threatening to send his meager breakfast of bread and olive oil back up. He met Lydia's stare in the dimness, though. And while she might need to be the hind today, might need to become that stone-cold female again, he leaned in to brush his mouth to hers. Only once, and then he whispered, at last naming that feeling he hadn't dared acknowledge until now, if I don't get the chance to tell you later, I love you. Lydia blinked, golden eyes glimmering. Rune. But he didn't wait for a response or a refusal or a denial. He eased open the door an inch and peered into the hallway. Clear, he murmured, drawing his handgun. With any luck, Deck was doing his job. Praying that the Asteri, distracted with trying to tamp down the effects of Bryce and Hunt's message, wouldn't even consider that hell was about to be unleashed in their own home, Rune stepped into the hall, Lydia right behind them, and then, wreathed in his shadows as they stole through the heart of the Empire, they began the hunt to find her sons. They had a few close calls, and Hunt wished again for his umbra mortis suit, if only for the helmet's heightened hearing to detect any passing politicians or workers. 
The politicians could get fucked for all Hunt cared. But the workers? God's willing, when the time came, the workers would be able to escape. That when Declan hacked into the Asteri alert system, their phones would buzz with the evacuation order to get the fuck out of the palace, and they would heed the warning. Hunt's heart was thundering through every inch of him, as he and Bryce hid in the shadows of a massive statue of Polaris, the female's hands upraised in victory. Beyond the statue rose a familiar set of doors. The whole hallway was precisely as it had been the last time Hunt had seen it, before his lightning and Rigelus's power had blasted it to smithereens. Busts of the Asteri lining one wall, the windows overlooking the seven hills of the Eternal City on the other. And somewhere out there, inching along the main road of the Sacra Via, Deck and Flynn would be waiting. But not for them. Hunt knew he and Bryce might never come back from this fight. If they succeeded in destroying the First Light Corps and cutting off the Asteri's renewable source of power— then they'd have to get close enough to those bastards for Bryce to use the sword and knife. To unite them using that star, and risk whatever might happen with a portal to nowhere. Thea had been afraid of it. Adis had warned them to choose life, for fuck's sake, if the portal was too dangerous. It didn't bode well, but what other options did they have? There were too many ifs, too many unknowns— it was an even flimsier plan than the last time they'd snuck into this palace. And while they'd all agreed on the plan together, if it failed, if Bryce or any of them died, no, he wouldn't go down that road again. He had made mistakes in the past, bad calls, but fighting against tyranny, against brutality, would never be the wrong choice. Hunt glanced to his mate, her attention fixed on the hallway, on the gate at its far end. Sensing his attention, she mouthed, Go, and motioned him along. And Hunt went, as he'd go anywhere, so long as it was with her. For the first time in his life, it seemed that Erd was listening, as he and Bryce slipped past the doors into the empty throne room. He gazed at the towering wall of the fallen's wings behind the seven crystal thrones. And there... At its center, pinned like a new trophy, was his umbra mortis helmet and suit. Bryce held the mask in her hands, its gold surface shimmering among the crystal of the sterile throne room. The wings of the fallen hung on the wall, a fluttering array of colors and shapes and sizes. So many lives given toward this moment. Hunt buckled the last bit of his suit into place, fitting the umber mortis helmet over his head. Bryce hadn't questioned him when he took it off the wall. She knew why he wanted it. Just as she knew that his wings, pinned right above Rigelus's throne, could not remain. He'd wear that suit and helmet one more time. It wouldn't be the umber mortis wearing that suit, but Hunt, her Hunt, and together they would end this. She wished Ethan had made it in time with Hypaxia's antidote, but they couldn't delay this, not by a single minute. Bryce ran her thumbs over the mask's smooth brow. It looked like a death mask for some long-dead king. Had it been crafted around the mold of some Asteri's face, fashioned after the hateful visage of a Daglin in that other world? Bryce, Hunt warned, his voice low and warped through the helmet. She beheld the shadow of death standing there. He drew his twin swords from the back of his suit, flipping them in his hands. Do it now. All she'd ever done in her life, every step, it had led here. Here, to this chamber, with the wings of the noble fallen around her, with Hunt, one of the few remaining warriors. But no longer. Bryce lifted the mask to her face and closed her eyes as she slid it on. The metal adhered to her skin. It sucked at her face, her soul. The world diluted again. Alive, not alive. Breathing, not breathing. Dead, undead. The star inside her flared brightly, as if to say, Hello, old friend. Yes, the ancient magic knew the mask. It understood its deepest secrets. 
Bryce turned to the wings, and in the shadow vision of the mask, where the wings were pinned, most held a twinkling light, the kernel of a soul, the last scraps of their existences, shining like a wall of stars. She'd been right. They had never been given sailings. It had been the final insult to the dead warriors, the shame of being denied a blessed afterlife. It would prove to be the Asteri's downfall. These souls, left to wander for centuries, were now hers to claim. A thought, and her will was their will. The mask called, and the souls of the fallen answered, drifting from the wall like a swarm of fireflies. Rustling filled the air. The wings began to beat slowly at first, like butterflies testing out their new bodies. The flapping of wings filled the throne room, the world. A storm wind from Hunt had the pins ripping free. All but two sets, one a familiar gray, one shiningly white, loosed into the world. And then the throne room was full of wings, white and gray and black, soaring, their sparks of soul shining brightly within them, visible only to Bryce as she looked through the mask. Hunt and Bryce stood in the center of the storm, her hair whipped about by their wind, skin grazed by their downy feathers. A spark of Hunt's lightning struck the two pairs of wings still pinned to the wall, his own wings and Isaiah's. They caught fire, burning until they were nothing but ashes floating on the breeze of a thousand wings, freed at last from this place. Another storm wind from Hunt, and the doors to the hall opened. The windows lining the hall exploded, and the wings of the fallen soared for the open blue sky beyond. The throne room emptied of them, like water down a drain, leaving a lone figure in the doorway, staring at them. Rigelous. Feathers floated in the air around him. What? The bright hand seized, glowing with power. Do you think you're doing? He stepped in, and his eyes went right to Bryce's face. Maybe it was the mask. Maybe she had been pushed beyond her limits. But she felt no fear, absolutely none, as she looked at the bright hand of the Asteri and said, Writing a wrong. But Rigelus narrowed his eyes at the mask. You bear a weapon you have no business wielding. In the streets beyond, people were shouting at the sight of the host of wings flying overhead. Dead and undead, Rigelus's nature confused the mask, alive and not alive, breathing and not breathing. It couldn't get a grip on the bright hand, and it seemed to be recoiling, pulling away from Bryce. She focused. You obey me. The mask halted and remained in her thrall. Rigelus eyed Hunt in his battle suit and helmet, but he said to Bryce, You traveled a long way from home, Bryce Quinlan. He advanced one step. That he hadn't attacked yet was proof of his wariness. Hunt's lightning slithered over the floor. But Bryce pointed behind Rigelus to one of the hills beyond the city walls, where the wings had landed in the dry grass, they coated the hilltop, wings flapping idly, a flock of butterflies come down to rest. And Bryce commanded them, Rise, as you once were. Ice colder than that in Nenya flowed through her, toward the now distant wings. She could sense Hunt's pain, but Bryce didn't take her eyes from Rigelus. You have no idea what powers you toy with, girl. Rigelus said, the mask will curse your very soul. Let's spare ourselves the idle threats this time, Bryce said, and pointed out the window again. This time to the army that had crept up to stand among the wings bearing those souls. I think you have bigger issues to deal with. She smiled then, a predator's smile, a queen's smile, as the armies of hell crested the hill. Right on time, Bryce said. Rigelus said nothing as more and more of those dark figures appeared atop the hill, spilling out from the portal she'd opened for them just over its other side, hidden from view. 
At the sight of the teeming hordes cresting the hills, seemingly from nowhere, at the sight of the three princes marching at their front, people began screaming in the streets, another signal for Declan to get the evacuation order out under the guise of an imperial emergency alert. Every phone in this city would buzz with the command to escape beyond the city walls, to the coast if they could. Rigela stared toward the armies of hell, now assembled on his doorstep. Surprise, Hunt said. Rigela slowly, slowly turned back toward Bryce and Hunt, and smiled. Did you think I didn't know the moment you opened the Northern Rift? Bryce braced herself, rallied her power as Rigelus lifted a glowingly bright hand, and said, I have been waiting for your arrival, and have prepared accordingly. A horn sounded, a clear note echoing across the city, and in answer, the Asterian Guard exploded into the streets of the Eternal City. Chapter 89 I knew as soon as you reached the rift. My harpy told me, and I watched you through her eyes before you ended her. Rigelus advanced another step into the throne room, power brewing in his hand, dancing along the golden rings on each long finger. Bryce and Hunt tensed, eyeing the distance to the exit. A smaller door lay behind the thrones, but to reach it, they'd have to put their backs to Rigelus. In the city, light sparked and boomed, brimstone missiles, made and fired by the Asterian guard on the rooftops, spearing toward the demons of Hell's armies. Arcing, golden, the missiles slammed into the dark ranks atop Mount Hermon. Earth and rock shattered, light blooming upward. And like the rodents you are, Rigelus said. I knew you'd leave an escape route for yourselves and your allies, right to hell. I knew you'd leave the rift open. Hunt grabbed Bryce's hand, preparing to get them out. So I sent three legions of my Asterian guard to the rift last night. I think they and their brimstone missiles will find hell quite unguarded with all its armies here. We have to warn Adis, Hunt said, squeezing her hand. Bryce looked at Rigelus once more, at his smirk of triumph at outwitting them. And with a shove of her power, she teleported herself and Hunt out of the palace, right to the chaos of the hills beyond the city. Rune and Lydia raced along the palace corridors, veiled in his shadows. They'd found no sign of her sons, nothing in the dungeons, the sight of which had given Rune such a jolt of pure terror, he had nearly dropped their concealing shadows, and nothing in any of the holding cells. They'd made their way through the palace as quickly as they could while staying undetected. Deck had disabled many of the cameras, and Rune's shadows took care of the rest. But after twenty minutes of fruitless searching, Rune grabbed Lydia's arm before they could race down yet another hallway. We need to stop and reconsider where they might be, Rune said, breathing hard. They're here. He's got them here, Lydia snarled, struggling against his grip. Rune held firm, though. We can't keep running around blindly. Think. Where would Pollux take them? She panted, eyes wide with panic, but took a breath, another, and that cold Heinz mask slid over her face. I know how to find them, she said, and Rune didn't question her as she took off again, this time heading back down the stairs, down, 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 until the heat and humidity hit him first, then the smell of salt. The one thousand mystics of the Asteri slumbered in their sunken tubs, in regimented lines between the pillars of the seemingly endless hall. Traitor, a withered, veiled female hissed, from a desk in front of the doors, rising to her feet. Lydia pulled out her handgun and sent a bullet through the female skull without hesitation. The blast rocked like thunder through the hall, but the mystics didn't stir. 
Rune stared at Lydia, at the place where the old female had been standing, at the blood now sprayed on the stones. But Lydia was already heading for the nearest tank, for the controls beside it. She began typing, then moved to the next mystic, then the next, and the next. We don't have long, until someone comes down here to investigate that gunshot, Rune warned. But Lydia kept moving from tank to tank, and he peered at the first monitor to see the question she'd written. Where are Lydia Servos's sons? She stopped typing at the seventh mystic and stalked along the rows of tubs. Rune moved to the doorway to keep watch, hiding himself in shadows as he monitored the hall, the stairs at their far end. They'd be lucky if it took even a minute for inquiring ears to get down here. Lydia gasped. Rune whirled toward her, but she was already running. Pollux has got them under the palace, she said, as she reached the door and raced out, Rune running alongside her. Under? Rune asked, trailing her down the stairs. In the hall with the first light core that your sister discovered, under the archives. Lydia, Rune said, grabbing her arm. It has to be a trap. To have them at the core? She pointed the gun at his head. I'm going. If it's a trap, then it's a trap. But I'm going. Rune held up his hands. I know, and I'm going with you. But we have to think through the... She was already sprinting again, the gun back at her side. The castle had filled with sound now, a cacophony of shouting scared people trying to get out as fast as possible. It masked the sound of their creeping about, but... Lydia was frantic, desperate, which made for a dangerous ally, hind or no. She'd get herself killed, and her sons too. He couldn't let her jeopardize herself like that. If anyone was going to put themselves in that lethal danger, it'd be him. Rune vaulted down the stairs behind Lydia, and when he caught up to her, he clicked the safety off his gun. Lydia heard that click, and halted, turned to him, Slow, disbelieving. She didn't glance at the gun. She already knew it was there. Her eyes were on his, unreadable, cold, the eyes of the hind. Rune rasped, I can't let you get yourself killed. I will never forgive you for this, she said, voice like ice itself. Never. I know, Rune said, and fired. One shot, right to her thigh. She shouted in pain as she crumpled, the bullet passing through the wound and ricocheting off the stairs behind her, the thunder of the gun and her scream spinning into a chorus that shredded his soul, a chorus that, thankfully, was muffled by the chaos unfolding levels above. She pressed her palm to the open wound, which he'd inflicted far from any dangerous artery, and her eyes blazed with pure flaming rage. I will kill you. She reached for the gun at her other thigh, as if she really would blast his face off. Rune bolted down the stairs before she could take aim. Holstering his own gun, he raced onward, leaving her to bleed behind him. The waterways of the Eternal City were old and strange and unfriendly. Therian hated them, especially with the amplified power in his veins, freed from its bonds. His body and soul recognized the very essence of his surroundings. They did not like what they encountered. There was no mare court in the river wending like a snake through the city. There was barely any life at all beyond bottom feeders and skittering things that clung to the shadows. Above, the world was chaos, armies and missiles and wings. Here, the sounds were muffled, the water whispered to him where to go, where to bring the bag of sealed antidotes, flowed with him, guided his powerful tail right to the grate in the riverbank. His gills flared as he hauled away the metal, as he swam into the dark, lightless tunnel and switched on the aquatic headlamp he'd had the good sense to bring. And with the water guiding him, Therian swam like hell for the Asteri's palace. Bombs ruptured, and it was so much worse than the past spring. 
Brimstone missiles rose from the city, from the Asterian guard hidden within it, from the mech suits stirring to life atop Mount Hermon. So much destruction, hyper-concentrated angelic wrath. Atop one of the hills beyond the city, Bryce was gasping for breath, a bit dizzy, as she yanked the mask from her face. Hunt ran for where the Prince of the Chasm stood, overlooking the dark beasts swarming toward the city walls, and said, Phase two starts now. Bryce mastered herself enough to stagger up to Adis and Hunt. The armies of hell, both terrestrial and airborne, all hungry and raging, were no fucking joke. She knew it had been the only way. To stand a chance, unleashing hell had been the only way. Even so, its army was petrifying, allies or not. She had to trust that Adis and the other princes had them on tight leashes. They're almost close enough, Adis said, clad in black armor akin to Thanatos's. Bryce could only assume that his brothers were either among the fray or overseeing their own divisions of the teeming black mass. There was nothing to do for a moment but watch the Asterian guard decide they had the beasts on the run and begin advancing beyond the city walls. Wings fluttered nearby, and Isaiah and Naomi touched down beside Hunt. Ready? Isaiah asked, clad in the black battlesuit of the 33rd. Soon, Ada said. The angels still maintained a healthy distance from him, but had at least lost their disbelieving, wary expressions in his presence. The Asterian guards swept out into the hills and valleys below, their mech suits marching among them, and where they struck, demons died. Do you think, Adis mused, that they have any idea what's about to happen to them? No, Hunt said, smiling darkly, and neither does Rigelus. Bryce slid the mask back on, and its ungodly, leeching presence ate into her soul— but the star inside her seemed to hold the mask at bay. That'll teach him to think he can outsmart us, Naomi said. The Asterian guard, white plumes of horsehair on their helmets shining bright in the daylight, advanced through the field of demons. The feet of the scores of mech suits among them shook the earth. I think the three legions he sent to Nenya, Naomi said, will be in for quite a surprise when they find that half of Hell's army is still there and waiting for them. Isaiah said, with no small amount of satisfaction, they should be getting word to the Asteri right about... He checked his phone. Now. Perfect, Adis purred. Then we're ready. Messaging Declan. Naomi said, typing into her phone. The Fey warrior was waiting in the van, the hacked Imperial military network laid bare at his fingertips. The Asteri's mech suits halted mid-stride. The Asterian guard paused, glancing at the fancy new machines that had malfunctioned all at once. The glowing eyes of the mech suits faded and died out. Magic and machines, Isaiah said. Never a good combination. It's a go, Naomi said, reading a message on her phone. Do your thing, Quinlan. They all looked to Bryce. Alive and not alive. Dead and undead. Bryce reached out a hand toward the stilled metal army below. Cold, awful power went through her. But her will was their will. Her will was everything. Rise, Bryce said, blasting the thought out. Fight. Obey Isaiah Tiberian and Naomi Boreas. Hell is your ally. You fight beside them. Only she could see the twinkling souls of the fallen, drifting toward those suits from the nearby hilltop, alighting on them one by one by one. The eyes of the suits blazed again. Bryce saw the nearest mech suit lift its metal arm in front of its face, watch its fingers wriggle with something like wonder. Then it turned to the closest Asterian guard and bashed the soldier's head in. Holy gods, Naomi breathed, as the mech suits, one after another, began to march away from the Asterian guard. The souls of the fallen had waited for the moment the Asterian guard and their mech suits had begun to march toward the city below. 
and the remaining souls of the fallen that didn't have a mech suit to slip into? Well, there were plenty of dead demons and Asterian guards with bodies intact enough for occupying. Twitching, as if adjusting to the new limbs, those corpses lurched to their feet, came to stand beside their fallen brethren in their mech suit hosts. You're up, Hunt said to Isaiah and Naomi. Time to get into the city. The angels bowed their heads, and with a great thrust of their wings, they launched skyward. Isaiah's voice boomed out. Fallen, you are now risen. To the gates! Isaiah looked back at Hunt, his eyes brimming with pride and determination. The warrior touched his heart and flew off. Hunt lifted his arm in salute and farewell, as if beyond words. It was indeed a sight beyond words, beyond any description. An army of the undead, of machines and demons, marched for the city walls. Incoming, Hunt said. Seems like that footage kept them distracted until now. Right on time, Adis confirmed, as the glowing figures approached the battlefield, spread before the northern gates of the Eternal City, come to exterminate this threat themselves. The Asteri. And walking toward them, the armies parting before them, was the Prince of the Ravine, with the Prince of the Pit trailing close behind. Chapter 90 Hunt refrained from heaving a sigh of relief, even if his helmet would have masked the sound. Bryce had freed the souls of the fallen from the throne room and placed them into those mech suit bodies, but the hardest and most dangerous part of their plan started now. Hunt fought to keep his breathing steady, his focus on the unfolding battle and chaos. His helmet blared with alerts and assessments. Adis unsheathed a shining silver blade that seemed to glow with bluish light. My turn, the demon prince said, the dry breeze whipping his pale blonde hair. He asked Bryce, a ride. Hunt had only a moment to glimpse the worry, the fear in her eyes, as she grabbed Adis's hand, then Hunt's, and teleported them. With the power of Thea's star, it barely took a moment, barely seemed to drain her. But what arose around them as they reappeared on the battlefield was a scene straight from a nightmare. Christalos demons, death stalkers, hounds like the shepherd, and worse. The pets of Thanatos, all racing past the Asteri and into the city itself. Hunt's helmet turned them all into distant figures, the world awash in red and black. But the Asteri had bigger fish to fry the three princes now before them, especially Apollyon, standing between his brothers. There was no sign of Rigelus. He'd sent the other five Asteri to do his dirty work. You shall pay for marching on our city, Polaris snapped at them. Hunt unfurled his power, lightning bright even from behind the visor of his helmet. Beside him, Bryce had already peeled off the mask, and beyond them, around them, the fallen, his fallen, now in bodies of metal and nightmares, all still bound by the command to follow Isaiah and Naomi, engaged the Asterian guard, swarmed them. Miniature brimstone missiles launched from the mech suit's shoulder guns, fired at the Asterian guard. Floating feathers and cinders were all that remained. It had been Hunt's idea to play on Rigelus's arrogance. He thought them reckless and stupid, thought they'd be dumb enough to believe that they could somehow smuggle an army down from Nenya and launch a surprise attack on the Eternal City, that they'd be dumb enough to leave hell open and vulnerable. So they'd let the Asteri split their Asterian guard in two, sending half to Nenya to conquer hell— only to be slaughtered by a host of demons awaiting them there, under the command of one of Apollyon's captains. And this half of the guard, the most elite and trained of all angels, they wouldn't stand a chance either. Three princes of hell faced off against five Asteri, in the dry scrub beyond the city walls, war exploding all around them. It was Polaris who looked to Bryce, 
You shall die for this impertinence, she sneered, and launched a blinding blast of raw power for her. Apollyon stepped forward, a hand raised. Pure, devouring darkness destroyed Polaris's light. And satisfaction like Hunt had never known coursed through him, at the way the Asteri halted, stepped back. Apollyon inclined his golden head to the Asteri. It has been an age. Do not let him get any closer, Polaris hissed to the others, and as one, the Asteri attacked. The ground ruptured, and light met dark met light. Hunt whirled to Bryce, a shield of pure lightning crackling between them and the fighting. His voice was partially muffled by his helmet. We need to get out of here. No, Bryce said, eyes on the Asteri. That's not the plan. Hunt growled, reaching for her elbow, intending to fly them away from the battlefield if she wouldn't teleport them. They needed to destroy the First Light core, or else all this would be pointless. With it still functional, the Asteri could run back to the palace, regenerate their powers, their bodies. Bryce, Hunt warned. But Bryce drew the Star Sword and Truth Teller, starlight and darkness flowing down the Black Blades, she didn't unite them, though. At least there was still time to stick to the plan. Polaris burst through the fray, eyes burning with white light fixed on Bryce. You should have run when you had the chance, the North Star snarled. The air seemed to pulse with the power from those blades, from Bryce, like they knew the time to unite had come at last. No running, then. Only adapting. So Hunt rallied his own power, rising to meet his mate. Polaris launched herself toward them, and Hunt struck, a blast of pure lightning at her feet, warping the very stone there, opening a pit for her to trip into. Bryce teleported, slowly enough that Hunt knew she was already tiring, despite the extra power from the star. But then she was there, in front of Polaris as the Asteri hit the ground— and only Hunt's lightning shield kept the blast of power from frying Bryce as she lifted the sword and the dagger above her head. Polaris's eyes widened as Bryce plunged the blades into her chest, and as those blades thrust through skin and bone, the star in Bryce's own chest flared out to meet them. It collided with the blades, and both sword and knife blazed bright, as if white-hot, the light extended up through Bryce's hands, her arms, her body, turning her incandescent into a star, a sun. Polaris screamed, her mouth opening unnaturally wide. The slowing of the world when a great power died was familiar to Hunt from Micah's death, from Shahar's, from Sandriel's, but this was so much worse. With the helmet, Hunt could truly see everything, the particles of dust drifting by, the droplets of Polaris's blood rising upward like a red rain as Bryce shoved her blades deeper and deeper. The demon princes were turning toward them, their Asteri opponents with them. Gone were the prince's humanoid skins. Creatures of darkness and decay stood there, mouths full of sharp teeth, leathery wings splayed. A great black mass lay within Apollyon's yawning open mouth as he surged for Octartus. The Asteri male flung up a wall of light. The brimstone missiles from the shoulders and forearms of the mech suit hybrids sparked again, ember by ember by ember, and Hunt could see with perfect clarity as the spiraling missiles launched into the world toward the panicking Asterian guard. A Deathstalker raced past, one galloping step lasting an age, a lifetime, an eon as it seemed to balance on one foot mid-stride. And Bryce was still there, falling with Polaris, those two black blades meeting in the Asteri's chest, Thea's star uniting them in power and purpose. Debris skittered toward Bryce, toward Polaris like whatever was happening at that intersection of the blades was drawing the world in, 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 to the portal to nowhere. A primal chill sang down Hunt's spine. Thea had been right. Adis was right. 
That portal to nowhere, opening somehow inside Polaris, was dangerous not just to the Asteri, but to anyone in its reach. He had to stop it. He had to shut it fast, or else he knew, instinctively, that all of them would perish. Time dripped by as Polaris contorted in pain. Bryce's hair was sucked toward the Asteri, toward the blades and wherever they were opening to. Too slow. Whatever Thea's star was summoning, the portal was opening too slowly, and every second that it yawned wider threatened to swallow Bryce, too. He'd been made by hell to help her, to end this. Hellfire and Starfire, a potent combination, Bryce had said in hell. It was pure instinct, pure desperation, too. Hunt unleashed his lightning, directed it toward the nexus where those blades met. It flowed like a sizzling ribbon through the world, past the Death Stalkers, past the Princes of Hell, past the mech suits. Hunt watched it collide with the sword and dagger right where they crossed, where Thea's star still glowed between them, binding them in unholy union. And where his hellfire met starfire, where lightning met blades, it bloomed with blinding light. Polaris's face twisted with agony, and still the world kept slowing, slowing. Tendrils of Hunt's hellfire twined down the blade into Polaris herself. Lightning danced over Bryce's teeth, over her shocked eyes. He expected an outward explosion, expected to see every last bit of Asteri bone and brain rupture, shard by shard. But instead, Polaris imploded. Her chest caved in, sucked into the blades as if by a powerful vacuum, followed by her abdomen and shoulders, and Polaris was screaming and screaming, until he saw it, just a flash, so fast that in real time he'd never have witnessed it, the tiny, inky dot the two blades had made, right where they met, the thing Polaris had been sucked into, a black dot. It was there, and then gone, as Bryce stumbled forward, and the blades separated, and time resumed, so fast Hunt lost his breath. He touched a button on the side of his helmet, raising his visor, offering him lungfuls of fresh air. One of the Asteri roared, and the world itself shook, the city walls with it. But Bryce was staring down at the place where Polaris had been, at the blades in her hands, still wreathed in his hellfire and her starlight, a portal to nowhere, to a black hole. No wonder it had started to suck in Bryce as well, and the rest of the world. No wonder Thea had hesitated, if that was what she'd suspected would happen at the joining of the blades. Hunt's body was vibrating with power as Bryce lifted her face to his. Pure, savage delight lit her eyes, She'd seen it, too. She knew she'd sent Polaris straight into the nothingness of a black hole. And there, a kernel of worry sparked, like it was setting in how dangerous it would be to open another one, let alone five more, what they'd risk each time. Still, they stared at each other, just for a moment. They killed a god's damned Asteri. Hunt's power buzzed through him again, in his very bones. No, that wasn't his power buzzing through him. It was his phone, the interior speakers on his helmet patched Rune through. Dannon, you need to get to the hall with the First Light Corps, Rune said. We've... we need help. The line went dead. Bryce, Hunt began, but when he turned to her, he found that pure light had again filled her eyes. He'd seen that face only once before, the day she'd killed Micah, when she'd looked at the cameras and shown the world what lurked under the freckles and smile, the apex predator beneath, Wrath's bruised heart. Whatever it took to end this, she'd do it. His blood pumped through him, sparking at that look, at what she had done. Go, shouted the thing Adis had become, identifiable only by those blazing blue eyes as he faced Octardis beside Apollyon. The princes looked like the worst of horrors, but Hunt knew their true nature now. They had come to help, and for a single heartbeat, pride at being a son of hell threaded through him. 
Hunt looked back to Bryce, shutting the helmet's visor over his eyes again. We have to get to the hall with the first light core, he said. But she was already reaching for him, grabbing his hand, primal fury blazing on her face, the star sword and truth teller again sheathed. A blink, and they were gone. She was draining fast. They landed in a hallway three levels up, if the number on the nearby stairwell entrance was any indication. Blood leaked from her nose, and Hunt might have fretted had he not heard the snarls surrounding them, had his helmet not blared with alerts. They'd teleported into a corridor full of death stalkers. Thanatos had sent his pets into the palace to distract and occupy any Asteri who might have stayed away from the battlefield, but his grip on them must have been weak, or he simply did not care. Taking on just one had left a scar down Hunt's back. Granted, he'd been bound by the halo, but even at full power, taking on this many would be no mean feat. Beside him, Bryce panted. She needed a breather. After her fight with Polaris, after managing to avoid the black hole she'd opened, after the teleporting, his mate needed rest. Hunt eyed the snarling pack. The thought of wasting his power to kill an ally's beast rankled him. But in the end, he didn't have to decide. A wall of water crashed through the corridor and roared straight for him and Bryce. Chapter 91 There was no way out. No window, no exit, no place to breathe as water flooded the hall up to the ceiling. Hunt grabbed Bryce, his lightning rendered useless in the water, and swam toward where he guessed the stairs might be in the tumbling dark. His helmet filled with water, warping his vision. A light shone. He hadn't thought Bryce had that kind of power left, but no, it wasn't Bryce. Therian was swimming toward them through the hall. Kedos had never commanded enough power to control this much water, and with such force. Yet here he was, clearly the master of this flood. An air bubble formed around Hunt and Bryce. He yanked off his helmet, splashing water down his front. What the fuck? Hunt spat, choking on the water. But Bryce got it before Hunt did, and yelled at Therian through the air bubble, now saving their asses. Don't drown them all! We need them on the battlefield! I had a bag of antidotes, Therian shouted, his powerful tiger-striped tail thrashing. But the force of the water snapped the strap. It's down here somewhere. Just wait for me to— No time! Bryce shouted back. Find it! Then find us! Bryce was right. To delay getting to that room, cutting off the Asteri's power at the knees, it wasn't a risk worth taking, even for the antidote. The water roared past into the stairwell. Go, Therian called, as the water vanished from the hall, the mare and the demons swept upward in its current. I'll be right behind you. Hunt and Bryce landed hard on the stones, soaking wet and sputtering, but they didn't wait. Hurry, Bryce said, grabbing his arm to haul him to his feet. The first light cores below us. It was all Hunt could do to shake the water from his eyes, grab his helmet, and race after her. Rune had fucked up. In so many ways he'd fucked up. He could think of nothing else as he stood before Pollux, hands raised, before the door down to the hall with the first light core running underneath it. There was no sign of Acteon or Bran. Where's Lydia? Pollux sneered, pointing a gun at Rune's face, his white wings glowing with power. Rune had left her bleeding and wounded on the stairs, utterly vulnerable, hating him. Where are the boys? He growled. Someplace else, Pollux said, and Rune's stomach churned at what that might imply. Rigelus guessed you'd seek out his mystics. So he instructed them to feed the lie to you, which you swallowed so fucking easily because you're a gullible fool. The hammer stepped forward and jerked his chin at Rune. Move. I know Lydia's around here somewhere. Rune had little choice but to obey, to let the hammer lead him away from the first light core.
out of the archives, then back down that hall to where Lydia would be lying bleeding on the stairs. Pollux's breathing hitched as the scent of her blood filled the hall. Lydia, he called in a sing-song. Her scent became overpowering as they turned the corner to where Rune had left her. There was no trace of her. Therian helped Lydia limp along, a band of living water wrapped around the hole in her thigh. Chasing down the satchel and antidotes, he'd found both bag and hind on the stairs, right before they'd heard the hammer snarling. Only two vials had made it. The rest had burst, thanks to either the impact or the volatility of Athalar's lightning. But Lydia had been shot. By rune, she'd told him. Therian didn't know whether to admire or curse Danon for it. The idiot had done it to keep her from harm, so he'd face Pollux alone. Therian hadn't needed to ask what she and Rune were doing down here in the first place, why they'd risked everything to be here, why they'd separated from Bryce and Hunt. Pollux had gloated about Lydia's sons to Rune, how the mystics had been ordered to lie about where they were, leading her into a trap. But that meant her sons remained captive elsewhere in this palace, and Pollux knew how to find them. Lydia the hammer crooned. Lydia! He practically sang her name. Lydia gritted her teeth. With a surge upward, she launched for the hall, for the hammer, but Therian grabbed her, hauling her back down beside him. We need to regroup, he hissed. I need to get to my sons, she hissed back, and tried to move again. They spoke so quietly that their words were barely more than whispers of breath. Therian held her still. You're in no shape. She tried once more, and Therian decided to hell with it. He willed the water band around her thigh to push in tighter, to send a tendril into the hole in her skin for emphasis. She clapped a hand over her mouth, swallowing a scream. Therian pulled back the tendril, hating himself for the pain he'd caused. But he held his magic in place to keep any hint of her blood from showing where she'd gone. Her eyes widened, surprise replacing pain, as the water eased up at his command. A simple, normal bit of magic, but he knew his eyes blazed with power, with the raging rapids of the Istros itself. He said, low and swift, Hypaxia managed to develop an antidote for the parasite. It temporarily returns the magic the drop took from us. More than that, actually. Therian could have sworn something like pride gleamed in her eyes. I knew she'd figure it out, Lydia murmured. Here. He used a plume of water to free the case of antidotes from his pack. He lifted one of the precious two remaining vials. Take it. You'll black out for a sec, but... But to face the monster in that hallway, she would need to be fully healed, need that wound gone. Lydia didn't hesitate as she grabbed the vial, uncorked it, and drank. She swayed, and gold flashed in her eyes. He caught her as she blacked out, counting the breaths. One, two. Her gunshot wound healed instantly. Lydia's eyes flew open, blazing gold. She looked down at her hands, flexing her fingers. I knew she'd figure it out. Lydia repeated, more to herself than to him. Therian gently set her down and motioned for her to keep quiet as steps sounded once more, far closer than before. We do this slow and smart, Therian warned, and helped her to her feet. She rose without a grimace or wince, all traces of pain now gone, but she nodded. On silent feet, with Therian's magic sending little particles of mist to evaporate the trail of their scent, they descended the steps. Lydia, Pollux crooned again. A glance between them, and they halted at the bottom of the stairwell. Therian peered around the corner to the long hall beyond, where Pollux held Danon at gunpoint in front of him. Lydia, Pollux sang again. I found your companion, so you can't be far away. Therian withdrew. Lydia shook with rage and power. 
Therian could feel it shuddering around him, rising up like a behemoth from the deep. What had that antidote woken in her? What had been taken during the drop? And what had lain dormant all this time? His water seemed to quail at it, like it knew something he didn't. You're here, Pollock said. I can sense your soul nearby. It is entwined with mine, you know. Lydia's teeth flashed, her power growing around them like a physical presence. Therian sliced his hand in front of them, indicating that she should stand down. Until he had a clear shot at the hammer, they couldn't give away their position. Very well, Pollock said. A whistle through his teeth, and a door down the hall groaned open. Footsteps sounded, approaching them, approaching Pollock's. Therian dared risk another glance around the corner. Two angels in imperial armor had stepped out, and between them... Two teenage boys, both bound and gagged. Lydia didn't need to look. She inhaled, scenting whatever was coming. Her eyes flared as she recognized her son's sense. Pure, murderous rage filled her gaze, and Therian was suddenly very, very glad she was on their side. So he knew better than to stop Lydia, as she emerged from their hiding spot rounded the corner, and said, power ringing through her voice, Let them go. Bryce had enough strength to make it to a hall a level above the archives. From there, she and Hunt snuck down on foot, trailing water, as quickly and quietly as they could. She might have pushed herself to teleport them down to the hallway with the first light core, but she needed to conserve her strength— only one Asteri was currently down. She'd killed Polaris. The realization kept rippling through her, how it had felt, how Polaris's blood had felt, showering her, the primal raging satisfaction in seeing the other Asteri's outrage, as Bryce impaled their sister with the sword and dagger, ignited by Hunt's hellfire. And then Polaris had been sucked into nothing, into nowhere. The blades, fueled by her starlight and sped along by Hunt's hellfire, had opened a portal to a place that wasn't a place. One Asteri had been banished from Midgard, but would she be lucky enough to get near the others? Now that they knew what she could do, what she bore, they'd avoid her as they'd avoided Apollyon. The thoughts shot through Bryce's mind, dread sinking in her stomach, as they ran through the palace. There was no point in staying hidden. Everyone knew they were here. A nod to Hunt, and her mate blasted open the doors into the archives. Glass shattered, spraying everywhere, and a shield of Hunt's lightning kept the shards from shredding them as they raced through it, Bryce leading them toward the door to the hallway where the power of Midgard was held. The glow of the room spilled up the stairs, leading the way down. There was no sign of Lydia's sons. Indeed, the hall was exactly as it had been before. A crystal floor, the seven pipes, each with an Asteri's name on an engraved plaque beneath, and next to the plaques, small screens showing their power levels. Sirius and Polaris were now dark, but the others were nearly full. One of them, the seventh, was at full power, and standing before it was its bearer, smiling faintly at them. Rigelous. Chapter 92 Rigelous unleashed a wall of white-hot power, and Bryce had enough sense to blast up a wall of her own, matching the lightning hunt hurled between them and the Asteri. The entire palace above them shook at the impact, and as it cleared, Bryce drew the star sword and truth teller. It didn't end well for Polaris, she told the bright hand, sending starfire rippling down the blades. It won't end well for you. Polaris was weak, Rigelus said, and a fool to let you draw close with those blades. Without warning, he launched his power at them again. Bryce grabbed Hunt this time and teleported to the other side of the room. Rigelus's power hit the stairs behind them, and they buckled. 
A true blow from the bright hand might collapse the entire palace, but that strike still would have seared their skin down to the bone. We have to get to that core under the crystal, Bryce said, and Rigelus attacked again. Kill him first, Hunt grunted, nodding toward the blades in her hands. He won't let us get near enough. She gathered her strength to teleport them to the core, and Hunt erupted with his lightning as they reappeared, firing right for Rigelus. It hit a barrier of light and scattered. Your lightning, Bryce said quickly. It warped stone earlier when you shot it at Polaris. Do you think it can warp crystal? They stood about thirty feet above the glowing core below. To even get through that block of crystal, they'd need precious uninterrupted minutes. She'd thought her starfire could eventually chisel away at it, but they didn't have the luxury of time. I need a good shot at the floor. A few, probably, Hunt said, as Rigelus attacked once more. Again, Bryce teleported. Can you buy me time? Her mouth had dried out, and blood was dribbling from her nose again, but she nodded. What is it you're whispering? Rigelus said calmly, from where he stood in front of the pipes, but Bryce teleported them again. They appeared right in front of Rigelus, and from his shocked face, he hadn't expected that. No, he'd thought her power tapped out. The distraction cost him. Hunt's hellfire slammed into the crystal floor. Bryce didn't wait to see what happened, how Rigelus reacted, before teleporting them back to the center of the room, and Hunt's hellfire boomed as it collided with the stone, which had indeed warped, and was now splintering under the monstrous heat. Crystal peeled away, melting, and beneath it, a tunnel to the core of first light began to form. The Eternal City was a chaos of brimstone missiles, mech suits, demons, the Asterian Guard, and every imaginable nightmare. Light and darkness warred across every inch of the city. But Ethan sprinted through the streets, heading toward the Crystal Palace, toward the white light flashing from it like some massive strobe. It had to be Bryce. But the palace was massive, as big as the Comidium, and to find her in it? No one had answered his phone calls. With the battle, he didn't think they would, but he'd kept trying, all the way here on the boat he'd quickly hired, then running from the coast without rest, without food or water. A brimstone missile sailed overhead, sparking with golden light. It hit a building nearby, and the world ruptured. Even Ethan, with his speed and grace, was thrown. His bones cracked against the building, the Godslayer rifle swinging from his shoulder. And something else had cracked behind him. Not bone, but... Ethan slid to the ground among the screaming people, reaching for his pack. Frantically, he pulled out the container with the vials of antidote for Bryce and Hunt. Liquid leaked from them. Only shards of the vials remained. Therian had more, but Luna knew where the mare was in this mess. The rifle, at least, was unharmed, scraped up along the barrel, but nothing that would affect its usefulness. He struggled to his feet, but a strong hand gripped him, helped him up. Ethan whirled, teeth out, only to find a human woman standing there, her eyes blazing with determination. And behind her, helping the wounded or running for the battle— were more humans, some in their work clothes, some unarmed, but all heading for the conflict, for this first and possibly last shot against the Asteri. And he knew. Bryce's message hadn't only been a distraction for the Asteri. It had been a rallying cry for the people who had suffered most at the Asteri's hands. So Ethan began hurtling for the palace again, past all those humans, valiantly helping and fighting, despite the odds, despite the cost. The antidotes for his friends were gone, but he still had the rifle and its bullet. Make your brother proud. Lydia didn't bother with bullets. She holstered her gun and drew her sword. She knew the odds against Pollux, but she'd been studying him for years now, had learned his moves, his arrogance, his tricks. She hadn't let him learn hers. 
So Lydia glanced sidelong at Rune and said, Get out of here. This is between him and me. She wanted nothing to do with Rune. He'd shot her. He'd shot her in some male fit of dominance, and it had kept her from her sons. She'd never forgive him. No fucking way. Rune eyed the two guards flanking her sons, as if he could take them, as if Pollux's gun wasn't pointed right at the back of his skull. It'd be a bullet for Rune, but Pollux wouldn't blast her apart with a gun or with his power. Not right away. He'd want to bloody her up right, hurt her slow and hard, and make her beg for mercy. The palace shuddered. Lydia, Pollux said with hideous satisfaction. You look well for someone who's been knee-deep in trash lately. Fuck you, Rune spat. Behind Pollux, still several feet down the hallway, her sons stood tall, even as they trembled. The sight short-circuited something in her brain. But Pollux sneered at Rune. Was it for you that she left then? Betrayed all she knew? For a fey princeling? Don't give him that much credit, Lydia snarled. She'd say anything to keep Pollux's attention on her, away from the boys. Rune could go to hell for all she cared. But Lydia gestured between herself and Pollux. This reckoning was years in the making. Oh, I know, Pollux said, and motioned to the two angels behind him. See, the Ocean Queen's fleet isn't all that secure. Catch a mere spy, threaten to fillet them, and they'll tell you anything, including where the depth charger is headed, and the two very interesting children aboard it, their true heritage at last revealed, and the talk of the ship. Lydia considered every scenario in which she could take on Pollux and get her sons out of here. Few of them ended with her walking out of here alive, too. They put up an admirable fight, you know, Pollock said. But they couldn't keep their mouths shut, could they? He glared at Acteon. A bruise bloomed on his temple. You learned quick enough how effective a gag is. A flame lit deep inside her, crackling and blazing. After all the trouble these two brats gave me, Pollock said, white wings glimmering with brute power. I'm really going to enjoy killing them in front of you. Chapter 93 Rune kept perfectly still as Bran and Acteon, bound in Gorsian shackles, were shoved to their knees before Pollux by those two imperial guards. The hammer smiled at Lydia, who'd gone utterly still and pale, I knew instantly that they weren't mine, of course. No sons of my blood could be captured so easily. Pathetic, he sneered at a seething Bran, who was sporting a bloody nose. The kid would take on the hammer with his bare hands. Acteon, however, watched Pollux carefully, though the boy was equally battered, his golden eyes missing nothing, assessing all, trying to find an opening. Lydia rasped, Please, Pollux laughed. Too late for niceties now, Lydia. Rune's mind raced, sifting through every angle and advantage they might have. The math was damning. Even if Pollux lowered the gun pointed at Rune's head, he still stood close enough to kill the boys with one strike. There was no way either Lydia or Rune could reach the boys in time, physically or magically. A bullet would be slower than the striking hammer. And even with Therian at Lydia's side? No, there was no chance. Go get Rigelus, Pollock said to the two guards, not taking his gaze off Lydia, off Rune. He'll enjoy watching this, I think. Without question, without so much as a blink at the atrocities they were leaving behind, the guards departed down the hall, turned into the stairwell and out of sight. Therian struck, a blast of water, so concentrated it could have shattered stone, speared for Pollux. Rune darted to the left as Pollux fired his gun. But not for him, he realized, as the bullet raced, faster than it should have, borne on a wave of angelic power. 
Pollux dove aside, the plume of water missing his wing, but his bullet and power struck true. Therian grunted, going down before Rune could see where the mare had been hit, somewhere in the chest. As water dripped off the walls and ceiling around them, Lydia said, Let them go, Pollux. Your quarrel is with me. He snickered. And what better way to destroy you? I suppose I can make one allowance. You can choose which boy dies first. Bran snarled through his gag at Pollux, but Acteon looked at his mother, eyes sharp, as if telling her to kill this asshole. They're children, Lydia said, voice cracking. Rune couldn't stand it, the pure desperation in her face, the agony. They're your children, Pollux said, power flickering at his hand. Ordinarily, I'd like to make this last a while, but sacrifices must be made in battle. As if in answer, the very building around them shuddered. I hear there are death stalkers loose in here. Perhaps I'll feed the brats to them. Don't, Lydia said, falling to her knees. Tell me what you want, what I must do, and I'll do it. Anything. Rune's heart cleaved in two. For the boys, for her, debasing herself for this prick. He rallied his shadows, but if Therian hadn't been able to hit his mark. Pollux smiled at Lydia. I always liked you on your knees, you know. Whatever you want, Lydia pleaded. Please, Pollux, I am begging you. She'd do it, give Pollux whatever he wanted. Her boys stiffened, seeing that too perhaps finally understanding what, who, their mother was, what had guided her all these years and would continue to guide her in her final moments. Rune just saw Lydia. Lydia, who had given so much, too much, who would do this without a thought. So Rune stepped forward. I'll trade you. Me. For them. Any other opponent would have dismissed it but Pollux looked him over with a cruel, hungry sort of curiosity. Rune snarled, saying the words he hadn't dared voice until now. She's my mate, you fucker. Lydia inhaled a sharp breath. Rune taunted the hammer. You want me to tell you how she said we measured up? Crass, crude words, but ones he knew would strike the hammer's fragile ego. The blow landed. I'll kill the lot of you, Pollock seethed, his beautiful face ugly with rage. Nah, Rune said. You touch her or the boys, and your attention will be split, giving me the opening I need to blast you to hell. He should have taken that shot when Therian attacked. He'd wasted the mare's blow, and now Therian was lying on the ground, alarmingly still, blood leaking from a hole in his chest. Rune... Lydia warned. But, Rune went on smoothly, you hand over the boys, unharmed. You let them and Lydia and Therian go, and I'll walk right up to you, with no guns, no magic. You can pull me apart piece by piece. Take all the time you want. Rune, Lydia's voice broke. He didn't look at her, didn't have the strength to see whatever was in her eyes, he knew she hated him for putting that bullet in her thigh, but it had been to save her, to keep them from this terrible fate that they'd all arrived at anyway. So he said to her, mind to mind, I love you. I fell in love with you in the depths of my soul, and it's my soul that will find yours again in the next life. He shut off the connection between them before she could reply. Then Rune faced the white-winged angel, Lifting his hands, all yours, Hammer. Chapter 94 Unarmed, Rune kept his gaze on the Malaeus. What's it gonna be, Pollux? Lydia's sons were watching him closely. Lydia said nothing, but the Hammer looked toward her. I don't see why I can't have everything I want, the angel said then grinned at Rune. Wait your turn, princeling. It happened so fast, 
Pollux pivoted to the boys, fixed his stare on Bran. Pure brute power flared around the angel. Lydia screamed as Pollux unleashed a lethal spear of his power toward Bran. Rune couldn't turn away, didn't want to watch, and yet he knew he had to witness this crime, this unforgivable atrocity. But Lydia ran, swift as the wind, swifter than a bullet. Rune didn't understand what he saw next, how Lydia reached Bran in time, how she threw herself over her son, knocking him to the ground as she burst into white-hot flames. They erupted from her like a brimstone missile, blasting Pollux off his feet. Not some freak accident or bomb, but fire magic, pouring out of Lydia, searing from her. Bran, she was panting down at her son, the boy untouched by the flame, scanning his stunned face, tugging the gag from his mouth. Brannon, she stifled a sob around the boy's full name, but then Acteon was there, hauling his brother away as best he could, with the bonds still restraining them. What are you? Ace breathed. Still panting, blazing with fire, Lydia said, an old bloodline, and got to her feet. It was daybright, as Rune had seen her in his mind. She'd presented herself, her true self, to him all this time. Get them out of here, Lydia said to Rune, hair floating up in a golden halo, embers swirling around her head. Get the mare to a healer. It was a miracle that Therian wasn't already dead, given the hole blasted through him. Pollux got to his feet. You cunt, he spat. What the fuck is this? Shifters, as they used to be, Lydia said, fire rippling from her mouth. As Danica Fendir told me we were, now free of the Asteri's parasite. Rune gaped at her. She was free of the parasite? She must have gotten that antidote somehow. From Therian? Lydia was glorious, wreathed in flame and blazing with fury. Pollux's power surged again. I'll kill you all the same, bitch. You can try, Lydia said, smiling. Pollux ran at her, striking with his magic. The hallway shook, debris raining down. A wall of blue fire leapt between them. Pollux collided with it, then stuck, a fly in a burning web. Lydia stalked toward the angel as Pollux struggled against the flames. You signed your death warrant when you touched my sons, she said, and exhaled a breath. Flame rippled from her mouth into Pollux's flesh. The angel screamed, or tried to. Freed of any secrets, of any need to keep them, Lydia seemed to unleash all that she was— Rune could only watch as fire poured down Pollux's throat, into his body, roasting him from the inside out until he was nothing but smoldering cinders, a pillar of brimstone standing mid-strike, mouth still open. She'd incinerated him. Lydia held out a finger and poked the towering pillar that had once been Pollux. It sent Pollux's ash statue crumbling to the ground. Her sons got to their feet, shock stark on their battered faces. The knife in Rune's boot helped him make quick work of prying open their Gorsian shackles. But it was Acteon who whispered to Lydia, Mom? She looked over a shoulder to her son. Her lips curved upward. At what he'd called her, Rune guessed. The palace shook again. Whatever was going on outside, it had to be bad. Get the mare to Declan to be healed. Even after taking the antidote, I don't think Kedos's own body can save him, Lydia ordered. And that's the last vial of the antidote in his bag. My sister figured it out. Don't jostle it, though. It's volatile. Lydia, Rune said, but her eyes blazed with true fire. I need to help the others. She launched into a run for the stairs. Get my sons to safety, and we're even. Save them, and I forgive you for shooting me. She glanced back at her boys, and then vanished up into the palace, into the battle-torn world beyond. Lydia had known, even as a child, that she was pure power, and she'd kept that power buried in her veins. 
not witch power. She knew her flames were... different. Her father didn't have them either. She'd kept them secret, even from the Asteri, especially from the Asteri. No other shifters had them, to her knowledge, and she knew what revealing them would mean, becoming an experiment to be pulled apart by the Asteri. Then she had run into Danica Fendir, who had somehow learned things about Lydia's paternal bloodline, and wanted to know if Lydia had any strange gifts, fae-like, elemental gifts. She'd debated killing Danica then and there to keep the gift secret, and what else did Danica know? Could she know about her sons? The shifters were fey from another world, Danica had explained, blessed with a fey form and a humanoid one, gifted with elemental powers. It confirmed what Lydia had long guessed, why she had named Brannon after the oldest legends from her family's bloodline, of a fey king from another world, fire in his veins, who had created stags with the power of flame to be his sacred guards. Lydia hadn't mentioned any of that, as Danica had filled her in on how they'd become shifters, and the Asteri's experimentation with them on Midgard, which had eventually erased their pointed ears. She'd been glad when Danica had died, all her questions with her. No longer. After ingesting the antidote that her brilliant, brave sister had made, the fire had surged so close to the surface that she couldn't deny it, didn't want to deny it. Flame rippled from Lydia as she raced out of the palace, through the city, and onto the battlefield beyond, untethered, unconquerable. The dreadwolves scented her first, no doubt thanks to Mordok's keen bloodhound senses, spotted her standing before the gates to the city. They knew her, even with the fire, and they raced for her in humanoid form, teeth bared, Mordok led the pack, the hate practically radiating off him. Behind him, as always, ran Gedrid and Vespasian, sniper rifles aimed. It was time for Lydia to clean house. You, Mordok barked. Lydia didn't give him the chance to finish. No longer would this male, Danica Fendir's sire, spew his vitriol into the world. He was done inflicting pain upon Midgard. Lydia turned Mordok and the two snipers into ashes with a thought, until all that remained of them was the molten silver from the darts in their collars, pooled on the ground. Another thought, and the pack of dreadwolves, now skidding to a halt in panic, met the same fate. Angels in the Asterian guard shot from the skies, power blasting. Lydia obliterated them, too. Demons paused, their long-dead fallen allies with them. Mech suits going utterly still. The Asterian guard's war machines shifted directions and rumbled toward her, each mammoth tank armed with brimstone missiles. The angels manning them aimed their rifles at her and unleashed a barrage of bullets. Her fire a song in her blood, Lydia walked across the battlefield. Bullets melted before they could reach her. It was so much more natural than it had ever been, in the Cave of Princes, it had taken nearly all her concentration to douse the flames of the Autumn King around her companions. Only Morvan had seemed to be surprised. The others hadn't questioned how the flames had disappeared. There had been too much chaos for anyone to piece it together. Now, her fire flowed and flowed. Her truth was freed. The war machines halted, angled their guns and bombers toward her. They'd wipe her from Midgard. But she'd keep going until the end. She didn't look behind her at the palace, where she could only pray that Rune, her mate, was getting her sons to safety. For the first time in her miserable existence, she let the world see her for what she was. Let herself see all that she was. The missile launchers turned white hot, Lydia rallied her flames. Even if she intercepted the missiles in midair, the shrapnel alone could kill her allies. There was one way to stop it, to get there first, before the missiles launched, and take them all out, herself included. She began running. She wished she'd been able to say goodbye to her sons, to Rune, to tell him her answer to what he'd said. I love you. 
She cast the thought behind her, toward the fey prince she knew would keep her son safe. The war machines followed her movements with their launchers. They'd try to blast her into hell before she could reach them. Emphasis on try. It had been a short life, as far as Vanir were concerned, and a bad one. But there had been moments of joy. Moments that she now gathered and held close to her heart, cradling her newborn sons, smelling their baby-sweet scents, talking with Rune for hours when she knew him only as night, lying in his arms. So few happy memories, but she wouldn't have traded them for anything, would have done it all again just for those memories. Lydia dove deep, all the way into the simmering dregs of her power. The war machines loomed, black and blazing with power, ready for her. Launch barrels stared her down, brimstone missiles glowing golden in their throats. Lydia unleashed her own fire, ready for her final incineration. But before her flame could touch those war machines, before the brimstone missiles could fire, the launch barrels melted. Iron dripped away, sizzling on the dry earth, and those brimstone missiles caught in the melting machinery. The explosions shook the very world as the missiles ruptured, turning the war machines into death traps for the soldiers within. They melted into nothing. The heat of it singed Lydia's face, and amid the burning and billowing smoke, three tiny white lights burned bright. Fire sprites, simmering with power. Through the fire and smoke and drifting embers, Lydia recognized them. Sasa, Rithi, Milana, blazing, raging with fire. They must have crept up unseen from behind enemy lines, too small to be noticed, to ever be counted by arrogant Vanir. Another war machine rumbled forward, rolling over the ruins of the front line. A stupid mistake. The metal treads melted too, pinning the machine in place, trapping the soldiers and pilots within it. They tried to fire their missiles at Lydia, at the three sprites now coming to her side, but they never got the chance. One moment, the war machine was there, missile launchers primed with their payload. The next, the metal of the machine flared white and then melted. Where the machine had been, a fourth sprite glowed, a hot, intense blue. Erythus, she lifted a small hand in greeting. Lydia raised one back. We found her, Sasa said to Lydia, breathless with adrenaline or hope or fear or all of them at once. We told her what you and Bryce said, Milana added as Erythus zoomed for them, leaving a trail of blue embers in her wake. But it did not take much convincing to get her here. How did you know to come today? Lydia asked, as Erythus joined them, a blue star in the midst of the three shimmering lights of the others. Erythus grinned, the first true smile Lydia had seen from the Sprite Queen. We didn't. They reached me yesterday, and we talked long into the night. A fond smile at the three sprites, who turned raspberry pink with pleasure. We were still awake when Bryce Quinlan and Hunt Athelar's video went out. We raced down from Revillis, hoping to help in any way we could. We arrived in the nick of time, it seems, Sasa said, nodding to the smoldering ruins. We wouldn't have wanted to miss all the fun, Rithy added with a wicked smile. Erythus's smile was more subdued as she studied Lydia. The queen's flame set Lydia's own sparking an answer dancing over her fingertips, her hair in joyful recognition. I sensed the fire in you the moment we met, the queen said. I didn't think yours would manifest so brilliantly, though. Lydia sketched a bow, but refrained from telling the queen about the antidote just yet, how it would make Erythus's flame even more lethal. Later, if they survived. But right now... Lydia smirked at the queen, at their gathering enemies. Let's burn it all down. Because ahead of them, dozens strong, an entire line of war machines headed their way. Missile launchers groaned into position, all aiming for where they stood. With pleasure, Erythus said, and even from a few feet away, Lydia's skin seared with the heat of the queen's flame. We shall build a new world.
atop their ashes. Rithi, Sasa, and Malana turned blue, matching their queen's fire with their own. The four fire sprites unleashed their power on the war machines and the Vaynir powering them. Lydia's white-hot flames joined theirs, twining and dancing around it, as if every moment of recognition until now had built toward this, as if her flames had known theirs for millennia. And as one flame, one unified people, as Bryce Quinlan had promised, their fire struck the enemy line. Machines ruptured. Lydia staggered back, back, back with the force of it, still unfamiliar with the fire in her veins, after it had been so long suppressed. But the sprites kept their fire concentrated on the machines and their pilots, and as Lydia hit the ground, as the missiles exploded upon contact with the flames, she cast the last of her power upward to shield the allied forces fighting behind them, and the fire sprites now ahead of her from the shrapnel, which melted until it became raining molten metal. It hissed where it hit the earth. Erythus blazed like a blue star, shooting from machine to machine, leaving burning death in her wake. The three other sprites followed suit. Where they shimmered, imperial forces died, and as the enemy melted at their fingertips— for a moment, just one, Lydia allowed herself to kindle a spark of hope. I'm okay, Therian panted, blood leaking from his mouth. I'm okay. I call bullshit, Rune said, kneeling beside the mare, fumbling through his pack for the vial Lydia had mentioned. The mare would be dead already without the antidote in his veins. But if Rune didn't do something to help Therian now, he'd surely be dead in a few minutes. Get him into a sitting position, Acteon was saying to his brother. Get his head above his chest, so the blood doesn't go out too fast. We have to help her, Bran said. She's out on the battlefield. You guys aren't going anywhere, Rune said to the boys. He found the clear vial and knocked it back. Help me get Kedos up. We've got two seconds before those shithead guards come back, maybe with Rigelus in tow. They didn't have two seconds. From the stairwell at the far end of the hall, the two angels who'd held the boys captive emerged. No sign of Rigelus, thank the gods. But right then, whatever was in that potion hit Rune's stomach, his body, and the world tilted, surging, blacking out. A moment, long enough so that when his vision returned— it was to see the two angels reaching for their guns. Rune exploded. Starlight, two beams of it straight to their eyes, blinded them, just as Bryce had done to the murder twins. Twin whips of his shadows wrapped around their necks and squeezed. What the fuck? Bran said, but Rune barely heard him. There was only power, surging as it never had before— his mind was starkly clear as he willed the shadows to begin slicing through angelic flesh. Blood spurted, bone cracked, two heads rolled to the ground. Holy shit, Bran breathed. Acteon was gaping at Rune. The mare, the kid said, whirling back to where Therian had passed out again. Fuck, Rune spat and put a hand to Therian's chest to staunch the bleeding. Warm, bright magic answered. Healing magic, rising to the surface as if it had been dormant in his blood. He had no idea how to use it, how to do anything other than will it with a simple, save him. In answer, light poured from his hands, and he could feel Therian's flesh and bone knitting back together beneath his fingers, mending, healing, it had been a clean shot through the chest and out the back, and this new healing magic seemed to know what to do, how to close both entry and exit wounds. It couldn't replace the blood, but if Kedos was no longer leaking, he might survive. A shudder rocked the palace, and time slowed. For a heartbeat, Rune thought it might be his own power, but no, he'd felt this before. Just a short time ago, when the world had rippled with what he knew, deep in his bones, was the impact of an Asteri dying. Like an archangel's death, but worse. Another Asteri must be going down. 
He willed that lovely, bright power to keep healing Kedos, though, to use the stretch of time to buy more of it for the mare, to heal, heal, heal. It was eternity, and yet it was nothing. Time resumed so fast that the boys lost their grip on Therian, but the wound had healed over. Rune grunted as he hoisted the unconscious mare over a shoulder and said to the boys, We gotta get out of here. Half of him wanted to dump the twins somewhere safe and race to wherever Lydia was, but his mate had asked him to protect the two most precious people in her world. He wouldn't break a gesture of trust so great, not for anything. They tore through the palace, its halls eerily empty. People must have gotten the evacuation order and fled. The guards had even left their stations at the doors and the front gates. Rune and the boys made it into the city streets, and Rune reached for his phone to dial Flynn, praying the mail had the van nearby. Only then did he get a look at the battlefield beyond the city, the cloud of darkness above the glowing lights. That darkness was pure pit. Fires blazed on the other side of the field. That had to be Lydia. Rune! He knew that voice. He turned. Therian a limp weight on his shoulder, and found Ethan Holstrom sprinting toward them, a rifle over his shoulder. He knew that rifle, too, the Godslayer rifle. Ethan's face was splattered with dirt and blood, like he'd fought his way up here. Is Kedos alive? At Rune's nod, Ethan asked, Where's Bryce? As if in answer, light flared from the palace above and behind them. Rune's blood turned to ice. We told her and Athelar to meet us, but it was a trap. Fuck. I need to get to Bryce, Ethan said urgently. Rune pointed to the palace and couldn't find the words, any words, to say that the wolf might already be too late. Ace and Bran looked up at him, at the palace, at the battlefield. His charges, his to protect through the storm. Run, Rune told Ethan and motioned to the twins. Keep close and follow my lead. Chapter 95 Bryce's breath sawed through her lungs, but she gave herself over to it, to the wind and movement and propulsion of herself and Hunt through the small space as Rigelus launched strike after strike. She was not the scared female she'd been a week ago, running from him down the hall. She knew Thea Starr gave her enough of an edge to keep one step ahead of Rigelus as she teleported again and again and again. They just had to deactivate the core, and then she'd take the sword and knife and go after the Asteri, one by one. Hunt's lightning slammed continuously into the floor, but she and Hunt kept moving so fast that one boom hadn't finished sounding before another began. The sound was monstrous, all-consuming, and the room rained stone and crystal. But in the center of the room, the tunnel of warped, melted crystal was almost complete. Minutes had passed, maybe years. It was a dance, keeping one step ahead of Rigelus, and she knew that it would come to its crashing finale soon enough. Another blow, and the glow of the first light core blazed, casting Rigelus's furious face in stark relief. Bryce teleported them away, but it was slower, too slow. Rigelus snapped his power at them. A wall like burning acid sent them careening into the stairwell, and Bryce knew only Hunt's lightning kept it from being fatal. She rallied her power to teleport, but it sputtered out. Perhaps you should not have expended so much of your strength against Polaris, Rigelus smirked and lifted his gleaming hand. It was a choice of death or survival. Bryce teleported herself and Hunt, but not to the center of the room. They crashed to the floor a level above, clear of the core. One more strike, Hunt was shouting. Bryce, one more fucking strike and we're through. Bryce's knees buckled and her head swam. Her power had dissolved into stardust in her veins. Hunt caught her as she swayed. Bryce. Her nose stung. She could taste the blood in her mouth, metallic and sharp. Fuck, Hunt hissed and grabbed her face in his hands. Bryce, look at me. It took effort, 
too much effort. I'm sorry, she panted, and the words were barely a rasp. I'm sorry. All that power she'd attained. What good had it done? And what good would having the star sword and the knife be if she had no starlight left to unite them? One more, Bryce, Hunt said, breathing hard. Blood leaked from his own nostrils. The cost of all that power without cease. Just one more blow. I can feel it. Okay, she said. Okay. They had to get back down there before Rigelus could find some way to repair the damage they'd done. Okay, she said again, but her power wouldn't rally. She looked to Hunt. A boost? From the concern in his eyes, she knew he didn't have much left either. But his lightning sparked, a crown about his head, making a primal god of him. Rather than strike her with his hellfire, he hauled her to him and kissed her. Lightning flowed from him into her, a living river of song and power. She pulled back, panting hard, and it hadn't been much, but it was there. It was enough. Stop! called an exhausted male voice from down the hall. And though she'd leapt between worlds and ended archangels and Asteri, nothing had prepared her to see Ethan Holstrom racing down the palace hallway with the Godslayer rifle slung over his shoulder. Hunt had no energy left to dwell on the fact that Holstrom seemed leveled up, older, more powerful somehow, even though he'd just seen the wolf. He didn't fucking care about any of it, as the wolf reached them and said to Bryce, I was sent to give you this. He handed her the rifle. With shaking hands, Bryce took it. Jessiba gave it to you? No, I mean, yes, but... Ethan's eyes were wide. There's a bullet in there, full of the second light of the dead of Crescent City. Connor gave it to me. For you. Connor! Bryce swayed again, and Hunt caught her. There's no time to explain, Ethan said, but the dead sent me to give you that rifle and that bullet. Ethan's eyes shone bright. Connor said to make it count, Bryce. Bryce looked down at the rifle in her hands, weighing it. Hunt asked, What use is one bullet of second light against an Asteri? Not against an Asteri, Bryce said. That bullet is a second light bomb. Ethan nodded apparently getting what she meant more than Hunt did. I don't have enough strength to teleport both of us back to the core, Bryce said, and took Hunt's hand. She pressed something cold into it. Her words struck, and Hunt spat, Fuck that. His temper flared. Fuck that, Bryce. Let's go blast that monster to hell. Get out of the palace, Bryce warned, and teleported, alone, taking the Godslayer rifle with her, and leaving the mask in Hunt's hand. She had one shot. Last time, Lahaba had bought her the two seconds it cost to line up that shot. This time, there was no fire sprite to save her, no synth to fuel her, only training that Randall had hammered into her over the years. She sent a silent prayer of thanks to him, one shot, straight down into the tunnel that Hunt had made, to blast apart the last of the crystal around the core and release all that first light. She knew what lining up the shot would cost her, knew that in the second it took to aim, Rigelus would launch his power at her, and there would be no wall of Hunt's lightning to keep it at bay. Bryce savored the whipping wild wind around her as she teleported, one last time, propelling herself through the world. She lifted the rifle to her shoulder, clicking off the safety, and then she was there in the core room, debris and crystal everywhere, her rifle already aimed at the hole in the center. But Rigelus was not alone. The three other remaining Asteri now stood with him, the four of them a solid wall between Bryce and the First Light Core. At least another one was dead, if the slowing of the world a few minutes ago was any indication. But four remained. Bryce's finger stalled on the trigger. To waste the bullet on them. Don't you want to know what you risk? Before you act so recklessly, Rigelus said smugly, he didn't wait for her to answer. You destroy the first light core, 
and you destroy Midgard itself. Chapter 96 Bryce didn't lower the Godslayer rifle. She kept it aimed at the Asteri's feet, at the hole just behind them. To get close enough, she'd have to teleport right to them and fire straight into the hole. That core is tied to Midgard's very soul, Rigelus said. You destroy it, and this entire planet will wink out of existence. Bryce's blood chilled. She might have called bullshit, had it not been for Vesperus's claims about the cauldron. You made the core a kill switch for this world, Bryce breathed. The Asteri to Rigelus's left, Eosphorus, the morning star, sneered. To prevent rodents like you from getting any ideas about destroying us. Our fate, Rigelus said to Bryce, folding his hands in front of him almost beatifically is tied to that of this planet. You kill our source of nourishment, and you doom every living soul on Midgard as well. And if I call your bluff, Bryce demanded, buying whatever time she could to sort out all she'd heard and witnessed and endured, then a darkness like none you have ever known shall devour this planet, and you will all cease to exist said the Asteri to Rigelus's right, Hesperus, the evening star. So you'd rather die, Bryce said, than see any of us freed from you? If we are denied our food, then we shall die. There is no purpose to your existence if not to sustain us. You are chattel. You're fucking delusional, Bryce kept the rifle aimed at their feet. How about I kill all of you and leave the core here? How about that? You'd have to get close enough with those blades to do so, girl. Eosphorus sneered, death in her eyes as she glanced to the star sword at Bryce's back, to Truth Teller sheathed at her side. We shall not make Polaris's mistake. They were right. Bryce knew that if she set down the gun, if she drew the blades, well... They'd kill her so fast she probably wouldn't be able to draw the weapons in time. Think very carefully, Bryce Quinlan, Rigelus said, stepping forward with his hands raised. One bullet from you into the core, and this world and all its innocence will be sucked into a void with no end. The same void that Apollyon had claimed allowed him to devour the Asteri? Polaris's body had been sucked into nothing. You seemed so outraged in your little video, Rigelus purred, at the deaths of those innocents in Asphodel Meadows. But what are a few hundred children compared to the millions you damn by firing that bullet? A void with no end. Kill her, brother, hissed the fourth Asteri, Ostris, glowing with power. Kill her, and let us return to battle the princes before they find us down here. What will it be, Bryce Quinlan? Rigelus asked, extending a hand. You have my word that if you do not fire that bullet, you and yours shall go free, and remain so. The other Asteri whirled on him, outraged. I can teach you things you've never even dreamed of, Rigelus promised. The language inked on your back. It is our language, from our homeworld. I can teach you how to wield it. Any world might be open to you, Bryce Quinlan. Name the world, and it shall be yours. I only want this world to be free of you, Bryce said through her teeth, forever. One of the Asteri began, How dare you speak to? But Rigelus interrupted, attention only on Bryce. That, too, might be possible. A Midgard of your imagining. He smiled, so earnestly she almost believed him. Yours will be a life of comfort.
I shall set you up as a true queen, not only of the Fay, but of all Valbara. No more governors, no more angelic hierarchies, if that is what you and Athalar wish. If you desire the dead to be freed, then we shall find a way around death, too. They were always simply desert to us. Desert, Bryce said, hands shaking with anger. She gripped the rifle tighter. The second light shall be the dead's to keep, Rigelus went on. But Bryce said, a familiar white haze of pure rage creeping over her vision. They're not desert. They're people. People the inhabitants of this planet knew and loved. A poor choice of words, Rigelus acknowledged, and I apologize. But what you wish, you shall have. And if you desire to... Enough of this catering to vermin, Eosphorus snapped. She dies. I don't think so. Bryce said, and teleported directly to the Asteri, right to the hole in the floor that Hunt had made. I think it's your turn for that. She fired the Godslayer rifle into the First Light core. The Asteri screamed, and time dripped by as the bullet fired from the rifle, slow enough that Bryce could see the writing on its side. Memento Mori. Powered by the souls of the dead, of Connor and the pack of devils, and so many more. The dead sacrificing for the sake of the living. The dead yielding eternity so Midgard might be free. The bullet spiraled downward, into the light, toward that final crystal barrier. Rigelus lunged for her, his hands incandescent with uncut power. Once he touched her, she'd be dead. And maybe this was what Danica had planned all along, in putting the horn in her, wanting her to claim that other piece of Thea star from a Valen. Maybe this was what Erd had planned for her, had whispered she might do, ever since she had accessed her power, or what Hell had imagined she and Hunt might one day do. She wished she had had a bit more time with Hunt, with her parents and friends, a bit more time to savor the sun and the sky, and the sea, to listen to music, all the music she could ever hear, to dance, just one more step or spin. Rigelus was still reaching for her arm with his bright hands, the bullet was still spiraling, and as that bullet of second light smashed through that final layer of crystal, as it tunneled down and down, Bryce wished she'd had more time, but she didn't. And if this was the time that she had been given, she'd make it count. I believe it all happened for a reason. I believe it wasn't for nothing. From far away, the words she'd spoken at the gate the previous spring echoed. All that had happened had been for this. Not for her, but for Midgard. For the safety and future of all worlds. And as the bullet erupted in the first light core, as Rigelus's hand wrapped around her wrist, and pure acid burned her skin and bones where he touched her, like the battery she was, she grabbed his power, sucked it into herself. Light met light. And yet, Rigelus's starlight wasn't light at all. It was power, yes, but it was first light. It was the power of Midgard, of the people. It flowed into her, so much power that it nearly knocked the breath out of her lungs. Time slowed further, and still she seized more of Rigelus's power. His power indicator on the wall plummeted. Rigelus reeled back, releasing her, either in pain or rage or fear she didn't know. His light was not his own. His light had been stolen from the people of Midgard. He was a living gate, storing that power. And just as she'd taken it from the gates this spring, just as it had fueled her ascent, fueled her own power to new levels, now it became hers. Without the first light, without the people of Midgard and every other planet they'd bled dry, without the power of the people, these Asteri fuckers were nothing. And with that knowledge, that undeniable truth, Bryce sent all that power through the horn in her back. Right as the core ruptured, 
Midgard's kill switch flipped on. Mere feet away, the world began to cave in, sucking itself inward, obliterating everything. Bryce willed it, and the horn obeyed. A portal opened, right in front of the core and the dark dot that was emerging from it, vacuuming in all life. Bryce sent the core, that lifeless growing dot, through her portal. The Asteri screamed again and didn't stop, like they knew she'd conjured her own kill switch. A thought, and Bryce widened her portal enough that it sucked in the Asteri, their screams vanishing as they went. Rigelus and his bright hands were now a dim glow, still reaching for Midgard, clinging to it as he was pulled in. Bryce had a heartbeat to take in what, where she'd opened a portal to. A black, airless place, dotted with small, distant stars. A heartbeat, and then she was yanked in, too, straight to deep space. Chapter 97 The Asteri's crystal palace was collapsing. Near the city walls, a crack and boom hollowed out Rune's ears, rocking through him, he looked back over his shoulder to see the palace's towers begin to sway and topple. Bryce, he gasped out. Therian, now awake and walking gingerly, halted, the twins who'd been helping him along, pausing with him. The entire world halted as a shudder went through it, as light ruptured from below the palace. A great force, like a whirlpool sucking them in, 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 began pulling at their edges. Run, Therian breathed, sensing it too. Nodding, Rune grabbed both boys by the hand. They raced the last few blocks to the city gates, Therian struggling to keep up. Even as Rune felt that tug toward the collapsing palace, and knew there would be no escaping. Bryce had left him. She had left him, and teleported down to those monsters alone. Hunt hadn't made it far, Holstrom on his heels, before that boom had rocked the palace, and the skies had opened up above somehow, and the palace was collapsing down, down, down. It was a choice between letting Holstrom die, or keep trying to make it to Bryce. And because he knew his mate would never forgive him if he abandoned Ethan, Hunt grabbed the wolf and launched into the air, dodging falling blocks of crystal and stone and metal, he had no idea where they landed, only that it was on the rim of a giant crater that had not been there before. It reminded him of the news footage he'd seen of what remained of Asphodel Meadows. He could only wonder if Bryce had done so intentionally. But as Hunt shook the blood and dust from his eyes, he saw what lay at the crater's heart. A gaping void. Stars beyond it. The force of the void yanked him inward, tugged him toward it, Go, he ordered Holstrom. Get as many people as you can out of the way. Because on the other side of the portal that Bryce had somehow opened into the stars, there was a wall of impenetrable darkness. Hunt could just make out the glowing figures being sucked toward it. Bryce had opened a black hole in the middle of Midgard. Had she done it with the blades, or had the joining of the Star Sword and Truth Teller merely given her the idea of how she might capture all the Asteri at once, rather than picking them off individually? It didn't matter. Nothing mattered, because there was a fucking black hole on the other side of that portal, and the force of it was so strong that this side of the portal was being sucked toward it, too. But that didn't matter either. Because there, among those glowing lights of the Asteri, that was Bryce's starlight, and she was headed to that black hole as well. Bryce knew she should be dead. There was no air here, no warmth. Maybe it was the horn in her flesh, the made essence of her that kept her alive, just enough. It had been a gamble, but she'd seen what the Star Sword and Truth Teller had done to Polaris— they had created a void that had sucked the Asteri in, the only sort of prison that might destroy a being of light. The only force in the universe that ate light, so strong no light could ever escape it. A portal to nowhere. To a black hole. Wasn't that the unholy power that Apollyon possessed? The power of the void. The antithesis of light. 
The only thing that could kill a planet in one bite, destroy the Asteri, and Midgard with them. The Asteri knew it as well. They'd always known it, and employed it for their kill switch, to be activated upon destruction of the First Light Core. So she'd met their black hole with one of her own, a bigger one, a black hole, a void to eat other black holes. Because Bryce couldn't let that happen to Midgard. She'd opened her portal to her black hole only wide enough for those who were right next to the core to be sucked in with it. And now she was here, careening through space with the Asteri. Light poured from the glowing beings around her, their screams silenced from lack of air. Behind her, the only light snuck in through a sliver she'd left behind. A sliver she still needed to close. One small window to Midgard. She couldn't bring herself to do it. Not yet. She let herself look at that sliver of light, of blue sky. The last trace of home. I believe it all happened for a reason. I believe it wasn't for nothing. Ahead of the Asteri was the glowing mass that was the first light core, the black growing hole in the heart of it. The light stretched and bent as it was pulled into the yawning maw of the larger black hole, and then was gone. Not one trace of it remained. No more kill switch, no more first light. Midgard was free of them. That sliver of light thinned further. It was now too far for her to reach. She had no way of getting back to the portal, no way of propelling herself there. There was just this, the slow drift toward the event horizon of the black hole, the inevitable crushing end. Ahead of her, the first two Asteri, Hesperus and Eosphorus, were nearing that line of no return. They were clawing at nothing, trying to find any sort of purchase in the emptiness of space to haul them away from the yawning mouth of the black hole. But their glowing fingers found nothing at all as they slid over that line and vanished. Time slowed for a heartbeat, only one, time dragging, dragging, and then resumed. Their deaths had been fast, a swift swallow. I believe it all happened for a reason. I believe it wasn't for nothing. Rigelus and Ostris were next, but the two were clinging to each other. No, she saw all at once. It was Ostris who was clinging, frantic as a drowning person, and Rigelus was trying to pry himself free, blasting his fellow Asteri with remnants of power that Ostris absorbed. Perhaps if she hadn't drained Rigelus to the dregs, he might have succeeded. The bright hand seemed to realize it, too. Decided on a different route to free himself, because he got his feet up between them and kicked. Ostris went tumbling back, straight for the event horizon. His screams made no sound. Time slowed and shuddered as the black hole devoured him, too. And then there was only Rigelus, still glowing, but weakly. That kick he'd given Ostris had propelled him toward Bryce. There was nothing she could do to escape him, no way to paddle out of his range. Rigelus's expression revealed undiluted hate as he collided with her, as they spun out through space with no meaning to up or down, and whatever protection the horn gave her seemed to buckle in the Asteri's presence. The horn would bow to its maker, its master. She needed air. She needed air. Bryce shoved at him, freeing a bit of space between their bodies. Not severing contact, but enough that the horn's protection snapped back into place, and she could breathe. Rigelus was speaking, shouting in her face, but no words reached her. There was no sound in space. But loathing twisted his face, and she knew he beheld the same in hers as she sucked in a breath. Her last, she knew. She'd make it count, too. Bryce grabbed his scrawny torso and wrapped her arms, then her legs around it. Rigelus had a one-way ticket for that black hole. She'd make sure of it, even if she went with him. Chapter 98 
his umbra mortis helmet discarded in the rubble beside him, Hunt stared at the giant dark thing that had appeared in the center of the city and was slowly devouring everything around it. Bryce was in that hole. A dark wind whipped at Hunt's hair, and he knew without looking who had arrived at his side. I told her to choose to live, Adis murmured sadly, gazing toward the starry black expanse. She wouldn't be Bryce if she had chosen herself, Hunt said hoarsely. He wouldn't love her this much if she wasn't the sort of person who would have jumped in. We have to help her he growled, wings braced against the tug of the black hole trying to pull all of Midgard in with it. There's nothing that can be done, Adis said, his voice full of sorrow. I have to try. Hunt's knees bent, his wings spread, preparing himself for that leap into space, to Bryce and that eternal wall of black beyond where his mate glowed. You go in there and you will die, Adis said. There is no air to propel you, nothing for your wings to grasp onto to carry you forward to her. You will drift, and she will still wind up with Rigelus in the void, and you will follow her in, helpless, a few minutes later. But she left the portal open, Hunt said, to Midgard. Adis turned those weary eyes to him. I believe it shall shut when she and the horn in her back are obliterated. She left it open to come home, Hunt snarled. He studied the mask in his hands. She'd left it with him. Why? He'd have no ability to get it back to the Fae in their home world. Hell, he couldn't even wield the damn thing. He wasn't made. He couldn't command it. She is likely already dead from lack of oxygen, Ada said softly. I'm sorry, I don't accept that for one minute, Hunt raged. I refuse to accept that. Then go die with her, Ada said, not unkindly. If that's your wish, then do so now. She and Rigelus already approach the void's edge. Hunt studied the mask again. Bryce did nothing without a reason. She had left him with the mask, knowing she was headed to her death. She'd left it with her mate— her mate, who had a little bit of her maid essence in him thanks to their lovemaking last night, which might make him capable of wielding it for just long enough. She had given everything for Midgard, for him. That day last spring, when all hope had been lost, she had made the drop alone, to save him and to save the city, and she had done it from pure love. She had done it without expecting to come back just as she must have jumped through this portal suspecting she'd never return. Demons were spilling into the streets, and the Asterian guard was still fighting, unaware that their remaining masters were headed toward obliteration. The mech suits of the fallen and their enemies clashed. Bryce had gone into death itself for him that day in the spring. Hunt could do no less for her. Athelaw. Ada said, as he gazed at the hole in the world. It is done. Come, we must finish this. Even with the Asteri gone, there are other battles to fight before the day is won. The words might have sunk in then, the Asteri gone, but the ground shook behind him. Hunt turned. A mech suit stood there, towering over him. No pilot. This was one of the fallen. The glowing green eyes shifted between him and the hole in the universe, the small bit of light drifting, drifting toward that infinite darkness. The mech suit held out a hand, and Hunt knew. He knew which of the fallen controlled this suit, whose soul had come to offer a hand, to help him do the impossible. Shahar, he said, tears falling. The mech suit, the archangel's soul within it, inclined its head, Adis took a step back, as if surprised. In the streets, the other suits halted, fell to their knees, bowing. Hunt could feel them, the souls of the fallen, swarming around him, around the suit. But Shahar simply knelt before Hunt and opened the pilot's door. His wings might not work in space, but the propulsion from the suit's weapons would.
Hunt didn't hesitate. He climbed in, wings furled tight in the small interior, and yanked the metal door shut. Thank you, he said to the archangel, to the fallen he now felt pressing around him. He'd once been forced to take mech suits apart on the battlefield to help Shahar's sister destroy humans. Now this one would help him save a life, the life that mattered to him more than any other. Hunt didn't look at Adis, at the collapsed palace sending debris skittering toward the portal, the black hole so enormous its pole threatened to drag them all in. Hunt just stared directly at the void as he began running, suit thundering around him, straight for that portal, and leapt in after his mate. It was too far. Not for the suit, whose blasts of power sent Hunt careening toward Bryce and Rigelis, but for the oxygen systems. They screamed at him on the screens, flashing red. Air became thin. His lungs ached. Hunt did the only thing he could think to do. He slid the mask onto his face. To escape death, he'd don its trappings, the umbra mortis in truth. The mask ripped apart his soul. Life and death, that was all that space, the universe, really was. But that chasm yawning wide, so close to Bryce and Rigelis, that was death incarnate. They were struggling, he could see that now, light flaring between them, rippling into nothing, both trying to get away from the other, to blast away. There was only one brimstone missile left in the suit. Hunt took aim toward his mate and Rigelis. They were moving too swiftly, too closely. To shoot one would be to shoot the other. He could have sworn a light, ghostly hand guided his to the release button. She'll get thrown in too, Hunt whispered to Shahar. That ghostly hand pressed, lightly, as if it was all she could manage, on his hand, on the button, as if to say, fire. And the gods had never done him any favors, Erd had certainly never helped him, yet maybe they had. Maybe that day he'd first met Bryce, the gods had sent him there, not to be some instrument of hell, but because Erd knew that there would be a female who would be kind and selfless and brave, who would give everything for her city, for her planet, and that she would need someone to give everything back to her. Bryce had given him a life, and a beautiful one, he didn't need all the photo evidence that had streamed in front of his face when he'd been in the Comidium's holding cell to realize it. She had brought joy and laughter and love, had pried him free of that cold, dark existence, and pulled him into the light, her light. He wouldn't let it be extinguished. So Hunt pushed the missile launch button. One push, and it blasted from the shoulder panel on the mech suit— and as it left the suit, spiraling through space, golden with all that angelic wrath, he felt Shahar leave with it. Could have sworn he saw great shining wings wrap around that missile as it spiraled through space, straight for Bryce and Rigelis. The Fallen's cause ended at last with this final blow. Bryce and Rigelis halted their struggle at the glowing missile's approach, and Hunt knew it was Shahar. It was every one of the fallen. It was all who'd stood against the Asteri, who guided that missile for a direct hit into Rigelis's face. It didn't explode. It launched him away from Bryce, the bright hand now tumbling for the event horizon, the missile with him. And Bryce was free, drifting, but still too close to the edge. Using the suit's precious cache of firepower for momentum, Hunt propelled himself forward, racing through space for his mate, his wife, his love. The missile and Rigelis crossed the event horizon. Time slowed. It stretched and rippled as a flare of light plumed, either Rigelis or the erupting missile, Shahar and the Fallen's cause vanishing with it into darkness. And then Bryce was before him, her hair floating like she was underwater, face crusted, frozen, unconscious. The mask said a different word, but he ignored it, ignored it and reached and reached, time still so fucking slow. 
The metal hands of the suit wrapped around her waist just as time resumed. He deployed the remaining small artillery and blasted toward home, toward the portal, now beginning to slide shut. It could only mean one thing. The mask had been trying to tell him, but he refused to believe it. He wouldn't believe it for one second. But the portal was closing, getting smaller and smaller, and a glowing black figure filled it. Then another, Adis and Apollyon. Their power grabbed the edges of the portal and held it a little wider, held it open a moment longer. And with what little strength he had left, Hunt threw a desperate, raging, blazing hot rope of lightning toward Apollyon, the only being on Midgard who could handle his power. Apollyon caught it in that humanoid form once more and pulled. Adis flared with black light, pushing back against the ceiling portal, against Erd's wishes. Hunt was close enough to see the prince's strained faces, Apollyon's teeth flashing, as he dragged Hunt by his lightning, inch by inch, closer and closer. Adis was sweating, panting as he fought to keep the portal open. And then Rune was there, starlight flaring, pushing back against the impossible. Lydia was beside him, crackling with fire. Therian, Holstrom, Flynn and Deck, a fire sprite, her small body bright with flame, Isaiah and Naomi. So many hands, so many powers, from almost every house. The friends they'd made were what mattered in the end, not the enemies. Through love, all is possible. It was love that was holding the portal open, that held it open until the very end, until Hunt and Bryce were through, crashing into the dirt of Midgard, the blue sky filling his sight, and all that beautiful air filling his lungs. The portal shut, sealing the black hole and all of space behind it. The Asteri were gone. Hunt was out of the mech suit in a heartbeat, shattering the metal panel, swinging down to where Bryce lay on the ground. She wasn't moving, wasn't breathing, and he finally let the mask say the word he'd been ignoring since he'd grabbed her in the depths of space. Dead. Chapter 99 It was too long, Declan was saying, as Hunt worked on Bryce's heart, his lightning slamming into her over and over, she was without oxygen for too long, even for Vanir. There's nothing my healing magic can do if she's already. Hunt blasted his lightning into her chest again. Bryce arced off the ground, but her heart didn't start beating. Their friends were gathered around them, shadows to his grief, this unfathomable pain. Get up, he willed the mask, willed her. Get the fuck up. But it did not respond. Like one final fuck you, the mask tumbled off his face, as if her made essence had faded from him with her death. Bryce, he ordered, voice cracking. This wasn't happening. This couldn't be happening to him, not when they'd been so close. Blessed Luna, so bright in the sky, Flynn whispered. Spare your daughter. No prayers, Hunt growled. No fucking prayers. She couldn't be dead. She had fought so hard and done so much. Hunt crashed his lightning into her heart again. It had worked before. That day of the demon attack in the spring, he'd brought her back to life. But her heart did not answer this time. Rigelus had used his god's damned lightning to resurrect the harpy. Why the fuck didn't it work now? What had Rigelus known about Hunt's own power that Hunt didn't? Do something, Hunt snarled up at Apollyon and Adis. You've got a black hole in your fucking mouth. You've got all the power in the galaxy, he spat at the prince of the pit. Save her. I cannot, Apollyon said, and Hunt had never hated anything more than he hated the grief in the prince's eyes, the tears on Adis's face. We do not have such gifts. Then find Thanatos, Rune ordered. He goes around calling himself the prince of souls or whatever bullshit. Find him and... He cannot save her either, Ada said softly. None of us can. Hunt looked down at his mate, so still and cold and lifeless. 
The scream that came out of him shook the very world. There was nothing but that scream, and the emptiness where she had been, where the life they were supposed to have had together should have been. And when his breath ran out, he was just... done. There was nothing left, and what the fuck was the point of it all if... A gentle hand touched his shoulder. I might be able to try something, said a female voice. Hunt looked up to find Hypaxia Enidor somehow standing beside him, the bone crown of the house of flame and shadow atop her shining black curls. His sister was gone. Rune looked at Bryce's face and knew she was dead. Beyond dead. He had no sound in his mind. Lydia stood beside him, her hand in his, her sons behind them. The boys had been the ones who'd convinced him to come back, had refused to go another step until they helped in some way. But none of it had made a difference. Even Athelar's lightning hadn't revived Bryce. And then Hypaxia had stepped forward, wearing that crown of bones. Somehow she was now the head of the House of Flame and Shadow, offering to help. She'll never forgive me if you raise her into some shadow of herself, Hunt said voice strained with tears, with his screams. I'm not proposing to raise her, Hypaxia assured him. Hunt dragged his hands through his hair. She doesn't have a soul. I mean, she does, but she sold it to the Underking, so if that's what you need, then you're shit out of luck. The Underking is gone, Hypaxia said. Rune's knees wobbled. Any bargains he made with the living or the dead are now null and void, Bryce's soul is hers to do with as she wills. Please, help her, Rune blurted, desperate. Help her if you can. Hypaxia met his eyes, then looked to Lydia beside him, their hands linked. She smiled. Athelar whispered, Anything. Whatever you need. I'll give anything. The witch looked down at Bryce and said to Athelar, Not a sacrifice, a trade. She beckoned behind her, summoning Jessiba Roga to her side. Hunt stared at the sorceress, but Roga was only gazing at Bryce. Oh, Quinlan, Roga said, and there were tears gathering on her lashes. Priestess, Apollyon hissed, and Roga lifted eyes brimming with disdain and disgust to the Prince of the Pit. Still wondering if I'm going to do anything with those books, Roga snapped at Apollyon. She pointed to Bryce, dead on the ground. Don't you think if they had some power, I'd be using it right now to save that girl? Apollyon glowered at her. You're a born liar, priestess. We don't have much time, Hypaxia interrupted, and even the Prince of the Pit halted at the command in her voice. We need to act before too much damage is done to her body. Please, Rune rasped, just explain. I know you said we didn't need to, but if we can offer something... It is for me to offer, Jessiba said, and looked down again at Bryce. Tears covered the sorceress's cheeks. Priestess, Apollyon had called her. To offer what? Lydia asked. My life. Roga said, my long, wicked life. She raised her eyes to Apollyon again. That is not possible, Apollyon said. You cursed me, Jessiba said, and as puzzled as Hunt was, he couldn't bring himself to interrupt. You cursed me to immortality. Now I'm making it a gift, the gift of a Vanir's long life. I give it freely to Bryce Quinlan, if she wants it. Apollyon snapped, that curse is for the living. Then it is a good thing I have a way with the dead, Hypaxia declared. Perhaps for the first time in his existence, Apollyon looked surprised. Adis asked, is, is such a thing possible? Hunt said, I offer my life then. What would be the point? Jessiba said, laughing harshly. Save her, only to be dead yourself. You, you'll die, Rune blurted. Jessiba smiled softly. After 15,000 years, I've had my fill of Midgard. 
We must do it now, Hypaxia said. I can feel her thinning. Hunt didn't like that word one bit, so he said to Jessiba, Thank you. I never knew that Quinlan, that she meant anything to you. Jessiba's brows rose, and a bit of the prickly sorceress he knew returned. Of course she does. Do you know how hard it is to find a competent assistant? Hunt was beyond laughter, though. Thank you, he said again. I... I hope you find peace. Jessica's face bloomed in a smile, and it was perhaps the first true one he'd ever seen from her. I've already found it, Athalar, thanks to you both. With a nod to him and Bryce, she walked up to Hypaxia and offered her hand. Lead the house of flame and shadow back to the light, she said to the witch, who bowed her head. None of them dared speak as Hypaxia began to chant. This place was the opposite of where she'd gone during the drop. Rather than an endless chasm, it was just light. Soft, golden light, gentle and easy on the gaze. It was warm and restful, and she had nowhere else she really wanted to be except... Except... Bryce looked behind her. More light glowed in that direction. Looking for the exit, said a dry female voice. It's that way. Bryce turned, and Jessiba was there. The golden light rippled and faded, and they stood upon a green hill in a lush, gentle land. The land she'd glimpsed that day after the attack in the spring, when she had believed Connor and the pack of devils had been safe and protected in the bone quarter. It was real. Quinlan, she turned to Jessiba. Are we dead? Yes. Did the others? Alive, though the Asteri are not. A wry nod. Thanks to you. Bryce smiled and felt it beam through her. Good. Good. She breathed in a lungful of the sweet, fresh air, noted the tang of salt, a hint of sea nearby. Quinlan, Jessiba said again. You have to go back. Bryce angled her head. What do you mean? To life, Jessica said, irritable as always. Why else do you think I'm here? I traded my life for yours. Bryce blinked. What? Why? Holstrom can fill you in on the particulars of my existence. But let's just say... Jessica walked up to her and took her hand. That Arcesian amulet isn't merely for protection against my books or against demons. It's a link to Midgard itself. Bryce glanced down at her chest, the slender gold chain and delicate knot of circles dangling from it. I don't understand. The amulets first belonged to the librarian priestesses of Parthos. Each was imbued with Midgard's innate magic, the very oldest. The sword every world has, for those who know where to look. So? So... I think Midgard knows what you did, in whatever way a planet can be sentient. How you freed a Valen, not because you wanted to claim the land for yourself, but because you believed it was right. At Bryce's surprised expression, Jessica said, Come, Quinlan, I know how ridiculously soft-hearted you can be. The words were dry, but her face was soft. What does that have to do with... Bryce gestured around them. All this, as thanks for what you did for Midgard, we are being allowed this trade, as it were. Bryce blinked, still not getting it. A trade? Jessica plowed ahead, ignoring her question. The Parthos books are yours now. Protect them, cherish them, share them with the world. Bryce stammered. How can you possibly, and why would you possibly... A hundred thousand humans marched at Parthos to save the books, to save their centuries of knowledge from the Asteri. They all knew they wouldn't walk away. I had to run that day. To protect the books, I ran from my friends and my family, who fought to buy me time. Her eyes gleamed. You went into that portal today knowing you wouldn't walk away either.
I can offer now what I couldn't then, all those years ago. My family and friends are long gone, but I know they'd want to offer this to you too, as our own thanks for freeing our world. Bryce reeled. Jessiba had been at Parthos when it fell? The books are yours, Jessiba said again, and so is the gallery's collection. The paperwork's done. But how did you know I'd wind up? You've got one of the worst self-sacrificing streaks I've ever encountered, Jessiba said. I had a feeling an intervention might be needed here today. She peered up at the blue sky and smiled to herself. Go home, Bryce. This will all be here when you're ready. My soul free. The Underking is dead. Again, Holstrom will fill you in. Bryce's eyes stung. I don't... I don't understand. I was happy to give my life. Well, not happy, but willing. I know, Jessiba said and squeezed her hand. That's why I'm here. She gestured behind Bryce, where a crystal doorway, reminiscent of Crescent City's gates, now glowed. The angel is waiting for you, Quinlan. The angel. Hunt. The thing she'd left behind. The thing that she'd been looking for. The reason she'd hesitated. This will all be here when you're ready, Jessiba repeated, then motioned to the green hills beyond. We'll all be here when you're ready. Far out, on a distant hill, stood seven figures. Bryce knew them by shape, knew them by their heights and the glow around them. She picked out Connor standing tall at the back, and standing at their front, a hand upraised. Bryce began crying, and it was pure joy and love that burst from her, as she lifted a hand in greeting toward Danica. Danica, here, with everyone, safe and loved, she heard the words on the wind, carried from her friend's soul to hers. Light it up, Bryce. And Bryce was laughing, laughing and sobbing, as she yelled back across the lush plain and hills, Light it up, Danica! Wolfish laughter flowed to her, and then there was a spark of light by Danica's shoulder, and Bryce knew that fire. She blew a kiss to Lahaba. Through her tears, she turned back to Jessiba, how? The second light? It took their power. But what is eternal? What is made of love? That can never be destroyed. Bryce stared at her in wonder. Jessiba laughed. And that's about as sentimental as I'll ever get, even here. She gave Bryce a nudge toward the crystal archway. Live your life, Quinlan, and live it well. Bryce nodded and hugged Jessiba, conveying all that was in her heart. Jessiba hugged her back, first awkwardly, then wholeheartedly. And as Bryce hugged her, she looked one more time toward the hill where Danica and Lahaba and Connor and the pack of devils had waved. But they were already gone, off to enjoy the wonders and peace of this place. It filled her heart with joy to know it. So Bryce turned from Jessiba, from what awaited them, all of them, and walked back toward the archway, toward life, toward hunt. Chapter 100 Bryce opened her eyes. There were a lot of people standing over her. Most of them were crying. This, she groaned, is like some fucked up version of attending your own sailing. Everyone was gaping at her, and Hunt, he was real, he was right there, and the shock on his face was so genuine that Bryce just laughed. The Asteri were gone, and with them, their first light, second light, their prison of an afterlife, and those she'd loved and lost, they were safe too. All of Danica's work, fulfilled. Bryce looked from Hunt to Ethan, also hovering over her, and gave the wolf a long, assessing look. Who died and made you prime? Ethan gaped at her, but Hypaxia, crowned with bones for fuck's sake, smirked and said, Sabine. And Bryce laughed again. 
What the fuck, Quinlan? Hunt muttered, and she looked back at her mate, whose face was so wan, his eyes so full of wonder. She had the sense of others being there, of Rune and Lydia, and Flynn and Deck and Therian and the Princes of Hell, but they all faded away before Hunt. Bryce lifted a hand to his cheek, wiping away a tear with her thumb. Look at my big, tough alpha hole, she said quietly, but tears thickened her voice, too. How can you joke at a time like this, Hunt said, and Bryce surged forward and kissed him. It was light and love and life. She had a dim awareness of a stirring in the air around them, and Rune saying, Does someone, uh, want to put Jessica's ashes in a cup or something? But Bryce just kissed Hunt, and his arms slid around her, holding her tight to him, like he'd never let go. Hunt allowed Bryce out of his sight only for a few minutes, so he could do this last, final task. Wings of every color and the husks of the mech suits still lay where they'd collapsed hours earlier, instantly crashing to the ground the moment the fallen souls had vacated them. He didn't have any particular suit in mind, but he walked among the field of them, stepping over the bodies of fallen demons and Asterian angels alike, feathers scattered everywhere, and finally halted before a hulking suit, its eyes now darkened. Thanks, he said quietly to the fallen, even if their souls were now gone. Off to the place Bryce claimed they'd all go, in the end. For having my back this one last time. The battlefield beyond the city walls was eerily silent, save for the calls of carrion feeders. But the city behind him was a symphony of sirens and wails and screams, of news helicopters circling, trying to find some way to convey what had happened. Naomi had gone off to meet them, to attempt to establish some semblance of order. We did it, Hunt said, throat thick. At last, we did it. The hierarchies are still here, I guess, but I promise you. He swallowed hard, surveying all the cold, empty metal littering the field around him. It's going to change from here on out. Wings flapped overhead, and then Isaiah was there, wounds already healed beneath the blood crusted on his dark skin. His brow remained wonderfully clear of the halo. Isaiah surveyed the mech suits, the empty eyes, and bowed his head in silent thanks. Wherever they've gone, Isaiah said after a moment, I hope it's the paradise they deserve. It is, Hunt said, and knew it in his heart to be true. He eyed the angel. What's up? Isaiah smiled slightly. I heard you came out here and thought you might want company. You know, someone to brood with. Hunt chuckled. Thanks. I always appreciate a partner in brooding. Isaiah's smile broadened, but his eyes gleamed as he said, So, after all this time, all this suffering, we finally saw the fallen's cause fulfilled. I was just telling them that, Hunt said, gesturing to the empty husks of metal. Isaiah clapped Hunt on the shoulder. Thank you for fighting for us until the end. Your mom would be proud, I think. Really damn proud, Hunt. Hunt didn't have words, so he nodded, swallowing against the tightness in his throat. Where do we go from here, though? I don't know shit about building governments. Do you? No, Isaiah said, but I think we're about to get a crash course. That's not reassuring. Hunt turned back toward the city, it was a shock to his system, as great as a zap of his lightning, to see the familiar skyline without the spires of the Crystal Palace. The Asteri were gone. He needed to get back to Bryce, to hold her, smell her, kiss her. No other reason than that, than the fact that he'd come so, so close to losing her. Hunt, Isaiah said. The white-winged angel's eyes were solemn. You could rule the angels, you know. Hunt blinked slowly. Isaiah went on. 
We'll dismantle the archangels and their schools and the hierarchies, and it'll take years. But in the meantime, we'll need a leader, someone to guide us, rally us, give us courage to turn from the old ways and towards something new, something fair. He folded his wings. That should be you. Twice now, angels had bowed to him. Twice now, they'd given him that acknowledgement and permission. And yeah, with the hellfire in his veins, he could lead, could blast any holdout archangel or faction into submission. But... His phone buzzed, and he pulled it from his pocket to glance down. Bryce gives me magical orgasms, literally, had messaged him. Where are you? I'm having separation anxiety. Get back here! Another buzz, and she added, After you do whatever you need to, I mean. Like, I'm supportive of you taking space for yourself and doing what has to be done. Another buzz, but also get back here right now. Hunt choked on his laugh. He had everything he needed, everything he'd ever want. Don't get your panties in a twist, Quinlan, he answered. I'll be back soon. Then he added, Actually, do me a favor and take your panties off altogether. He didn't wait for her response as he slid his phone into his back pocket and grinned at Isaiah. His friend's eyebrows were high, no doubt surprised that he'd answered texts instead of replying to such a serious suggestion. But Hunt had his answer. He'd had it for some time now. He clapped Isaiah on the shoulder and said, The angels already have a leader to steer them through this, Isaiah. Celestina, not Celestina. He squeezed his friend's shoulder once, then stepped back, wings flapping, readying to carry him to his wife, his mate, his best friend, to the future that awaited them. You. Me, Isaiah said, choking. Athalar! Hunt lifted a few feet off the ground, hovering a beat as the autumn breeze ruffled his wings, his hair, singing of the newness of the world to come. Lead the angels, Isaiah. I'm here if you need me. Hunt! But Hunt shot into the skies, headed for Bryce and whatever tomorrow might bring. Bryce's soul was hers. It had always been hers, she supposed, but it had been on loan. Now that it was fully hers again, there was a whole new world to explore without the Asteri lurking about. A whole new afterlife, when she and Hunt were ready. But not for a long, long time. Not while they still had so much to sort out. There was one task she had to do immediately, though. How Isaiah managed to commandeer a helicopter to fly to Nenya so quickly, Bryce had no idea. But maybe it had something to do with Celestina's pull even from Ephraim's keep. Or maybe it was more about Celestina wanting to impress Hypaxia, who was now, apparently, the head of the House of Flame and Shadow, and who didn't seem opposed to the idea of speaking to Celestina again, if the looks they'd been sneaking each other's ways were any indication. The Ocean Queen and her fleet had brought the witch over here, Hypaxia had intercepted the monarch on her way to beat the shit out of the Asteri for kidnapping Lydia's two sons. The Ocean Queen might be a piece of work, but she stood by her own. And when two children had been kidnapped from her care, she'd shown up prepared to wash the entire city away in their defense. She and her commanders remained in the Eternal City, the threat of the tsunami she held leashed around the perimeter, keeping any Asteri loyalists at bay. At least the ruler seemed too busy with the new world to deal with her petty bullshit with Therian. For now. It was a new world, in almost every sense. Declan was already working with a team on the math of how long Midgard could run on what remained of the first light before it went dark, without new first light being fed into the power grid, before they had to pull out the candles and watch their mobile phones slowly die. Not that they'd have any service once the grids failed. They'd all be back to a Valen-style living. Too bad Morvan wasn't around to enjoy it. But they'd have to figure it out soon whether they wanted to restore the first light power system or try to find an alternate method, 
whether they'd require people to hand over their power, or perhaps tax the uber-powerful, require archangels, who had power in spades, to donate some of their power to the grid. The powerful serving the weak. Or some shit like that. Honestly, Bryce planned to leave it to smarter minds than hers to sort out. Though she had little hope that she wouldn't have to step in to kick some ass before all was said and done. For right now, there was a capital city in chaos, a world turned upside down. Yet she set her sights northward. Bryce found Nesta in the same room the female had been in before, with Ember and Randall, and a handsome, vaguely familiar winged male beside them, who smelled like Nesta's mate, sitting around a table and talking over tea and chocolate cake. Chocolate cake, for fuck's sake. Nesta was instantly on her feet, a long dagger in her hand. The male beside her also reached for a concealed weapon, swift as a thought. But Bryce only gazed at her parents, happy and at home with the fae. Her mom stared back at her like she'd seen a ghost. The teacup she was holding began rattling against its saucer. Hunt spared Ember from guessing at what had passed by saying, The Asteri are gone. Midgard is free. A tear fell from Ember's eye. Bryce didn't think twice before stepping into that world and wrapping her arms around her mother, holding her tight. Ember clasped Bryce's face in her hands. I am so proud to be your mother. Bryce beamed, her own eyes stinging with tears, and Randall leaned in to press a kiss to her head. You did good, kid. Bryce threw her arms around her dad and hugged him too. Hugged the human warrior who had served in the Asteri's armies, shredded apart his soul for them, until her mom had put him back together. Nesta and her mate tensed, and Bryce knew Hunt had stepped into their world. He peered around the room, glanced at the city sparkling far below, a ribbon of river winding through it. They had to be high up on a mountain for this kind of view. Nesta's mate said, You have one minute before Reese gets here and explodes. Oh, Reese will be fine, Cassian, Ember said in the Fae's language. At Bryce's shocked face, Randall said in the same language, It got too hard to mime everything. They gave us that bean thing they offered you. But Bryce shook her head. Resand will be fine? The guy who brings darkness incarnate? He and Randall bonded about being overprotective dads, Ember said. So now, Reese knows exactly the sort of shit you like to pull, which apparently you pulled here, too. Bryce glanced to Nesta, who was watching warily. So Bryce reached into her jacket and pulled out the mask. Here, as promised, everyone fell silent. And then Bryce drew Truth Teller, and Cassian looked like he'd jump between her and Nesta. Hunt set his feet into a fighting stance in response, but Bryce just said, Alpha Holes, and laid the dagger on the table between their tea set and treats. You brought them back. Nesta's voice was quiet. Did you think I wouldn't? I don't know what I thought, Nesta said, but smiled slightly. Poor Nesta's been in the doghouse since you took their weapons and dumped us here, Ember explained. I tried telling Resand and Asriel how there's no stopping you when you've got your mind set on something. And I think Feyre, Resand's mate, believed me. But... Ember glanced at Nesta and winced. I apologize again for my daughter's behavior. I made the choice to give her the mask, Nesta reminded Ember. To Bryce, she added wryly, Your mother somehow doesn't believe that I did so willingly. Bryce rolled her eyes at her mother. Great, thanks for that. She gestured to the portal shimmering behind them. Shall we? Ember smiled softly. They're truly gone, then. Gone, and never to be heard from again, Bryce said, her heart lifting with the words. Ember's eyes gleamed with tears, but she turned, taking Nesta's hands and clenching them tightly in her own.
Despite the fact that my daughter lied and schemed and basically betrayed us, she started. Tell us how you really feel, Mom, Bryce muttered, earning an amused sidelong glance from Nesta. But Ember continued, looking only at Nesta. I am glad of one thing, that I was able to meet you. Nesta's lips pressed into a thin line, and she glanced down at their joined hands. Bryce cut in, if only to spare Nesta from her mom's increasingly weepy-looking expression. Next time I take on intergalactic evil, I'll try to accommodate your bonding schedule. Ember finally looked over at Bryce, glaring. You and I are going to have words when we get home, Bryce Adelaide Quinlan. Leaving Cooper behind like that. I know, Bryce said. She had a lot to answer for on that front, and apologizing to do. Your mother loves you, Nesta said quietly, reading the exasperation on Bryce's face. Don't for one second take that for granted. Bryce could only incline her head to Nesta. I'm lucky, she admitted. I've always been lucky to have her as a mom. Ember really looked like she might cry now, especially as she turned back to Nesta and said, This time with you was a gift, Nesta. It truly was. With that, she pulled Nesta to her in a tight embrace, and Bryce could have sworn something like pain and longing crossed Nesta's expression, like she hadn't experienced a mom hug for a long, long time. So Bryce gave the female some privacy to enjoy every second of that motherly embrace and turned to where Randall and Cassian stood behind them. The males had clasped arms warmly. Thanks, friend, Randall was saying to the warrior, for everything. Cassian grinned, and, well, Bryce could see why Nesta might be into a male who looked like that. Maybe we'll meet again one day, under less strange circumstances. I hope so, Randall said, and as he passed by where Ember and Nesta were still hugging, he clapped the latter on the shoulder with fatherly affection. Bryce's heart swelled to the point of pain as Randall approached Hunt and hugged him too. Hunt returned the embrace, thumping her father on the back before they separated to pass through the portal together. Ember at last pulled away from Nesta, but she gently put a hand to the female's cheek and whispered, You'll find your way, before walking toward the portal. Bryce could have sworn there were tears in Nesta's eyes as her mother stepped back into Midgard. But those tears were gone when Nesta met Bryce's stare, and Cassian, like any good mate, sensed when he wasn't wanted and walked over to the fireplace to pretend to read some sort of old-looking manuscript. Bryce knew that, also like any good mate, if she made one wrong move, he'd rip her to shreds, which was precisely why Hunt had come back into the room and was watching Nesta carefully. Alpha holes, Nesta echoed, eyes gleaming with amusement. Bryce chuckled and drew the star sword, Again, Cassian tensed, but Bryce just offered the blade to Nesta. The female took it, blinking. You said you had an eight-pointed star tattooed on you, Bryce explained, and you found the chamber with the eight-pointed star in the prison, too. Nesta lifted her head. So? So I want you to take the star sword. Bryce held the blade between them. Guidian, whatever you call it here. The age of the Starborn is over on Midgard. It ends with me. I don't understand. But Bryce began backing toward the portal, taking Hunt's hand, and smiled again at the female, at her mate, at their world, as the northern rift began to close. I think that eight-pointed star was tattooed on you for a reason. Take that sword and go figure out why. Chapter 101 The depth charger had anchored offshore, since the nearest port to the Eternal City was too shallow to accommodate the city ship. Standing beside Rune, Lydia stared at her sons as they waited on the concrete pier while the transport pods surfaced, water sloshing off its glass dome top. 
revealing Renki and Dovit, both waving wildly at the two boys standing beside Lydia. At her sons, who were smiling at their dads, Bran enthusiastically waving back, Ace giving a smaller, but no less earnest, wave as well. Rune placed a gentle hand on Lydia's back, and she leaned into the reassuring, loving touch. Her mate. Yes, she knew it without a doubt. The glass top of the pod opened, and then Renki and Davit leapt gracefully onto the pier, Bran and Ace running for them. It was pure love and joy, the embraces shared between the boys and their fathers. Renki had tears of relief running down his face, and Davit was holding both boys to him as if he'd never let them go again. But Davit did let go. He crossed to Lydia in two strides and wrapped his arms around her, too. Thank you, the male said, voice choked with tears. Thank you. Renki was there the moment Davit pulled back, hugging her as tightly. Lydia found herself smiling, even as her heart was again aching, and leaned away to survey her sons. They were both considering her, Bran frowning deeply, Ace more unreadable. It was the former who said, So, this is goodbye? Lydia glanced to Renki and Davit, who both nodded. They'd spoken on the phone yesterday to coordinate this reunion and what lay ahead. Until things settle down a bit up here, Lydia said. Above the surface, I mean. Because even in the day since the Asteri had been vanquished, shit was already hitting the fan. The drainage of the first light grid was going to be a huge problem. But the Ocean Queen had fueled all her city ships and their various pods without first light, with her own power— Maybe the ruler had some insight into how they might adapt their tech to move beyond consuming first light. The Ocean Queen, of course, hadn't been happy when Lydia had sent a messenger to the depth charger. Lydia had kept her note short and efficient. I trust that my services are no longer required, and henceforth resign from your employ. With gratitude for your compassion, Lydia Servos. The Ocean Queen had dispatched her reply, again on a briny piece of kelp, an hour later. I have bigger issues to consider than your loyalty, Lydia Servos. I accept your resignation, but do not fool yourself into thinking that this is the last we shall cross paths. For now, you may live your life above. It was the best Lydia could hope for. Now, Lydia glanced between her sons and added, But I'd like to see you both again, if that's okay with you. Bran nodded, and she had no words in her head as he walked up to her and threw his arms around her. Her son's scent, his warmth and nearness, threatened to bring her to her knees. But she managed to stay standing, knowing Rune was beside her, would always be there supporting her, as Bran pulled back, grinning. You're a badass, Bran said, and added, Mom? Even as her heart glowed with joy at the word, Lydia dared glance over his shoulder to find that Renki and Dovit were grinning as broadly as Bran, happy for her, for all of them. Her boys had a beautiful family, and perhaps, if everyone was all right with it, it was one she could find a place in, find joy in. Bran leaned in, pressing a kiss to Lydia's cheek that she knew she'd cherish for the rest of her existence. Then he walked over to Rune, and Lydia could only blink as Bran threw his arms around Rune, too, hugging him tight. Thanks, Bran said, for what you were gonna do, to save us and our mom. Rune clapped Bran on the back and Lydia's chest filled with so much brightness she could barely contain it all. No worries, Rune said, all in a day's work for us ox grunts. Bran grinned, then walked back to his parents, hugging Renki again. Lydia glanced to Ace, who was watching her warily. Knowing he wouldn't rush into her arms as Bran had, Lydia walked up to him, slowly, giving him time to decide what he wanted to do. Ace held his ground, 
but his eyes weren't cold as he said, Thanks for coming for us. His mouth quirked to the side. Take care of yourself. I've got Rune watching my back, Lydia said, glancing to Rune. I'll be fine. He shot you, Ace said, frowning at Rune. I shouldn't have told you that, Rune muttered. Lydia smirked, but faced Ace again. He'll pay for it. Don't worry. Ace didn't look so sure, staring Rune down for a moment. But when he began walking toward his dad's, he stumbled as if... Lydia glared at Rune, who whistled innocently at the sky. Fine, let him keep his mind-speaking secrets. Rune slid a hand around her waist as the boys and their parents boarded the pod. Davit slid into the pilot's seat, flicking on switches, and Bran claimed the seat beside him. Renki and Ace took the back seats, and as the pod whirred to life, they all looked at her. Lydia offered them a small, hopeful smile. Her fingers found Rune's, and she gripped his hand tightly. Rune didn't let go. Her sons were alive, and free, and in her life again, and it was more than she'd ever hoped for. So the future, whatever it held, she'd cherish every moment of it. Bryce was thoroughly sick of Nenya's endless chill when she opened the Northern Rift again, not to the homeworld of the Fey, but to Hell. Only blackness awaited the army marching through, the beasts and flying things and the princes who went one by one, Thanatos giving her a look that said she might have destroyed the Asteri, but he was still mad about his dog, until only Apollyon and Adis stood before her in the ice and snow. They did not seem to require coats or hats or gloves. They didn't even shiver. Apollyon said to Hunt, Hell has no hold on you, and you have no obligation to us. Uh, thank you, Hunt said. Likewise. Apollyon threw him a half-smile, then glanced to Bryce. You did better than expected. Bryce snapped her fingers, the sound muffled by her gloves, that is what I want on my new business cards. Bryce Quinlan, better than expected. Apollyon just smirked and walked toward the dark. Hey, Bryce called after the prince of the pit. Apollyon paused, raising a brow at her. Bryce threw him a grin and said, Thanks for not giving up on Midgard. She could have sworn a kernel of compassion warmed Apollyon's face before he glanced to Adis and said, I shall be happy to lay the matter to rest, and to see my brother at peace. With that, he strode through the rift. Bryce's teeth were chattering now, but she faced Adis. Will we see you again? Adis smiled wickedly. Do you wish to? No, Bryce said, and meant it. Grateful as we are, I think we have different definitions for the word pet. Adis smiled fully this time. Then I shall give you my gratitude, Bryce Quinlan, and bid you farewell. I'll be forever grateful, Bryce said to the Prince of the Chasm, for your kindness that day at the Oracle. His smile turned gentler. Thea would be proud of you. And of you, Bryce said, the only gift she could offer to a Prince of Hell. She refrained from saying that Thea's pride meant shit to her, though. I think you might get to hear it from her lips one day. Adis angled his head. Bryce had told all of them about what Jessiba had claimed, what she'd seen in that land of glowing light. You think a prince of hell shall be allowed in? Bryce walked up to him and kissed his cheek. Icy skin met her lips. I think a good male, regardless of where he is from, will always be allowed in. Adis's eyes glowed bright blue, with gratitude or longing or love she didn't know. But the prince only nodded to her, then to hunt, and walked through the northern rift into the dark. Apollyon was waiting just inside, and he took up a place beside his brother. Bryce's hand slid into hunt's, and she lifted her other hand in farewell. To her surprise, both princes returned the gesture— with a ripple of thought and power, she closed the rift, 
locked it securely, leaving no cracks to slip through. Though the Asteri were gone, all their crystal gates throughout Midgard remained intact. But for now, at least this particular gate was shut completely. At long last. Looks like your demon hunting days might be over, she said to Hunt. Her mate grinned down at her and kissed her gently, and even the frigid winds of Nenya seemed to warm around them. Guess I should file for unemployment. Therian Kedos stood on the outskirts of the meat market, looking for his wife. Thanks to the water sprites in her employ, the Viper Queen had apparently been able to put out the blazing main building before the fire had spread, leaving the bulk of the meat market's interconnected warehouses intact. Indeed, it seemed as if it was business as usual, albeit already adjusted to a new world. From the back of a truck, shady-looking grunts unloaded canisters glowing with first light, already stocking up on a product that would soon be in high demand. Therian didn't really know why he'd come here, when Sendez had informed him that the Ocean Queen had forgiven his disobedience. In fact, she'd made him a perfectly good offer to be a commander in her forces and work aboard the Depth Charger, but he'd found himself saying he had something to do first, and then made his way back here. The world was in upheaval, the Asteri were gone, but there was an Imperial Senate to contend with, and Archangels, and the various househeads, and... maybe he should have stayed on that ship. He didn't know why he had expected peace and comfort, why he'd thought everyone would be happy and just... chill. But there were plenty of greedy fucks out there in the world, who were happy to use the shake-up to grab for power and he knew that the fuck who ruled the meat market was probably one of them. He'd have to contend with her at some point, probably someday soon. But right now he needed to find his wife, just to make sure she was okay. Then he could be on his way, go to the depth charger, or do something else. He didn't know. He figured Ogenis would guide him at some point, maybe help him figure out his mess of a life. Therian slipped on the hood of his sweatshirt, checking that the gun concealed at his side was secure and ready, and walked into the warren of the meat market, to whatever Erd had in store for him. He only made it one block before a female voice said from the shadows, You have to be ten kinds of dumb to go back in there. He halted, peering into the alley from which the voice had spoken, Two crimson eyes smoldered in the darkness. Therian inclined his head. Hello, Ariadne. Chapter 102 Bryce stood in the foyer of the Autumn King's villa, surveying the field of flashing cameras, the haughty fey nobility, and the confused-looking guards glancing between her and the crowd. For the occasion, she'd chosen a pink dress that she knew drove Hunt to distraction. It had been either that, or leggings and a t-shirt, and given that she wanted to avoid anything taking away from what she was actually doing, she'd opted for formal. Of course, settling on the pink dress had been an ordeal in itself. There was now a giant heap of clothing in her bedroom for her to put away when she got home— which was incentive enough to draw this out for as long as possible. But she took one look at Sathia and Flynn's sneering parents, the Lord and Lady Hawthorne having recently returned from a Valen, and decided to hell with waiting, to hell with all the other fey nobility who had gathered at her invitation this morning. She'd set foot in the city late last night, had gone right to the ruins of Asphodel Meadows, and called for this meeting the next day. She would have done it last night, but Hunt had told her to take the time to sort out what she wanted to say, to let Mark get the paperwork ready. The leopard shifter and Declan now stood beside the desk that had been hauled into the foyer, Rune and Flynn with them. She glanced to Hunt, and he nodded subtly. It was time. So Bryce stepped up to the desk and said to the cameras, to the fey aristocrats, 
I'll make this short and sweet for all the busy nobles here who have to get back to champagne lunches and spa treatments. Silence and a frantic clicking of cameras. The videographers pressed in closer, angling their mics to pick up her every breath. One of the camera guys, a drocky male, was smirking. But Bryce kept her gaze on the cameras, on the world listening. This is my first and only decree as the Fey Queen of Valbara and of Valen. The royal houses are ended. She ignored the gasps and protests and tapped the paperwork on the desk. I've had the documents drawn up. Allow me to be perfectly clear. I am not abdicating either throne. I am no longer queen, but with this document, no one shall ever wear the crown again. The Fey monarchy is abolished. Forever. From the corner of her eye, she could see Hunt grinning broadly. She wished her mom was here, but they'd decided that Ember Quinlan's presence might cause too much speculation that her human mother had pushed her to do this. I am donating all the Autumn King's residences in this city, Bryce said, gesturing to the elegant space around them, to house those displaced by the attack on Asphodel Meadows. This villa in particular will be used to house children orphaned by the massacre. One of the Fey nobles choked. As for the royal properties elsewhere, in Valbara and on Avalon, they will be sold to anyone who can stomach their tacky-ass decor, and the profits will go toward rebuilding Asphodel Meadows. Bryce picked up the golden fountain pen she'd swiped from the Autumn King's study after chucking all his prisms into the trash. She planned to dismantle the orrery and sell it for scrap metal. She knew enough about how light traveled and formed, how it could break apart and come back together. She never wanted to learn another thing about light again, even her own. The Asteri are gone, Bryce said to the listening world, and the Fey kingdoms with them. In their place, we will build a government built on equality and fairness— this document grants me the right to represent the Fey in the building of such a government, and nothing more. Traitor, hissed a Fey noble, who Bryce could have sworn had sneered at her once in a restaurant years ago. Bryce hummed to herself, flipping the Autumn King's beloved pen between her fingers. You guys shouldn't have granted your royals such absolute power in your quest to keep everyone else down in the dirt. She leaned over the documents. Maybe then, you could have stopped me from doing this. The golden pen touched paper, ink blooming on the parchment. But you're in the mud with the rest of us now, Bryce said to the Fay as she signed her name. Better get used to the smell. Thus, with the stroke of the Autumn King's golden pen, the royal bloodlines of the Fay were wiped from existence. Rune flicked on the lights in the apartment for however long the place would even have power. Bryce is going to throw a fit, but I swear it was the only one available furnished on short notice, he said to Lydia, as they stepped inside the home literally a floor below Bryce's. Lydia smiled, though, surveying the apartment that was the mirror image of Bryce's layout, save for the furniture. She approached the white, gleaming kitchen. It's lovely, really. I'll get the money wired to your account. Nah, Rune said. Consider it a thank you present for bailing me out of the dungeons. Lydia turned from the kitchen, brows high. I think we're even by now. After everything. After that shit with Pollux, which he knew would haunt his dreams for a long fucking time. But there would be joy to light the dark memories, when he'd gone with her to return the boys to their parents, Rune had been content to watch the happy reunion, especially as Lydia was hugged with equal welcome and love by the boys' parents, as the boys had, in their own ways, made it clear that Lydia would be welcome in their lives. Bran, he had no doubt, would be the easier one. But Ace... Rune smiled to himself at the memory of how Ace had looked over at Rune before leaving, his dark eyes knowing, sharp, as if to say, Take care of my mom. Rune had answered into the kid's mind, She can take care of herself, but I will.
Ace's eyes had widened in shock, and he'd stumbled a step, but, with an assessing, impressed glance at Rune, had continued to the transport pod. Rune and Lydia had spent one night in this shithole house, aching to fuck each other within an inch of their lives, but all too conscious of his friends a thin wall away, before he'd called up a realtor and asked about finding an apartment, immediately, with a few specific requests. The bedroom over there's got two beds in it, he said, pointing across the great room, for your boys. Her eyes were lined with silver as she faced the guest bedroom, that had been Rune's main demand to the realtor. Find an apartment with a guest room that had two beds. They can visit whenever they, and you, want. Her smile was so soft and hopeful that his heart ached. But she walked to the couch in front of the TV and sat down, as if testing it out. Testing out this house, this life. I think their dads will want to keep them close for a while, after what happened, Lydia said. But, yes, I would love for them to be here sometimes. Rune sank beside her on the couch. They're going to raise hell when they're older. I'm fine with that, so long as it's not literally, Lydia sighed. I've had enough of demons for a while, however friendly. Rune chuckled. Me too. For a few minutes, they sat in companionable silence, the apartment, their apartment, settling in around them. I can't believe we're alive, Lydia said at last. I can't believe the Asteri are gone. The past few days had been such a whirlwind that he hadn't really processed all that had happened, or the current state of the world. Lydia said carefully, Your sister and Athalar's intentions are good but it's going to take a lot more than one meeting with a bunch of world leaders to sort out an entirely new system of government, or dismantle slavery. I know. Bryce knows. Are you... What do you plan to do? It was a loaded question, but Rune answered, I'll help her. I'll head up the ox with Holstrom, I guess, since the Fae Throne's gone as of this morning. It had been a wonder to behold, Bryce standing in front of the crowd of cameras and nobles, ending the monarchies with a stroke of a pen, their father's favorite pen, no less. Rune had never been so proud to be Bryce's brother. He smiled slightly. The oracle was right in a lot of ways, I guess. Lydia lifted a brow. It wasn't just that the crown would go to Bryce, but that she'd end it. The Dan and Royal line is finished. Lydia clicked her tongue. You're not dead or childless after all. Not yet, Rune said, laughing again. All that time spent dreading the prophecy, worrying over his fate. Lydia looked at him in that way that no one else on Midgard did, like she saw him. Are you prepared to not be a prince anymore, though? To be normal? I think so, he said, nudging her knee with his own. Are you? I have no idea. I don't even know what normal is, Lydia admitted. Rune took her hand, linking their fingers. How about we figure it out together, then? How to be normal? How to live a normal life. The normal adult apartment's a good start. For both of us. No more veritable frat house living, but wariness flooded her eyes. My life is complicated. Whoever said normal isn't complicated, he countered. All I know is that whatever tomorrow or next year or the next millennium has in store for this world, I want to face it at your side. Her expression softened. She leaned closer, brushing a strand of his hair back with her free hand. They weren't the hind and a crown prince of the fae, weren't day and night. Right then, there, they were simply Lydia and Rune. He wouldn't have it any other way. But Rune got to his feet and walked to the kitchen, opening the fridge. The other request he'd made of the realtor, stock the fridge with one thing and one thing only. Maybe the veritable frat house wasn't entirely gone. 
he walked back to the couch and handed Lydia a beer. As promised, Day, he said, twisting off the cap on his bottle. One beer. She looked at the bottle, pure delight shining on her face. She twisted the cap off her own beverage, but got to her feet and clinked her bottle against his before drinking. To a normal life, Rune. Rune leaned in to kiss her, and Lydia met him halfway, and the love and joy in him glowed brighter than starlight as he said against her mouth, To a normal life, Lydia. It would take the wolves of the den a few days to come back from where they'd been lying low, but they were coming back. Ethan didn't know if it was Amelie's order or if Perry had asked them, but everyone was returning, perhaps just to see how shitty he'd be at leading them as prime, or to assess the dynamic without the Fendiers, or to get their stuff before the first light power grid failed and chaos reigned. Ethan stood in the command center of the Ox headquarters, Flynn and Deck across from him, the former eyeing Perry with an interest Ethan didn't entirely appreciate. Perry was blushing, and Ethan didn't appreciate that, either. But Rune and Lydia walked in before Ethan could say anything stupid, and the former fey prince said, So, first things first. I think it sucks that we save the world and still have to be back at work two days later. Perry laughed, and, okay, maybe Ethan liked the sound. But Lydia said, grave and yet serene, I'm expecting a report tonight regarding the status of the first light power grid and how we might stop it from failing. Lunathian's engineers have been meeting with the Ocean Queen to learn how she powers her ships without it and will present those findings to us. But in the meantime... We need to start assessing allies inside the city and out of it. Celestina's still dealing with Ephraim, trying to garner his support. But the other archangels are going to start jockeying for power. If we don't want to fall back into the old ways, we need a solid plan. Shouldn't Athalar be here for this? Flynn said. He's on his way, Rune said, with Bryce. But they told us to start without them. Deck and Flynn made kissing noises at each other, and Ethan laughed, Perry joining him. Maybe it wouldn't be so bad. Not the being prime part, that part he didn't particularly like. But this new future. It'd probably be batshit crazy for a while, and they'd have no shortage of enemies, but... They'd also have each other. A pack of all houses. Which was why they were here. No more splintered ox, divided among houses and species. They'd lead by example, starting today. So Ethan said to Lydia and Rune, to Flynn and Deck and Perry, Whatever these assholes want to throw at us, we'll throw right back at them. Spoken like a true sunball captain, Deck teased. Ethan said, Yeah. He let the word settle and for a moment he felt it, that urge to set foot on the field, to grip that ball in his hands. A glimmer, and it was gone, but, after years of nothing, he felt it, wanted it, so Ethan grinned and added, I am. That was Hypaxia on the phone, Bryce said, in the sunny open atrium of the elegant townhouse that would soon be the new Griffin Antiquities. Hunt, unpacking a statue of Thur from a crate, asked over a winged shoulder, What'd she say? That if she can find a way to stabilize the antidote, we could have it rolling out to everyone by the spring equinox. That is, if we still have power by then. She wants more of your lightning, by the way. She's already out of this batch of antidotes. Bryce and Hunt had both gotten doses, the surge of magic that had resulted had been intense enough that apparently a whole new island had risen in a valen, as if the island was now bound to her very soul, as if she and Midgard were, as Jessiba had claimed, bound together, Arcesian amulet or no. And thanks to Hunt, there had been a day straight of thunderstorms, 
Of course, he was fined by the city for illegal and improper weather manipulation, but he blew his magical load didn't really seem to hold sway when Bryce tried to explain it to the authorities. The new power in their veins, as if returned from what the Asteri had taken, required some getting used to, and new training. Bryce could teleport in one jump between the city and her parents' house now, which was good and bad. Good, because she could see Cooper whenever she wanted, and steal him away to the city for a hint of real fun. Bad, because her parents now expected her and Hunt for weekly dinners— Bryce had negotiated it down to monthly, but she knew Ember would be making a full court press for at least once every two weeks. But all of it depended on what they did next, if the first light power grid could hold, if it'd collapse, if they'd all have to start over again, squatting over fires in the darkness. But she, they, would proceed as usual, let the geniuses and scientists find a way to save them this time. Well, Hunt said, if Hypaxia needs someone to go beat the shit out of the Redners, I'm game. They're creeps. The former Witch Queen had reluctantly partnered with Redner Industries, hoping to mass-produce the antidote. Scary asshole part two? Happily. He turned from the crate to where Bryce was shelving books on the towering built-in unit behind her desk. The books. The Parthos Collection. No longer in darkness and hiding, but here, in the daylight, for anyone to come see. She couldn't bear to keep them locked away. Thankfully, she'd found three new employees to help her manage the unwieldy collection. Sasa, Rithi, and Milana currently perched on a takeout container, watching an episode of Veiled Love on Hunt's phone, where he'd propped it up against his water bottle. They'd never replace Lahava but it filled something in her heart to see them, to hear Syrinx snoring beneath her new desk in the little nest of blankets he'd made down there, like something had finally slid into place, like she was exactly where she was meant to be. So, Hunt said, going back to unloading all the crates Hypaxia had sent over from the House of Flame and Shadow. Apparently, Jessica had been anticipating this transfer of ownership, She'd made Ethan pack most of the artifacts up. Bryce thought Jessica would appreciate the Godslayer rifle now mounted behind Bryce's desk, as much a warning to anyone who might try to steal the books as in honor of the priestess who'd guarded them for so long. That is, if the fire sprites didn't roast any would-be thief. She didn't know where Erythus had gone, and she still wished to talk to the queen, to tell her about Lahaba, but from what Sasa had said, it sounded as if the Sprite Queen was now traveling the world, intent on freeing every last one of her people, especially those who might be held by owners averse to the new worldwide ban on slavery. So, what? Bryce asked Hunt, sliding a tome onto the shelf. So, are you going to talk about the whole no more fey monarchy thing? What's there to talk about? Bryce said. I sent out my decree. It's over. No longer my problem. Others might not see it that way. That's why, Athelar, she began, shelving another book that tried to wriggle out of her hands. She smacked it back over and shoved it onto the shelf. That's why we're going to establish a fey democracy. A senate, and all that crap. So the fey can go complain to them about their problems. A senate and all that crap, huh? Hunt said. Sounds real official. She turned toward him. And what about you? How come you get to walk away from the 33rd and the angel stuff, but somehow I can't bail on the fey drama? I didn't make magic islands come flying out of the ocean and resurrect a whole territory. Well, a Valen's different, she sniffed. You just don't want to lose your new vacation home, he teased, crossing the room toward her. She let him crowd her against the bookshelf, loving his size and strength and the wall of power that was pure hunt. Maybe I don't, she said, not backing down an inch. But until the Fae can show me that they'll share a Valen with everyone, it's mine. 
She'd debated sending the Parthos books there, to the Avalon archives, but she wanted them close, wanted them accessible to everyone, not locked away on a remote island. Or, at least, it's my responsibility, she amended. Yeah, well, Baxian's dying to get off the island and back into civilization, so maybe look into hiring a caretaker. Fury and June had already returned to Crescent City. There was only so much medieval living her friends could take, apparently. But Baxian had stuck it out. She winced. The angel had been keeping the fae in line since she and Hunt had left Avalon in his hands, taking good care of any and all refugees who made it there. Danica would have been proud. Bryce had made sure to tell the hellhound that, and about seeing his mate in the afterworld. He'd been silent enough during that call that she knew he was crying, but all he had said to Bryce was, Thank you. Okay, okay, Bryce said to Hunt. Set up a democracy, find a new babysitter for a valon, play scary asshole with you. Anything else for me to do, in addition to starting my new business? She gestured to the soon-to-be-open gallery. How about hiring a sexy assistant? She didn't miss the heat in his eyes, the spark. She bit her lip. Sexy assistant, huh? You cool with going from the Umbra Mortis to fetching my coffee? If it comes with the perk of kinky office sex, I'm cool with anything. Hunt growled, nipping at her ear. Oh, the position definitely comes with kinky office sex, she purred. She felt the hardness of him push into her hip before he said, low and wicked, Sprites, go find somewhere else to be for a while. They grumbled, but zoomed out to the stairs, all blushing a bright pink. Syrinx dashed after them, yelping. Bryce didn't care where they went, not as Hunt pressed his cock against her center, and she writhed. Get on the desk, he said, voice like gravel. Her blood thrummed through her. We're already late for our meeting with Rune and the others at the Ox. They can deal. His voice was pure, unrelenting sex. Her knees wobbled. But Bryce had only taken one step toward the desk when her phone rang. Baxian. Call back later, Hunt said, coming to stand behind her, sliding his hands up her thighs, bunching her skirt as he went. Yes, fuck yes. Hunt's phone rang. Baxian again. Maybe we should answer, Bryce said, though she almost didn't, considering that Hunt had a fistful of her skirt in one hand and her bare ass palmed in his other. Hunt groaned and reached for his phone, answering with a snapped, What? With her fey ears, Bryce could hear perfectly clearly as Baxian asked, Where's your mate? It was the low note of panic and urgency that had Hunt putting him on speakerphone and saying, We're both here. Baxian let out a shuddering breath, and Bryce's arousal vanished, cold dread filling her gut. If something had happened already, an attack on a valon? I... Baxian choked on the word. There are about two dozen of them. Bryce swapped a confused glance with Hunt and asked, Them? Baxian let out a laugh that verged on hysteria. I swear it's like they sprang out of the earth, like they were hibernating or hiding there. I don't fucking know. Baxian, Bryce said, heart thundering. What is it? Flying horses. Horses with wings. Bryce blinked slowly. Horses with wings? Yes, Baxian said, his voice rising. They're flying around and trampling everything and eating all the crops. And I think you might need to come here because they seem to be the sort of thing that might belong to a super magical fancy starborn princess. Bryce looked at Hunt, pure wonder flooding her. There are flying horses in a valon, Hunt said, eyes as wide as her own, pure joy sparking there. In Celine's account, Bryce breathed, she talked about her mother having flying horses, how some came here, and there were depictions of them in the Cave of Princes and Morvan's castle. I thought they'd all been killed, but maybe... Bryce shook her head. Is it possible? Had Helena somehow secretly kept them alive, suspended, waiting until it was safe again? 
She didn't care. Not right now. There are flying horses in a valen, Bryce repeated to Hunt. There are pegasuses in a valen. Please come help me, Baxian said miserably. We'll be there by dawn, Bryce said and hung up for Hunt. She met her mate's blazingly bright eyes. No more shadows, no more halo, no more pain. Never again. Rain check on the desk sex. For jelly jubilee in the flesh. Hunt grinned. Anything. Bryce threw her arms around his neck, kissing him thoroughly, then dashed for the door. There was an angel in her office, and a pegasus herd on a valen, and the Asteri were gone and the dead were free. And though she knew there was work to do to heal Midgard, the world was out there. Life was out there. So Bryce and Hunt ran out to live it. Together. This has been an Audible Studios production of House of Flame and Shadow. Written by Sarah J. Maas. Performed by Elizabeth Evans. Executive Producers Rhea Lyons and Mike Charzuk. Producer Thomas Mann. Edited by John Marshall Media. Mixed and mastered by John Marshall Media. Head of Production at Audible Studios, Mike Charzuk. Copyright 2024 by Sarah J. Maas. Sound recording copyright 2023 by Audible Inc. Audible Studios is a division of Audible Inc. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.